Good afternoon, <coughs> Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. May I first wish you all Mingalaba. We are delighted to welcome all of you to the International Conference on Engineering Education Accreditation, ICEEA 2023, Myanmar. I am very pleased and honored to be acting as the master of ceremony in this conference, representing Myanmar as the host country. I am Tauda Tatoewin, professor and head of International Relations Department of Technological University, Jagse, Myanmar. Other members are Ms. Tain Zadu, lecturer from Department of English, Yangon Technological University, Ms. Tain Tain Sen, lecturer from Department of English, Yangon Technological University, Ms. Tain Sen Te, lecturer from Department of English, West Yangon Technological University and Ms. Tewin Wato, lecturer from Department of English, West Yangon Technological University. Before we begin, allow me to present the main agenda of the conference, already distributed earlier to all of you. The first agenda is opening announcement, then the opening address by Professor Tauda Shalite, the Junior Minister for Industry and Patron of Myanmar Engineering Council, and the opening message by Professor Jose Vera, the President of World Federation of Engineering Organization, WFIO, and after that, the keynote presentations and Q&A section before the health break. After the break, we will continue the plenary session. Before the conference begins, I'd like to request everybody to make silence on your phones. Also, mute your microphone when keynote presentation and plenary session. Only the conference organizers and the speakers will be able to share their videos. Thank you very much. Please be free to ask questions to the speakers at the chat box and answers will be followed respectively. Thank you. This international conference on engineering education accreditation, ICEEA 2022, Myanmar was successfully organized by Myanmar Engineering Council and WFU CEIE on 60 to 70 July 2022. Now, Myanmar Engineering Organized Council and WFU CEIE are now organizing ICEEA 2023 with the theme of the accelerating the full implementation of the 2030 agenda for the sustainable development at all levels through engineering education. ICEEA 2023 is intended to provide a scenario for the interactions among the professionals and experts from world engineering organizations to achieve the quality engineering education and accreditation. Ladies and gentlemen, it's great pleasure for me to announce this. The International Conference on Engineering Education Accreditation, ICEEA 2023, Myanmar is now declared open. Thank you. According to the agenda, I'd like to invite Professor Dr. Shalita, the Union Minister for Industry and Petro of Myanmar Engineering Council, to deliver the opening address. 
Crystal Lancy, please. Good afternoon, Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the International Conference on Engineering Education Accreditation 2023, Myanmar, hosted by WAFU CIE in collaboration with Myanmar Engineering Council. It is great honor for me to stand before you today as we embark on this transformative journey of accelerating the full implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals at all levels through engineering education. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development adopted by the United Nations provide us with comprehensive roadmap for action. It calls upon us to eradicate poverty, protect the planet, and ensure prosperity for all. Engineering education must play a central role in this endeavor as it empowers individuals to become agents of change, capable of driving innovation, developing sustainable technologies, and designing resilient infrastructure. Today, we have the privilege of gathering some of the brightest minds in engineering education, including experts, educators, policy makers, industry leaders, and students from around the globe. Each one of you brings a unique perspective and expertise that will contribute to the rich tapestry of discussion and collaboration that will unfold over the next few days. Throughout this conference, we will explore a wide range of themes and topics that are vital to accelerating the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. We will deliver into curriculum design, pedagogical approaches, research and innovation, industry partnership, and accreditation frameworks. Together, we will examine the best practice, emerging trends, and transformative ideas that can propel engineering education forward, ensuring that it remains relevant, inclusive, and impactful. We must recognize that engineering education is not just about technical knowledge. It is about nurturing well-rounded individuals who possess a deep understanding of the social, economic, and environmental dimension of sustainable development. We must foster a culture of innovation, creativity, and critical thinking, enabling our students to tackle complex challenges with empathy, collaboration, and a global mindset. Furthermore, we must emphasize the importance of interdisciplinary approach in engineering education. The, challenge, the challenges we face are interconnected, requiring us to work cross-discipline and embrace diverse perspectives. By fostering collaboration between engineering and other fields, such as social science, business, and policy, we can develop holistic solutions that address the root causes of societal problems. Accreditation plays a crucial role in maintaining the quality and relevance of engineering education. It ensures that our institution meets rigorous standards and prepares students to meet the demand of a rapidly changing world. During this conference, we will explore new approaches to accreditation that align with 2000 agenda, encouraging innovation, flexibility, and continuous improvement. <clears throat> In conclusion, the journey towards a full implementation of the 2030 
agenda for the sustainable development through engineering education is a collective endeavor. It requires collaboration, shared vision, and a relentless commitment to excellence. As we gather here today, let us seize this opportunity to learn from one another, to challenge our assumptions, and to envision a future where engineering education becomes a powerful force for positive change. I encourage each and every one of you to actively engage in the discussion, workshop, and networking opportunities provided by this conference. Let us forge new partnership, exchange ideas, and inspire, inspire one another to push the boundaries of what is possible. Together, we can accelerate the full implementation of the 2000 agenda, 2030 agenda for sustainable development at all levels through engineering education. Let us, let us embrace this challenge with enthusiasm, determination, and a shared commitment to creating a better world for future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Dabda Shalite for your remarkable opening address. In accordance with the agenda, the opening message will be delivered by Professor Jose Vieira, the President of World Federation of Engineering Organization, with you. Professor Jose Vieira, please. Dear participants and fellow engineers, on behalf of the World Federation of Engineering Organizations, it is my great pleasure to be part of the opening ceremony of this year's International Conference on Engineering Education Accreditation. And I want to thank the organizers, the Myanmar Engineering Council, the current host of the WFO's Committee on Education in Engineering. As engineers, we all know how much engineering is critical to building more resilient societies, industries, and to successfully fight climate change and adapt to its consequences. But we still need to make a great effort to explain how important it is to have the right strategy that will ensure that the present and the next generations of engineers will be up to this task, especially in those countries which are dramatically exposed to the consequences of climate change. Regional and global cooperation are vital to ensure that these recommendations are implemented, especially by achieving the framework to allow more countries to reach the appropriate education and graduation standards. The ICEAA is a good example of the relevance of regional and international cooperation on the most pressing engineering challenges. WFO always sees high value in professional engineering institutions cooperation at a variety of levels and in as many fields of engineering as possible. And this is especially the case in the field of engineering education. The ICEEA conference is a critical effort towards taking an integrated approach to education standards for engineers. WFO has identified this objective as critical in many aspects for achieving the United Nations 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development Goals. This can only happen if a fruitful harmonization of engineering education systems is accomplished through shared and up-to-date standards, mentorship processes, and integrated governance systems. In order to do this, WFO fosters cooperation between global institutions such as UNESCO, the International Engineering Alliance, and other regional and national professional engineering institutions to achieve the framework 
allowing more countries to reach the appropriate education and graduation standards. WFO's partnership with the International Engineering Alliance and UNESCO is a strategic pillar to achieve this vision. In 2021, the International Engineering Alliance graduate attributes and professional competencies, the GAPC, which is the framework for engineers training standards, was substantially revised with a major contribution from WFO. The GAPC framework now encompasses the sustainable development goals as part of the education of all engineers to ensure that in every field of industry, government action, research and development, engineers are trained to correctly assess the environmental and social impacts of their work. The GAPC will serve as a basis for training engineers who take responsibility for their social and environmental footprint and know how to anticipate and manage the risks and implication of uh, existing and emerging technologies. I feel that uh, it is necessary to remind that in 2021, the UNESCO engineering report made a key recommendation to train more engineers with the right skills to progress the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. UNESCO has also insisted on the importance of making scientific knowledge and education tools more widely available at no cost for a population where scientific and technological training is the most needed. Regional and global cooperation are vital to ensure that these recommendations are implemented, especially by achieving the framework to allow more countries to reach the appropriate education and graduation standards. Besides, it is crucial to make available the most up-to-date courses that allow engineers to learn the necessary skills in context of a new era of sustainable engineering. This is the reason why as I advised in my address to you last year, WFO has launched a free training portal called WFO Academy, which is open to all WFO members and provides online courses for engineers' continuous professional development. The purpose of this initiative is to direct implement UNESCO's recommendation to train more engineers with the right skills and also to set an example of good practices with respect to the UNESCO Open Science recommendation. The Academy has been designed as a training portal open to all engineers who are affiliated with one of member institutions of AWFO, providing at no cost opportunities to develop their skills in fields that are the most relevant to adapt to the pressing challenges of sustainable development. We aim to mobilize engineers to deliver the right practice in the age of climate change. There are now several dozens of courses available on the portal with a scope that encompasses training for engineering educators for accreditation bodies to achieve international standards and professional skills development in safety and risk management, ethics and leadership. This rapid increase in available courses was made possible by the major contribution of some of our partner uh, institutions in the field of engineering education, the International Engineering Alliance, and the Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology, ABET. We particularly believe that providing free resources to educators is the most effective way to rapidly upgrade and adapt the skills of younger engineers, while the longer term we build and promote the appropriate framework for harmonization. WFU, through its Committee on Engineering Education, intends to further develop partnerships with national and international institutions that 
that can contribute to extend the number and the scope of the academy training material. At the same time, the academy has called for funding support and needs sponsorship to keep enhancing its training portfolio to, to the benefit of our community and to achieve our strategy. So, if you benefit from the academy or believe in its vision, this is a way for you to make a difference. Please visit wfoacademy.com where you can download our sponsorship brochure and circulate this document among your colleagues, your business partners, and within your corporate or institutional environment. While the attention towards the academy course is raising, so is the value of supporting it as a completely non-profit initiative. I wish to thank you all for your kind attention and to wish you a most fruitful conference. I am sure that the engineering community is looking forward to the outcomes and that we are all working to turn engineering into the most important profession for building a better future. Thank you, Professor Jose Vera, for your insightful opening message. Now we will continue the agenda. The next agenda is keynote presentation by our distinguished speakers. The session will be hosted by Dr. Sri Wimmo E. Before I hand over to Dr. Sri Wimmo E, I'd like to remind all the participants that if you have any questions, you can post the question in the chat bar. Now, I'd like to invite Dr. Sri Wimmo E to host the session. Dr. Sri Wimmo E, please. Thank you very much, Master of Ceremony, Dr. Derwin, for your kind invitation. Good day to ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to say Mingalaba. First of all, I would like to say warmly welcome all of you from abroad and within Myanmar to participate in the International Conference on Engineering Education Accreditation, ICEA 2023, Myanmar. May I introduce myself? I'm Dr. Shui Moe. I'm a professor in Head of Department of Metallurgical Engineering and Material Science, West Yangon Technological University. It is my pleasure to be a host for this session. According to the agenda, the first keynote speaker of this section is Dr. Malin Kanga, former president from 2017 to 2019, the World Federation of Engineering Organization, WFEO, in 2013, National Presidents of Engineer Australia. Before the presentation, I would like to present short profile of Dr. Marlin Kanga. A chemical engineer, Dr. Marlin Kanga is a former president from 2017 to 2019, the World Federation of Engineering Organization, WFEO, in the 2013 National Presidents of Engineer Australia. Dr. Kanga is a fellow of Australian Academy of Technology, Science and Engineering. Dr. Kanga AO is an Officer of the Order of Australia, a national holder for distinguished service to engineering as a global leader and role model to women. As WFEO President, Dr. Kanga successfully proposed and lead the review of the International Engineering Education Benchmark with the International Engineering Alliance to ensure engineer with the right scale for the future. She supports capacity building effort in Africa and Asia. She established the WFU Academy for ongoing engineers training. Dr. Kanga is a NANS exclusive director of large organization in Australia in transports, utilities, and innovation. He is an honorary fellow of Engineer Australia and honorary fellow of the Institution of Chemical Engineers UK, a foundation fellow of the International Science Council, only engineer in Australia, a foreign fellow of the ASEAN Academy of Engineering and Technology, and fellow honorary of the Engineering Institution of the New Zealand in India. 
He was the 2018 Engineer Australia, National Professional Engineer of the Year, and received the 2019 Chemical Medal for the contribution of the Chemical Engineering and 2023 Ada Lovelace Medal for Outstanding Contribution as the Woman Engineer. She was listed among the 100 engineer making a contribution to Australia in the last 100 year among the top 100 women of influence and one of the top 10 women engineers in Australia. She is listed among the top 100 women of influence and one of the top 10 women engineer in Australia. This is a short profile of Dr. Marling Kanga. Now, may I invite Dr. Marling Kanga to deliver your keynote presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to Dr. Marling Kanga. Dr. Please. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that very kind uh, introduction. I'm really uh, proud and pleased to be here as a member of the WFEO Committee for Edu Education and Engineering. And uh, uh, I welcome all the delegates here today and tomorrow. Uh, so distinguished members of uh, Myanmar Engineering Council, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my presentation today, and I will try and uh, share my screen, is going to talk about. Uh, uh, Sorry. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, my presentation today is uh, going to be about an innovation in de in delivering engineering education uh, uh, with a specific approach on the uh, advancing sustainable development and the sustainable development goals. Uh, and, I, and I hope that this will give you an interesting insight uh, into how uh, all engineering educators in Myanmar and around the world can participate in this great innovation and deliver a wonderful experience to their students. Uh, as you've heard uh, from uh, uh, Professor Jose Vieira, uh, uh, the uh, focus on engineering education has already always been uh, a key priority for the World Federation of Engineering Organizations. So the presentation that I'm going to make today will be in the context of this priority. So here are my uh, topics. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the priority of the World Federation in Education, uh, the impact of project-based learning and the importance uh, in engineering education, uh, the international, sorry, something's happened. Uh, the international uh, uh, the competition, the student hackathon, and how this is aligned with the in, uh, graduate attributes and professional competencies framework of the International Engineering Alliance, uh, how we run the hackathon and some of the outcomes. So, sorry, my screen is not moving for some reason. Apologies for this. So uh, uh, for those who do not know the World Federation of Engineers or Engineering Organizations, this is our member map, which you see the blue areas cover most of the world. We were founded in 1968 under the auspices of UNESCO. We are the peak international body for professional engineering institutions with some 100 professional engineering institutions as members, including Myanmar Engineering Council and Myanmar Engineering Society. And we represent engineering at the major UN organizations. Um, Let's try and see if I can. 
Uh, engineering education and capacity building, as I mentioned, has always been a priority for WFEO. And on this priority was reiterated on its 50th anniversary in March 2018, while I was president in the Paris Declaration with UNESCO, where we committed to advancing the UN Sustainable Development Goals through engineering. And this declaration recognized the need for more engineers with the right skills, that is to increase both the number and quality of engineering graduates. And the UNESCO engineering report that was released in March 2021 made three key recommendations in chapter one, which I in fact authored, again, re-emphasizing the need for government, educators, industry and professional engineering institutions to collaborate to increase the number and quality of engineers and to work in partnership to develop the necessary international engineering education benchmarks to advance sustainable development and to build capacity in engineering education systems where engineers are needed the most in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. The second part that I want to talk about is the importance of project-based learning in engineering education. So project-based learning is, is, is used to describe a teaching method in which students learn by actively engaging in real world projects that are personally meaningful to them. This is particularly important in engineering education where employers are increasingly demanding that graduates have skills that increase their employability. And what are these skills? Employers are seeking engineers with critical thinking and problem solving skills, an understanding of complex systems, uh, and an awareness of the need for lifelong learning. And importantly, good communication skills, the ability to collaborate and work in diverse teams. And you see here an example from Google, which analyzed the, the top skills of its, uh, the skills of its top uh, employees. And it was not those that were the most technically competent, but those that had so-called soft skills, the ability to work in teams, to communicate and listen, uh, to have empathy, good critical thinking skills, and to work across a complex idea. So great skills in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics are important, but they weren't at the top of the list. And so project-based learning encourages students to develop these skills, to develop strategies for project cooperation, organization, and management, take responsibility for developing and implementing a solution, manage project timelines and outcomes, collaborate effectively, and engage in a diverse learning environment, support their peers and develop empathy, connect complex ideas and develop systems thinking approaches, be creative and divergent thinkers and consider multiple perspectives, review and critically analyze their solutions and be empowered to be confident learners and confident in their capabilities and develop conversational and learning skills. And again, I have here a quote from Steve Jobs of Apple who famously need, uh, said, that we don't just need expertise of those who are technically competent, but we also need those who are educated in human, cultural, and social aspects as well. And again, yet again, World Economic Forum top skill priorities for the future for 2027 includes analytical thinking, creative thinking, AI and big data, leadership and social influence, and so on. So the hackathon is a project-based learning opportunity, and it's available at no cost to all in, in, uh, engineering institutions uh, around the world. And it's an opportunity for educators to give this up, uh, to encourage their students to participate and to develop these very essential skills. The cri judging criteria for the um, uh, hackathon is aligned with the graduate attributes and professional competencies of the International Engineering Alliance. For, because it's very important that uh, our engineers of the future develop essential skills as shown here for civil engineers where uh, computer aided design is, is the norm now. And more, much of the work of civil engineering can be done with automated programs. This means that engineers have to learn to use tools like simulation, optimization, et cetera, but also to be more creative and innovative 
and thoughtful about the solutions that they create. And these requirements are now embedded in the graduate attributes. And also the graduate attributes and professional competencies encourages the participation of more diverse engineers, including, of course, more women. Um, so these were the key areas that were uh, identified as being important to change in the framework to accommodate the future needs of engineering professionals, to strengthen the required attributes for teamwork, communication, ethics, and sustainability, to incorporate digital learning and active work experience and lifelong learning to deal with emerging technologies, to also be able to deal with in the future, emerging and future engineering disciplines and practice areas, once again, emphasizing the importance of long, lifelong learning, to incorporate the idea of advancing the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the development of the solutions, and look at the impacts of engineering works on technical, environment, social, cultural, economic, financial, uh, impacts that leave no one behind. I've already mentioned diversity and inclusion, and of course, com communication compliance with laws, environmental and legal systems. And finally, intellectual agility, creativity and innovation. And so you see the importance of the framework with the reach of the International Engineering Alliance framework, which is across uh, uh, the world in the area shaded dark green, and there's a collaboration with the European countries, some 27 nations shaded orange. So you can see it's a huge reach and uh, this framework is extremely important. And you can see here the International Engineering Alliance published uh, and also translated into the six UNESCO languages, again, demonstrating its importance. So the judging criteria of the hackathon are aligned with the graduate attributes and professional competencies framework, which is the basis for the mutual recognition of qualifications. And WFO recognizes this benchmark as the preeminent global standard for engineering education. So participating in the hackathon, the students are able to demonstrate their skills and the outcomes of their engineering education relative to this very important benchmark. The graduate attributes table four uh, consists of 11 elements which relate to knowledge, the engineering society, and the ways to work. And the professional competencies also have 13 elements which relate to knowledge, the engineering society, and the ways to work. So these again demonstrate the importance of aligning the framework with the uh, judging criteria for the hackathon so that the students can demonstrate how they would perform in a real world environment and develop those very important employability skills. So here you see here the, the 10 criteria for judging uh, the hackathon uh, competition, uh, which uh, the 10 elements were to, the teams had to demonstrate their engineering knowledge, the breadth and depth and type of their knowledge, both theoretical and practical to demonstrate how they analyze the problem and the level of thoroughness in examining that, how they design and develop solutions, the extent to which the solution is original and uses new and emerging technologies, how they investigated and researched and demonstrated their skills for ongoing learning, the use of digital tools and new technologies and the extent to which they use computer-aided design, uh, 3D printing, et cetera, in showing their uh, uh, solutions, how their solutions contribute to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the consideration of broad ethical issues, individual and collaborative teamwork, they're forced to work in teams in a very tight time frame, how they communicate with each other, and how they manage the project and, and, and find a solution. So with this background, I come now to how the challenges are developed for the hackathon and also how they incorporate key elements of project-based learning. So the challenges are developed uh, uh, with a learning approach where the challenge is a starting point for the learning process. And it's placed in the context of the student's learning experience. The challenges are authentic and scientifically based. That is, they're relevant to the students and the problem is comprehensible and can be analyzed and solved using engineering approaches. The solutions also, the contents approach, 
is where the solution supports interdisciplinary learning and can span across several different disciplines. The social approach supports, supports team-based learning where the learning process takes place through dialogue and communication and through social interaction. All three approaches mirror real situations at work. The work, hackathon teams work closely together in managing and completing the challenge over a short period of time, taking the challenge as a point of departure for their work. And the students' mutual support and collaboration is essential for success. Any university student attending any university for the entirety of the calendar year is eligible to attend. Entries are open to undergraduate and graduate students, but not PhD. Up to two and to five individuals can work together as a team. And it, the team must contain at least 50% of students enrolled in an engineering degree. The others can be enrolled in other degrees. But we generally find that 90% of the teams uh, are enrolled in engineering degrees. And they have to provide evidence of their eligibility to enter with a university ID card or similar. An individual cannot work across multiple teams and um, the teams can be made up from individuals from different universities. There are two stages. Stage one is in writing and stage two for those finalists, they have to create a five minute video. So project report is not required. And this is a fast-paced uh, global challenge with only two weeks uh, 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 allowed between stage one and stage two. So here you see the website, the web page for the 2022 challenge. And you can see the alignment uh, with various sustainable development goals. And the challenge is also aligned to the theme of the celebrations of World Engineering Day, which was to build back wiser, engineering the future. And the three challenges that were developed in collaboration with Young Engineers uh, uh, Future Leaders Committee of the World Federation of Engineering Organization and Engineers Without Borders were one relating to responsible consumption, the responsible and innovative use of materials uh, and a reduction of non-biodegradable waste such as plastics. The second was innovation using biomimicry that is learning from nature for sustainable solutions that result uh, in an innovative optimal resource use and healthy and improved learning. And the third challenge related to water to show develop a solution which showed access to water in a changing climate to ensure safe and ongoing access for all. The, uh, uh, the submissions were judged with an online platform called Award Stage. Um, and this in, in, ensured robust judging and transparency as well. Uh, the judges were based from all around the world. Stage one judges, uh, again, were from WFEO, Young Engineers, Future Leaders Committee, Engineers Without Border, and SPEED, which is the student body of the International Federation of Engineering Education Societies. Uh, once these were judged, some nine finalists um, prepared videos which were judged by leaders from UNESCO, WFO, and its partners, including Engineers Without Borders, IFES, the Federation of Engineering Education Societies, the Federation of Consulting Engineers, and the International Network for Women Engineers and Scientists. So here you see the winners of the 2022 World Engineering Day Student Hackathon. It was an all-girl team uh, from, uh, uh, from the Batangas State University in the Philippines. And their solution was to recycle PET bottles, which is a plastic uh, bottles used uh, in Coca-Cola and other soft drinks to develop metal organic frameworks that can be used as adsorbents to enable pollutant removal in water. And uh, I had prepared, showed in my uh, presentation the link to YouTube. You can also search it yourself and find it, and you'll see the innovative solution. And here are some of the examples there are. And the second place, we had a mobile rain harvesting system from the University of British Columbia, Okanagan, Canada. And they used this system to provide clean water to Canadian indigenous communities. So you can see they were addressing challenge six water, uh, SDG six, and uh, you can see the elements not only of innovation, but of sustainable, uh, advancing sustainable development through engineering.
And in third place in Kenya, uh, the Egerton University Kenya uh, was a solution that took a water weed, a hyacinth weed, and used to, it to pro process it into a biodegradable uh, alternative to single use plastic products such as plastic bags. Uh, we had some 1,000 individual in entries, 120, 125 teams, and uh, nine finalists, actually. And you can see the cash prizes there uh, that were offered. And uh, the videos are available. Now, we ran this again in 2023. And it, once again, the, the theme, the challenges also aligned with the theme of World Engineering Day celebrations, which is engineering innovation for a more resilient world. There were three challenges. The challenge one was related to SDG 2, no hunger. And the, the students had to develop a solution to feed 10 billion people in a changing climate. S, uh, the challenge two was uh, related to SDG 6, water. Tackling uh, the students have to come up with a solution to tackle water scarcity for future generations. And challenge three was related to good health and well being and also in a thriving city, which is a center for physical and mental health and well-being. The students had to come up with a solution to improve city design and infrastructure by rethinking technologies and retrofitting existing infrastructure. And again, uh, the, the first place uh, went, in fact, to an all-female uh, team uh, from the Philippines, Ateneo Naga University, uh, second place went to Canada, uh, British Columbia, Okanagan, and third place went to Mauritius, University of Mauritius. Uh, you can see here the second uh, prize for Team Aquam Soils, Soils from Okanagan, Canada. And here they developed a 3D printing uh, device that floats on water and can filter uh, water to provide clean water in areas hit by natural disaster. It packs very easily and is and is very light as well. Team AquaSmart from the University of Mauritius developed a system to repurpose rainwater uh, uh, tanks and solar panels to distill water in remote areas, including in the island of Rodriguez. So again, you can see the sustainable development uh, objectives, SDG 6, uh, use of renewable energy, the engineering principles, and of course, the use of innovation and new, new, new tools. Uh, the winning team uh, developed what was called a sponge, a porous material that can uh, using, including agricultural waste to produce a permeable road surface that can absorb rainwater and reduce flooding and improve catchment health. And if you, um, I encourage you to see the YouTube video uh, which is really shows the, the innovative processes that the students use to develop this solution. So you can see here the, the uh, location of all the teams across 23 countries, and um, you can see the global reach. And I hope that we have many more students from Myanmar enter in 2024, because this is a free uh, opportunity. There's no cost, and it's, it's a tremendous uh, challenge. Uh, and, a, and a, on a global scale. Uh, we reached more than uh, 60 million or nearly 60 million in social media um, for World Engineering Day celebrations in 2023, making this the largest engineering event in the world or ever held. <laughs> and uh, we reached more than six and a half million promoting the hackathon in social media, which is quite extraordinary. Uh, and much um, higher than 2022. So we certainly hope we can do this in 2024. So what are the outcomes uh, of the hackathon? This is a com combination of a project-based learning experience, a world-class project opportunity, and aligning with the graduate attributes and professional competencies. There are almost very few opportunities that combine all these attributes. And what we have hoped to get is high levels of engagement as the students get to understand the relevance of what they're studying. It's immediately apparent. And they direct their own learning because the projects are open-ended. They have to make their own decisions and critically evaluate them. So it, re it results in a higher degree of thinking. They develop their employability skills, including complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, and so on. They improve their academic performance because of the self-discovery, problem identifying, 
deeper understanding of their engineering skills and abilities develops and greater confidence. The students are increasingly creative and this encourages them to explore a wide range of solutions. And of course, the research aspect also drives uh, 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 skills in online learning. So it's an overall improvement in student experience. And so basically uh, students learn to collaborate and think creatively to develop the solutions. It's a low cost opportunity and it supports engineering educators, especially those who are new to uh, the field. It supports them because it provides a framework for a great challenge. It addresses specific global challenges and fosters awareness in students of their impact of their work and their skills on advancing the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The students explore endless possibilities for creative so solutions. And as I mentioned previously, the uh, shows the outcomes that they're achieving relative to the global uh, GAPC framework. They can also, of course, develop, demonstrate their technical engineering skills, and it, it, it supports, as I said, the engineering education program. Um, the winning a, a video from 2022 shows, yeah, again, some of the, you can see some of the excerpts from this video, which shows how the team collaborated work virtually, including on Zoom, and how they came together uh, to develop this solution in a very short time frame. So this uh, hackathon can be a great exemplar. It can be some, one of the most important experience of the student and the students are exposed beyond their university campus and country. It's very unique with low cost and they acquire knowledge and competencies which are uh, applicable to a wider context. Interestingly enough, a high proportion of women participated and it shows that intellectual capacity can be developed anywhere. And also we're really proud that the winners came from all over the world, developed and developing countries and shows that intellectual capacity and skills in engineering can be developed anywhere in the world without barriers. And engineers can make a difference for a better world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Marlin Kanga for your very impressive presentation. Then, according to the agenda, second keynote speaker is Professor Ari Philan Ogier, the duty chair of Washington Echo and International Engineering Alliance. May I briefly present about Professor Ari Philan Ogier before the presentation. Professor Ari Fulin Ocular has been with the Electric Care and Electronic Engineering Department of Deccan University, Ankara, since 1986. Professor Ocular research interests are in the area of control theory, game theory, and application of system theory to social science. Professor Ocular is the founding member of MUTIC. Association for Evaluation and Accreditation of the Engineering Program to Kiev. He is a member of the Advisory Board of MUTIC in 2001 to 2023. He served as an at large member of Governing Group in 2022 and presently in the Deputy Chair of the Washington Echo in the International Engineering Alliance. This is a short profile of Dr. Ari Pullen Ocular. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Ari Pullen Ocular cannot attend this conference. Although he cannot join this conference, he sends video message of his keynote presentation. Our technical team will be open this video message. Oh, excuse me. Um, uh, that that recording was just for an insurance, so I am here. Yeah. Ah, sorry. Sorry, Professor. Yeah. In case something sorry. goes wrong, I always provide a recording beforehand. Ah. So, but I am here and I am uh, glad to make a presentation. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, it's okay. okay, Professor. Sorry, Professor. So, uh, may I invite uh, Professor Ari Fulin Ocular uh, uh, for your keynote presentation? Professor, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, the title of my talk is Adapting Engineering Education 
uh, for sustainable development. Um, of course, the word adapting is not a very strong word. It implies change, but it's like uh, adjusting. Uh, and I will try to convince you that this adjustment is necessary and in, in view of the new version of GAPC, it is a reasonably uh, comprehensive adaptation. So the change is not so small and we should really take care that uh, the engineering programs are adjusted uh, to really uh, follow the recommendations or the, the exemplar of GAPC. Now my talk will consist of uh, talking about the role and purpose of graduate attributes and professional competences. And then I will indicate some principles and tools for adaptation. Uh, then of course, I will go over the UN sustainable development goals. Uh, and um, then I will uh, go into the graduate attributes and, uh, and knowledge profile uh, in a little bit detail to indicate where in the GAPC UN SDG is referenced. Then of course, once you do this, ethics and inclusion, creativity and innovation, lifelong learning are new dimensions, emphasized dimensions in the new version of GAPC. So I will also talk about this. Now GAPC, the graduate attributes and professional competences uh, were refined for about 10 years and finally approved in 2013 to be an exemplar or a reference for all member organizations of IEA. Presently, they are a point of reference for all of them and uh, they follow GAPC in building and revising their own graduate outcomes or professional competences. That is, uh, all the member organizations adjust their own graduate outcomes and professional competences to, uh, according to this exemplar. A major new element in version four is of course, bringing UN sustainable development goals strongly forth. And the main thing is that the sustainable development goals cannot be achieved without conscious and active participation of. And I really would like to uh, emphasize this a little bit because think of scientists, they find, discover, explain. Artists, they touch the senses, they simulate, uh, stimulate, they also confuse, but engineers, they are making, building, designing, and creating. So they are basically playing with nature. And in that sense, UN Sustainable Development Goals cannot be achieved without conscious and active participation of engineers. We have to really adjust our engineering programs, education programs towards these goals. Now, uh, before I talk about the principles for adaptation, uh, let me just point out that um, um, my talk basically targets educational programs, and I will give some clues as to how they can adapt uh, using uh, adapt to GAPC uh, by basically implementing the changes in their curriculum. But of course, because of this, that I target educational programs, my talk also will concern all the accrediting organizations. And it will also concern because competences apply to individual engineers who are seeking for licensing and registration professional competence is part of GAPC target that community. And um, 
my talk will therefore also be of interest to professional uh, engineering organizations who do licensing and registration. But I will basically focus on graduate attributes in this talk. Well, the principles for adaptation, uh, these are the principles that should be followed in, in my opinion. Changes must be assimilated, first of all, by all engineering stakeholders, in particular, by professional engineering organizations and accreditation agencies. And I am very glad to see that WFEO is totally committed to promoting the new version of GATC. Actually, they have participated with IEA, collaborated with IEA in developing it. So that's a very nice uh, touch to the new version of GATC. All and all of these organizations and stakeholders need to be aware that the changes are, first of all, discipline independent. It does not, the, the changes do not depend on a particular engineering discipline. It's like uh, applied to all of them. They are accessible attributes and competences. That is, they can be evaluated, measured, and they are also free of unnecessary details. So these are the principles that should be followed in doing the adaptation and the tools for adaptation. What kind of tools are available for the education programs, for instance? Well, the first tool that comes into mind is program educational objectives. You know that these are broad statements that describe what graduates of a program are expected to demonstrate a few years after graduation. So if a program somewhat makes connection with UN SDG or in general sustainability issues in the statement of their objectives, that's a strong message to the public, to the constituencies of the program that they are committed to UN SDG. Program learning outcomes, of course, the major tool these are narrower statements that describe what students are expected to know and able to do by the time of graduation. Graduate attributes are guiding statements for this tool. And you know, the graduate attributes are basically model or exemplar outcomes that the programs can use. Curriculum and learning processes, of course, is another tool because in order to implement the program learning outcomes, programs have to change their or touch their curriculum and rethink their learning processes. So JPC knowledge profiles does this job that gives hints concerning curriculum design. So there are these three tools that educational programs for of engineering can use. Now if you look at quickly at UN Sustainable Development Goals, there are of course 17 of them. And each one of these touch engineering. There are certain goals listed here that are direct, more directly related to engineering. And let's go over these. Goal six is about water and sanitation. Goal seven is about energy, sustainable and modern energy. Goal nine is about infrastructure. So it concerns sustainable industrial, industrialization and innovation. The other four goals are goal 11, which has to do with cities or settlements, inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable settlements. Goal 12 is ensuring sustainable consumption and production patterns. Goal 13 is about combating climate change. And goal 14 uh, is concerns oceans, seas, and marine resources. So these are the more directly related goals. But again, I would like to emphasize that each one of 17 goals are of interest to every engineer. Now, uh, if you look at now, one by one, 
G graduate attributes and where UN SDG or sustainability issues come into the picture. Now, I'm sorry about the crowded page, uh, but there are three columns here, WA3, SA3, this is the third attribute, by the way. And WA3, SA3, this division uh, is in line with three categories of engineers. You know, the professional engineer, technologist, and technician. Uh, of course, there are differences in the duration of education. Usually, uh, the professional engineer goes through a four or five year education. A technologist goes through a three or four year education and a technician goes through, a three. but the real difference is really the problems they consider. Engineers are concerned with complex engineering problems. Technologists are concerned with broadly defined engineering problems. And Dublin Accord, D, D stands for Dublin, S stands for Sydney, W stands for Washington. And this one uh, concerns uh, technicians and they are well-defined engineering problems. So the, the, the categories you see here, and the wording is a little bit different in which one of them, because of this difference of problem uh, definition or the, the concern of the problem that are concerned, they are concerned with. Now, if you look at the Washington Accord column, then the design development of solutions reads design creative solutions for complex engineering problems and design systems component or processes to meet identified needs with appropriate consideration for public health and safety, whole life cost, net zero carbon, as well as resource, cultural, societal and environmental considerations as required. So it says a lot of things, but first of all, it says design. Design, we know, is the main occupation of an engineer. So whether a solution is a design solution is really distinguished by the problem it considers. The problem is incomplete, must be incompletely defined, not amenable to a deductive resolution and requires an innovative or creative approach. That is the first feature of a design problem. The second one is that the problem admits different but acceptable, equally accept, ex acceptable solutions. So this is the kind of problems we are talking about. Engineers' main consideration are these problems. And we know that many uh, engineering accreditation criteria that the accrediting organizations use require a capstone design course usually a two semester long that's placed in the last year and specify that the design problem solved must require skills and knowledge to acquire in the earlier years of the curriculum. So it should really consider almost everything that the engineer has learned or the potential engineer has learned. And it should be a comprehensive uh, problem solving exercise. That's a capstone design project. So this, if it is in the curriculum, is a good way of towards satisfying that all the students have this kind of attribute. It may also be a good, you know, how do you really uh, ensure that all these sustainability considerations are in view of the student who is in this process of designing? Well. The first thing one can do is include reference to UNSTG in the design checklist, because every capstone design project we know has kind, some kind of a checklist that the student goes over. So this UNSTG in there, or form a list based on UNSTG. So that's the easier, easiest thing to do. Um, I will also mention other uh, possibilities, but here, if you notice, there is references to WK5, SK5, etc. These are references to the knowledge profile. So for instance, the concerning knowledge profile here is WK5 and it says 
knowledge, including efficient resource use, environmental impacts, etc. So this is really the hints for the curriculum designer, what kind of knowledge a student needs in order to be able to, you know, implement this attribute so that the student really has this attribute, uh, he or she or graduating. graduating. So these are hints for easiest way to understand what the knowledge and attitude profile is, is to view it as a hint for curriculum design. Now, continuing with the attribute, the appropriate considerations, this term that occurs here, uh, they are not the design specs, which may already be present in the problem definition. This really refers to the circumstantial requirements that arise from the interaction of the proposed solution with environment and society. Now, here, some sustainability issues are explicitly listed because they are items that have been overwhelmingly mentioned in the surveys that the working group conducted uh, in preparing the new version of GAPC. So these are the sustainability issues that have been strongly brought forward by the um, constituencies of IEA. Now, the next attribute I will consider is problem analysis. Well, again, looking at the Washington Accord for Professional Engineering column, it says identify, formulate research literature and analyze complex engineering problems, reaching substantiated conclusions using first principles of mathematics, natural sciences, and engineering sciences with holistic considerations for sustainable development. And there is a reference to a footnote here. And that footnote uh, is this one, represented by the 17 goals of UNSDG. So this is a strong reference to UNSDG from the document GAPC. Now, the word research here, uh, we should really interpret the attributes as the minimal requirements that a graduate should satisfy, fulfill. So they can do more, but the minimum that this word research requires is that the student uh, makes a survey of textbook literature concerning the problem he or she is going to analyze. So it's nothing too, uh, too much to ask for from the student uh, for a four year curriculum. And UNSDG considerations are relevant at each and every problem because it occurs at the problem analysis attribute. So therefore, UNSDG considerations also apply to, during the phase of problem analysis. Also at design, we already mentioned that, and also problem evaluation stages. But the students must be first made aware of what these considerations are and learn how to identify those that are relevant to a particular problem on that analysis. So that's the task of the curriculum designer. If you look at the knowledge profile that one of the knowledge profiles that this attribute concerns uh, is WK1, which is a systematic theory-based understanding of the natural sciences. So understanding of the natural sciences applicable to the discipline and awareness of relevant social sciences. Well, we have seen in Professor Kanga's presentation that the, the attributes required of an engineer, well, of course, the first and foremost is the engineering knowledge, but there are all these other qualities that the you know, professional engineers should have. So, for that, they should have a broad education and social sciences is one dimension they should really consider in their education. So educational programs should, must provide an awareness of relevant social sciences. Now, awareness 
uh, of course, I am not really gonna go into semantics here, but awareness, but what's meant by awareness? What's my, meant by understanding and knowledge? These are semantic issues, but in GAPC document, they are really defined as technical terms, operative terms. So awareness is defined in GAPC document as asking the right questions, including among the hypothesis complying with or respecting when faced with a situation. These may be acceptable demonstrations of uh, awareness. So awareness is less than knowledge or understanding and more than acquaintance or familiarity, the way the document JPC uses it. On the other hand, here it says for natural sciences and understanding. So this is a stronger requirement than this one. We should really be aware of or an adapting engineering program should be aware of this distinction. Now, continuing, we have the engineer and the verb. And this is where UNSDG strongly again, figures. Uh, because this concerns you know, the sustainable development outcomes for society, economy, the sustainability and health and safety, legal and environmental impacts of engineering work in solving complex engineering problems. Now, an obvious method of implementation, again, is to use the capstone design experience. But I am really grateful that Professor Kanga talked at length about hackathon because encouraging your students to take part in WFU hackathon is a very good way of implementing this in the uh, learning process in the curriculum. So hackathon is a good tool to use to make students aware of what these sustainability issues are. Now, again, going back to the awareness of social sciences, well, an example implementation for this may be to limit the social science electives to restricted pool of courses that are relevant to the discipline, just a suggestion. Well, in some disciplines, of course, it may be necessary to devote a full three semester credit course for a particular aspect in this role. So considering all these sustainability issues, for instance, in health and safety in chemical engineering, I think must be a must course. So observe, uh, otherwise the observance of these aspects in each major student work on analysis and design may be sufficient. Now, continuing with ethics and um, um, diversity and inclusion, now, in this new version of GAPC, there's, there's a dedicated role uh, for the ethics. And you can also see that diversity and inclusion come, comes into the picture in the ethics role. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but the, this role is about understanding and practicing ethics. The editions are dealing with aspects of ethics in compasses. Uh, DNI diversity and inclusion as an attitude is very much part of ethics. So teamwork, for instance, communication, another instance is where the diversity and inclusion are important considerations. Now, if a devoted course to ethics is not feasible, usually the case, then the best way to implement this attribute in the curriculum may be to design as parts of some appropriate courses, a number of case studies. Because a knowledge of ethics is required. An example of implementation for the demonstration of diversity and inclusion as an attitude may be to design one or two case studies on workplace ethics problem on non-discrimination. Another example I give for implementing di uh, diversity or inclusion is that in every lab team that is formed by students, make it a random choice. You know, make the, 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 the formation of the teams randomly so that the students don't have, you know, they, they don't, they usually prefer to choose their own partners, but make them learn to work with different kind of partners. 
because diversity also applies to learning differences. So that may be another suggestion that I might. Again, the reference to WK9 here is the, is the knowledge profile, which lists the kind of uh, ethical issues that the curriculum should address. So again, this is a repetition, but as a disposition of or, or attitude, ethics, uh, whether it's professional uh, norms or not, uh, and inclusion are in the same category as ethics. They need to be implemented in an analogous manner in the project plan. Now, the next one is creativity and innovation and lifelong learning. Um, duration and manner is the concern here, both of them, duration and manner. So uh, it says recognize the need for and have the preparation and ability for independent and lifelong learning, adaptability to new and emerging technologies, and critical thinking in the broadest context of technology change. So the new title refers to both continuity and kind of learning. Critical thinking and creative approach. These are these may not be considered to be knowledge elements. Uh, they may be counted perhaps more as attitudes. They are difficult to teach, but the curriculum can help the students to acquire them. Critical thinking can be understood as an active, logical, and questioning process of accepting facts or beliefs. So, for instance, for a professor uh, of engineering in a course, uh, the way to encourage uh, any different kind of solution to a homework, to a midterm problem, maybe one way of encouraging. Uh, you know, people to appreciate critical thinking, just a small example. So there are ways of implementing critical thinking and creativity into the curriculum. By the way, if, if some of you already are thinking, how do you really implement creativity in a curriculum? Well, we all know that we write recommendation letters. And one of the first questions that you have to answer in a recommendation letter is whether the student is creative or not. So you should really make a judgment there. So there must be waves of implementing creativity in a curriculum. Now, to conclude, the higher education programs need to accumulate and share their knowledge concerning adaptation, which consists of implementation, assessment, and improvement stages of attaining the attributes listed in GAPC. Sharing is very important because, you know, uh, how to implement attributes in, a, in an education pro pro uh, program uh, is a design problem. So we have to be really creative in implementing that, okay. The second one is accreditation and registration organizations prefer to stay away from giving specific advice on how to to their constituents as it would be binding to the organization. There are, however, other organizations like deans of engineering that can provide some much needed guidance to the education programs. An evaluation of the effectiveness of GAPC in relation to whether they meet constituents uh, needs must be done until the time for the next review and at this point, I would like to thank uh, Myanmar Engineering Council and uh, CIE, Committee of uh, uh, Education and Engineering, and Professor Charlie Tan for early contributions to the development of the new GAPC before I forget. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Ari Bulen Ocular. Uh, I apologize for my misunderstanding, Professor. Now, we would like to move next agenda. May I invite next keynote speaker, Dr. Mandilio, Chair of Sydney ACOP and International Engineering Alliance, IE, and Directors and Deputy Exclusives Director of Accreditation Council 
Institutes of Engineering Education Taiwan, IET. Before the presentation, I would like to present briefly about Dr. Mandy Liu. Current position of Dr. Mandy Liu is the Beauty Exclusive Director of Accreditation Council and Office Director of IET from 2004 to present. Previous position of Dr. Mandy Liu is Research Associate, American Association of Medical College, AAMC, Washington, D.C., USA, from 2001 to 2004. Doctor's education is PhD in Higher Education Policy and Management, Claremont Graduate University, USA, in 2001. International Accord related experience are Share of Sydney Accord from 2023 to present. The beauty share of Sydney Accord in 2001 to 2023, panel member of WA Verification Review Tank 2, CAC in Mexico in 2018, IET Mings contact window to the International Engineering Alliance from 2004 to present. Now it is time to deliver your keynote speak, Dr. Manny Liu. The floor is yours. Delta, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Xiaowing Meng. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, allow me to share my screen. Um, I hope you can uh, see my screen now. Um, good afternoon, uh, Your Excellency, uh, Professor Dr. Charlie, uh, President Andrew Melt, and um, patrons at Myanmar Engineering Council and colleagues in Myanmar and around the world. I'm Mandy Liu, Deputy Executive Director of IET and the new Chair of Sydney Accord. First of all, many thanks to Myanmar Engineering Council's invitation for me to speak uh, at the uh, 2023 ICEA uh, today. Um, Professor Liang Zheng Liu and I have the honor and pleasure to serve as Myanmar Engineering Council's mentor um, within the Washington Accord um, community. Uh, we are have been helping Myanmar Engineering Council to, um, to, to move towards Washington Accord uh, full signatory um, membership for uh, the past few years. Um, so I have been to Myanmar uh, many, many times. And now after the COVID, we are hoping that uh, our engagement can be uh, restarted. Uh, and then we are hoping that um, Myanmar Engineering Council can move uh, towards um, in your uh, applications uh, towards Washington Accord. Uh, today, I will share with you about IET experience adapting to the new IEA uh, requirements on the uh, GAPC, especially the GA parts, because IET is a accreditation agency. Uh, a lot of those adaptation has to do with supporting programs uh, to deliver student outcomes in the area of sustainability development. Uh, Professor Bullen just uh, gave us a uh, wonderful presentation about the details of the, the uh, graduate attributes requirements. And I think uh, a lot of what he uh, recommended uh, can be noted and then help us uh, to move forward, uh, help you, help IET um, for us at, in Taiwan. And I'm sure for many uh, signatories in the um, IEA community uh, to uh, see how we go about uh, uh, modifying our accreditation systems accordingly. Uh, the title of my talk uh, today is therefore educating the sustain sustainability uh, engineers of the future. Um, at the beginning of uh, my talk, please allow me to uh, just introduce briefly about Senior Accord. I'm wearing the hat of the chair now. Um, Professor Elizabeth Taylor, who will be presenting later, is the chair of the governing group of IEA and also the new deputy chair of Senior Accord. She will share with you more perspectives on the IEA, so I will just touch base briefly on the Senior Accord. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Washington Accord, which uh, Myanmar Engineering Council 
uh, is uh, a, a provisional signatory of. And senior accord, on the other hand, is um, specifically focused on academic programs dealing with engineering technology rather than engineering at the level of professional engineers level um, of the Washington Accord. Um, so uh, the graduates recognized by uh, CIMI Accord, uh, we are hoping that uh, the level of uh, competencies um, will be um, to uh, will be able to solve broadly defined problems rather than complex problems. So there's a uh, difference between Washington Accord and Sydney Accord. We are actually looking at different cohorts of uh, engineers, pro engineers professionals. Um, as you can see on the screen here, uh, we also have a logo that could be authorized for signatories and their accredited programs to uh, to use. So. Um, I, I, at least at IET, we consider this as a very good marketing tool. Washington Accord uh, and Dublin Accord, as also uh, all, all the three accords under IEA has our own individual logos that we can uh, facilitate our uh, signatories and their programs to use when they are promoting uh, their accredited programs. Uh, the Sydney Accord was founded in 2001, uh, many years after the Washington Accord. Um, as of 2023, we have 11 uh, signatories and two provisional signatories. Uh, seven out of the 11 uh, signatories were the founding members. Our 11 uh, signatories uh, representing jurisdictions of Australia, um, you can see from the screen here, Canada, Hong Kong, Ireland, South Africa, UK, New Zealand, USA, Korea, Chinese Taipei, uh, IET is, a, um, is the signatory, and Malaysia. And the two provisional members are Peru, uh, from Peru, and IESL from Sri Lanka. As of 2023 meeting that we just had in uh, Taiwan, uh, in Taichung, um, senior core recognized programs, the number of uh, senior core recognized programs among the, the 11 signatories is about 850. Uh, Professor Elizabeth uh, Taylor and I will be working on supporting more accreditation systems to become members of the senior court. Uh, although this category of engineering technologists the level uh, equivalent for senior court may not be regulated in many countries, but from the perspectives of quality assurance of educational systems, we consider accreditation service as this level of education as equally uh, important. That's why we are hoping that um, in the senior court, we have 11 um, signatories signatories, um, but uh, Washington Accord, we have 23. And um, of the reason is and the level of education for engineering technologists uh, may not be regulated uh, in many countries. Uh, but then uh, we are hoping that uh, from, from the perspective of quality assurance, we will hope that more accreditation system will also join uh, senior accord uh, in the um, years ahead. Um, title of my talk is Educating the Sustainability Engineers of the Future, uh, but the future is actually now. Uh, the clock is ticking. That's why uh, you can see um, if I um, if I can reasonably put it, um, I'm sure colleagues, uh, you can find that uh, today, um, the, 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 all, most of the conferences, it's not all conference, but I would say more than half of the conferences or meetings uh, nowadays uh, has some elements of sustainable, uh, sustainable uh, development. Uh, we are all talking about um, CSR, USR, University Social Responsibilities, Corporate uh, Social Responsibilities, or ESG. Uh, so um, the clock is actually ticking. Uh, we can 
uh, education is preparing uh, future engineers. But actually, uh, those engineers uh, with all those skills that uh, Professor Bullen uh, just shared um, are the ones that we need in the industry now. That's why I'm saying that the clock is ticking and actually uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, alarming. Um, many of the challenges in the world are, are SDGs related and all of the complex problems that uh, engineers are facing now demand solutions today, not tomorrow. And of, or a few years down the road, after all, higher education um, it takes three years for senior for normally in average three years uh, at the level of engineering technology, uh, just level and four years uh, for uh, Washington Accord uh, level of uh, professional engineers. Therefore, accreditation agencies like IET, uh, we must work collaboratively with the programs uh, on developing and enhancing sustainability curriculum so our uh, students could be equipped with the needed skills, um, knowledge, and attitudes by time of uh, graduation. Um, but what does a future engineer look like? Um, some experts are saying that uh, future ready graduates might have to look like Leonardo da, da Vinci, um, whom we know is uh, one of the kind of genius. Uh, you, you may ask why our graduates need to be like da Vinci. Um, this might be a bit exaggerating. But uh, if you look at all the uh, knowledge, the skills, and the type of attitudes that uh, we expect of our graduates uh, nowadays, uh, it's pretty much, it's very diverse and it's very um, challenging. Uh, so in light of post-COVID world uh, challenges that we are facing, uh, we need to prepare uh, students. Um, they can develop new skills, not just the current skills. They re need to revitalize current skills. And they also need to have the mental capacity for active learning, um, uh, also lifetime uh, learning that um, Professor Bullen just mentioned. They need to have the uh, ability to think, uh, synthesize a broad and multidisciplinary knowledge that bridge natural and engineering science. And also there's need to be a touch of social science and art. And they also need to uh, create, as uh, co-create, create sustainability um, solutions. They need to have a curious uh, mind. They need to have growth mindset. And they also need to have the mental stress uh, tolerance. So taken all of this, uh, this is uh, quite a challenging. Uh, if we are uh, need to... Um, Perfect. the challenges that we are facing today. These are the expectations of our students. We need our students to have all this, uh, this competencies by time of graduation. Uh, we are talking about um, many of our colleagues today uh, in the audience are educators. Uh, we are talking about uh, training our students to uh, have the ability of sustainability uh, development uh, goals in their mind. Uh, but, the action, but actually, the industry is running in front of us. Uh, I, I saw this piece of news that could be demonstrated that how industry is embracing uh, sustainability development. Uh, I'm sure you have observed the same thing that I have observed. Uh, that is, corporations, big or small, are making sustainability development their business priority in recent years. Uh, they have invested a lot in this area. And I'm sure uh, whether it's government uh, regulations or uh, it's uh, a, a, a good thing for the business to do, uh, everybody is talking about this topic. And uh, Patagonia, a company that is making sportswear, outdoor wear, um, put the, on their website an announcement of what their founder uh, had said 
uh, if you have any hope of a thriving planet 50 years from now, uh, it demands all of us doing all we can with the resource we have. We are making Earth our shareholders. So uh, this is why the editor of this piece, uh, as, uh, he is saying that companies is going purpose instead of going public. Uh, I'm sure this company is not alone uh, in uh, this modern world in making this kind of commitment. They might put it differently, but I'm sure most of the uh, companies are putting sustainability uh, or ESG as the priority of their business today. Uh, so the world has changed and engineers are uh, and it should be those who are driving uh, the changes. Um, Dr. Malin Kanga, who spoke earlier, uh, once said among the SDGs goals um, where engineers have a very, very important roles are uh, goal number six, clean water and sanitation for all. Um, goal number seven, availability of sustainable energy source. Uh, um, goal number nine, creating strong and resilience in a uh, resilient infrastructure. Uh, goal and goal 11, livable cities. She was saying that these are the most important uh, goals that engineers have a role in. Uh, she, she, she's not saying that other goal, goals are uh, have nothing to do with engineers. Those are the goals that are most important. And I also think uh, that goal number 12, responsible consumption and production is also very much core to the work of engineers. And, or we should say goal 12 is what inspires an engineer to do what uh, he or she uh, does. And uh, actually, Professor Bullen uh, just say, uh, said that, which I agree totally, that uh, none of the 17 uh, SDGs goals um, do not require engineers. And that means that uh, in uh, Professor Bullen's word, uh, all of the SDGs goals touch engineering, which is very, uh, very true. And we all agree that, um, having said that, we all agree that sustainable solutions are, are dynamic. So even though we are uh, trying or we, our goal is to, um, to come up with a, sustain, a sustainable curriculum uh, to uh, train our students to have that kind of uh, mindset, knowledge, uh, or skills, but then we also need to realize sustainability solutions are dynamic. Uh, circumstances of sustainability challenges are changing. In other words, solutions are not always transferable from one ecosystem or scenario to another ecosystem or scenario. New scientific understanding and knowledge are emerging. Creative and innovative ways of pairing up solutions with the sustainability problems and challenges, and new business models, social models, and governance models are emerging. So that's why I think um, within the IEA, within the graduate attributes uh, in uh, that required um, in the community, in the IEA community, lifelong learning is so important. The students or future engineers, they need to work in ways that they can adapt throughout their career. Um, in terms of the purpose uh, of a sustainability curriculum, that's uh, why uh, we are discussing uh, here today, uh, to prepare our students for the reality of 21st century, um, the curriculum needs to change too. And uh, to just simplif um, to simplifying it, uh, the purpose of sustainability curriculum is to enable uh, graduates to be future ready, uh, to have the deeper sense of real world and life. Uh, we hope to infuse future engineers to make transition from the point of use consumption thinking 
to life cycle thinking of products and services. So you can see that, first of all, the uh, mind change, the mindset change is very important. That will drive our training of the students. So sustainability uh, in curriculum will transform the minds of students and thus enabling transition to healthy individuals, society, and Earth. Um, here are just some key features of sustainability curriculum developed by experts. Um, designing a sustainable curriculum is not simply adding some content knowledge into a unit or a course, or rather it is integrating these principles of sustainability throughout the whole unit or course uh, or the program and deliver the course in sustainable ways. Sustainable curriculum will be transformative rather than transmissive as its goal to equip all people with the knowledge, skills, and understanding necessary to make decisions based upon their full uh, environmental, social, cultural, and economic uh, implications rather than transmissive with a goal to provide students with knowledge. So transformative rather than transmissive. It will not be specialized, a content-driven unit of study on sustainability, but integrating across course, uh, courses and units. And the pedagogy for sustainability curriculum needs to be cooperative. Uh, Professor Bullen uh, just mentioned about capstone design courses, uh, which I will touch um, later. Um, it's, it requires cooperative requires problem-based um, design, and it also needs to be experiential learning. Uh, so in a sustainable uh, curriculum, connecting with a local, regional, or global community is important to find relevance to the topics of interest and problems being solved. Uh, so uh, I'm just echo uh, Professor Bruland and also Dr. Malin Kangas, um, a share, sharing of the uh, WFEO's hackathon student competition. Uh, I think uh, if we think about it, uh, how we demonstrate uh, students um, learning in this area, um, capstone courses, uh, hackathon, are a very good um, ways to do it. And in summary, uh, the uh, sustainable curriculum is based on seven uh, principles, transformation and change, not just transmissive of knowledge. Uh, it's very different from uh, the way we teach in the past. Uh, it should be education for all and lifelong uh, learning. Uh, it takes systems thinking, highlighting connection between environmental, economic, social, and even political systems. So it needs to be a system thinking rather than a uh, just a piece, uh, piece by piece to, uh, and then, or uh, a, uh, um, the, the, it's, it will be uh, very different from uh, the past. Uh, it needs to be a vision of a better future. Uh, so that's why problem solving uh, comes to be uh, at the core of a cure, uh, sustainable curriculum, sustainability curriculum. So critical thinking and reflection, especially the part of reflection. Uh, if for a uh, capstone design, students need to go through all the different steps they need to uh, uh, they need to uh, design solutions they need to try out and they need to reflect uh, on what they do and it takes participation engaging uh, groups and individuals so uh, the, the the mind uh, the students need to have the community mindset uh, what they um, they need to uh, their their job is to solve problems but they need to have a purpose behind what they do, and they need to know. Uh, they need to understand that uh, what they do is to help out the community uh, to solve problems. It's just it's not just um, come up with solutions or uh, in a creative way. 
uh, they are actually helping out uh, uh, people in their community and around the world. Uh, so therefore, partnership for change will be very, very important. Uh, you cannot do it alone uh, in a capstone uh, design course. Uh, students need to work in uh, in in partner uh, with their partners. They need to uh, work in a team. Uh, and I like it so much uh, that Professor Bullen just shared. Uh, in order for students to uh, learn about uh, diversity, uh, equality, and inclusions, they um, they they uh, we can have the students uh, to choose their uh, partners randomly. Uh, so in, in the end, the the um, the teamwork, uh, the community, and we the the uh, the idea of working together to make a change is so uh, very different. Uh, it's not just uh, a partnership uh, within uh, one country. And nowadays, there are so many projects as takes partnership uh, among the teams around the world. Um, so in the end, uh, our faculty members must change. Um, faculty members are at the center of higher education's effort to train sustain, uh, sustainable uh, engineers of the future. However, uh, faculty members must change themselves to change uh, so that change could happen. Uh, experts have identified some challenges that affect a sustainability curriculum to happen. Uh, some of the examples are most faculty members do not have good uh, or strong foundation and knowledge of sustainability principles and solutions. So uh, if we don't have that kind of understanding or that kind of knowledge, how could we uh, teach our students? Uh, we, we have to um, improve ourselves and you know, we, we also need to seek help uh, from outside or from among uh, our colleagues. Uh, faculty members who do not have the opportunity to upgrade the knowledge or and or lack of incentives for change and transition into new areas. Uh, moreover, stricter uh, core dis disciplinary requirements often do not allow for sustainable uh, substantial changes in the curriculum. Uh, this is a fact. Um, that encountered in, in every uh, in every part of the world. I just have a, a program, a dean from a uh, engineering school. Um, he was um, sharing with me that uh, because of the uh, government's um, the Ministry of Education's requirement, they need to lower um, the the academic unit and uh, in. <laughs> There are uh, private schools, though, so they need to um, meet the government's requirements. However, um, if we lower the academic unit, how could we uh, even try to think about all this we are trying to do? So it's a very difficult uh, um, environment for some of the faculty members, I'm sure. Um, also, the last point in the case of professional degrees, any changes to the curriculum and degree programs have to be reviewed and endorsed by professional accreditation bodies like IET and society, which tend to be national or as well as international. But luckily, uh, at the IEA, uh, Washington Accord, Sydney Accord, uh, Dublin Accord, we are actually embracing uh, those changes. Uh, so within the IEA, I uh, think you have heard uh, many times uh, by now, and probably you will hear uh, some more later. Um, in uh, 2021, uh, the IEA has a historical revision of the graduate attributes and professional competencies that uh, Professor Bullen just shared with all of us uh, early on. Uh, GAPSD is a guiding document for all signatories or members of the Alliance to follow for benchmarking standards for their accreditation or recognition systems. Um, after uh, the new GAPSD uh, was released in June 2021, uh, signatories and members of uh, the Alliance, including IET, and Myanmar Engineering Council, we need to come up with roadmap and implementations uh, plan uh, in three years, which is the deadline is next year. 
Um, but um, so these are uh, just some of the uh, key revisions of the new GAPSI. Uh, since Professor Bullen uh, has a very thorough uh, um, presentation earlier, I wouldn't go into the details now. Um, but I just I can share with you what IET has been doing um, in terms of our um, plan. Um, IET's uh, adapting uh, plan. Uh, what we have to do, you can see from the uh, screen now, we actually revised our accreditation uh, criteria in May 2022, a year after the new GAPC uh, was released. Um, that was just basically a criteria revisions. The first batch of programs that use the new criteria will be undergoing reviews later this year. Actually, they are submitting their self-study report uh, this week. And we hope to have some feedbacks from the programs and reflect on the revision next spring uh, when we have completed the first implementation. So this is kind of a, our pilot um, period. So by 2023, uh, three years timeline set by the IEA, we will have an opportunity to reflect on the implementation and may uh, modify further if needed. Um, but uh, even though um, we uh, have a revision of our accreditation criteria, now we are guiding programs on mapping uh, their courses and uh, sustainability related outcomes. And uh, once we have finished uh, the accreditation review this year, uh, we should be able to share best practice uh, at workshops next year or in the years ahead. And um, of course, the end outcomes uh, is to um, make sure that programs are able to deliver uh, the kind of uh, student outcomes that we required uh, in, uh, the, in light of the new gap scene and also to demonstrate with evidence that their students have that kind of outcomes. Uh, but we trust that universities and programs are already delivering sustainability, uh, sustainability related curriculum. It's not just our uh, IET calls out for this uh, change and they start making changes. Actually, uh, the Ministry of Education or, um, or, or, or um, everywhere in uh, the higher education arena, uh, we are all talking about sustainability development goals. And so, but uh, what is at core is that whether uh, they are able to map their courses with student outcomes, the kind of outcomes that we shared uh, with you today, uh, it's not the old uh, set of outcomes, the new set of outcomes, and also whether the programs are able to assess student uh, outcomes. It's not just having the curriculum and then a uh, period. Uh, we, we need to make sure that students do learn from the uh, from all of this learning. And also we need to present evidence of student outcomes. So these are the work uh, that we will be doing in the uh, years ahead. And this is a sample of what we require the programs to have in their self-study report submission uh, for accreditation review. They will need to do course mapping against the SDGs. All the courses must be compiled to come up with some quantitative data to show extent to which the program's curriculum engages with elements of SDGs. Uh, meanwhile, IET encourage programs to showcase some simple courses in this area. Uh, this is just a sample to show uh, the way in which we guide our programs to demonstrate their uh, sustainability curriculum and their training uh, for student uh, outcomes in this direction. Uh, so you can see um, uh, the sample here, uh, but IET, we understand that not all SDGs need to be mapped or could be mapped. Uh, we we do not require all courses to be mapped with uh, SDGs related outcomes, and some SDGs are trained in ed general education or extra uh, activities. So that's something that we need to uh, understand. Um, IET uh, pays a lot of attention to uh, 
capstone design courses in our accreditation system. Uh, we look at how they are designed, how the courses are designed, how the courses are delivered, and how student outcomes are assessed in the capstone courses. Uh, therefore, we will begin to see how the programs incorporate SDGs elements into their capstone design courses. Uh, they need to demonstrate students' work, uh, works uh, in and in trying to solve complex problems with sustainable uh, solutions. Um, so this is something that we will be working on, which I'm, I was very happy to hear um, Professor Bullen's presentation earlier, but this is the right uh, direction to go. And in uh, addition to modify our accreditation system, we also uh, IET, at IET, we also make sustainability development the theme of IET's General Assembly last year. This year, we celebrate our 20th anniversary. Um, so last year, we had three keynote speakers to speak on policy, from policy, industry, and academic perspectives. And those talks were very inspiring and helped IET to get the message across to our members and accredited programs that IET is serious about this topic. And also uh, within the IEA uh, community, IET represents the accreditation. Uh, uh, IET uh, represents uh, the accreditation systems uh, among the accords. And then we also have a CIE Chinese uh, Institute of Engineers. Uh, they represent the agreement. Um, in August uh, last year, IET and CIE, um, we um, signed an MOU to collaborate uh, uh, to promote uh, the new IEA gap state collaboratively. Uh, only through collaboration that we could reach engineers and engineering academics. Uh, together to make sustainability development a priority in our training of future engineers. In conclusion, I think sustain a sustainable uh, curriculum needs to be reflected in general education, uh, professional engineering courses, as well as in the last mile, uh, capstone design courses. Uh, design of a sustainable uh, a curriculum must follow a system thinking and align the various stages of training of students. It cannot be uh, just a capstone courses, for instance, because students would not have time to deliver sustainable solutions in a capstone course should they not uh, train in prior uh, courses. Uh, overall speaking, in terms of pedagogy, we could use short courses, case studies, uh, seminars, student projects, and even internship to do that. And in short, most experts trust that sustainability of the curriculum must be multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary or tr even uh, transdisciplinary. And finally, uh, I'm sure uh, much will have to uh, be done. And thank you very much for allowing me uh, the opportunity to share with you what IET has been doing uh, so far. Um, but uh, again, uh, signatories within uh, the IA communities have already started to share their practices. And we have seen some of the good practices in the past. And I will, I'm sure we will be seeing more all of this will only help us to become better and uh, relevant um, accreditation system to our uh, constituencies. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mandilio, for your informative presentation. According to the agenda, the next speaker is Emeritus Professor Elizabeth Taylor, Chair of Governing Group of International Engineering Alliance, IEAN, Deputy Chair of Sydney ECO and International Engineering Alliance, IE. Before the presentation, I would like to present short profile of Emeritus Professor Dr. Alice Bechtela. Professor Alice Bechtela, specialist in governance, affected next and analysis of 
complex project and ecosystem. How Carrier has been industry design, construction, and aquarium. She has paid a stance spoke level leadership in professional organization in innovative technology entries. Currently, she is chair of Smart Creek Concrete Research Center, focused on concrete in share of governing group and the duty share of Sydney Airport of the International Engineering Alliance. She is past chair of Washington Echo. Professor Ellis Beck has always engaged in diverse pro bono work. Currently, she is chair of Cambodian Children Trust Australia. Previously, she was chair of Radar Australia and Humanitarian Response Agency and chair of Radar International. Professor Ellis Beck is an officer of the Order of Australia, AO, and Honorary Fellow of Engineer Australia, Fellow of the Australian Institute of Company Director, Fellow of the Academy of Technological Science and Engineering, and has been recognized as one of the Australia 100 most influential engineer. In 2021, she was awarded Engineer Australia Peter Nicker Russell Carrier Achievement Memorial Medal. This is a short profile of Emeritus Professor Elizabeth Dillon. Now, Thank you may very I much. invite Emeritus Professor Dr. Elizabeth Dillon to deliver your keynote presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor. Thank you very much. I'm just trying to work out how to ensure that I have my presentation as the... Is my presentation on your screen? Yes, yes, Professor. Yes, Professor. Yes, Professor. Which presentation are you seeing? I see EEA 2023 Myanmar. The role of the international the Friday is the role of the International Engineering Alliance in accelerating the 2030 agenda for the sustainable development. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Hello. Uh, the title of your presentation. What we saw is uh, the role of the International Engineering Alliance, i.e. In, in accelerating the 2030 agenda for the sustainable development. Am I right? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's difficult for me to see, but esteemed colleagues, I am honoured to be asked to be here today to share my thoughts with you on the role of the International Engineering Alliance in accelerating the 2020-30 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And I'm particularly honoured to be following in uh, the presentations of a number of my esteemed colleagues. Uh, so I will certainly refer to their presentations as well. And there will be a little bit of overlap because I think as we are all working in the same place, uh, that you will see that the conversations are occurring globally as we all give you our, uh, our ideas on what is moving forward. So in moving to the second slide, I'm just trying to work out how to do this. The Washington Accord is, uh, just trying to work out Are you seeing, I think I might have yes. to get rid of, rid of uh, just yeah. sorry, the second screen because I'm getting confused about which one you're seeing. Uh, uh, only first slide of your present is a PowerPoint presentation. Third slide? Uh, the no, first slide. Second slide, first, first second slide now? Yes, 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 we see second slide, Professor. Thank you. Uh, 
The International Engineering Alliance is a global not-for-profit which comprises, as of 2023, 30 countries uh, with the uh, successful application of Nigeria, Corin, to become a member of the Washington Accord as a provisional member. And these international agreements cover multilateral recognition of engineering educational qualifications and professional competence and facilitate quality and engineering mobility across the professional and, as Dr Mandy has noted, the technologist for the Sydney Accord and the technician, the Dublin Accord. Uh, as she mentioned, it is really important that we understand that all members of the engineering team are important participants in developing our future. And so the more we can highlight the contribution of each and ensure the quality of the contribution of each, the better the outcomes will be for our communities. So within the IEA, we are very focused on ensuring that the contributions of all members are as uh, highlighted across our relationships. We are here today to talk as we have been on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, noting that they are a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future. We are all very aware of the global challenges and increasingly aware of the global challenges of poverty, inequality, climate, environmental degradation, prosperity, peace and justice. And from our perspective as part members of the engineering team, we do appreciate that we have a large role to play. My talk here today is very much focused on what levers the International Engineering Alliance has to assist us to accelerate, accelerate the 2030 agenda. These include the IEA members themselves, our GAPSI benchmark standards, which uh, Professor Bulland and, uh, and Marlene Kanga and uh, Dr Mandy have all uh, spoken to, and they are a very important foundational document for us moving forward. Our third lever is accreditation of engineering education and recognition of professional competence. As this is focused more on the educational side, um, my talk will focus more in the area of accreditation of engineering education, but it is important to understand that the recognition of professional competence for those who are seeking licensure or uh, chartered status is equally important in the process of ensuring the integrity of our engineering activities. And the fourth lever we have is our relationship building uh, between uh, with many other similar focused organizations. So at present, in 2023, there are numerous, uh, there are 30 uh, countries who are members of the International Engineering Alliance. And for the purposes of understanding the power this presents in driving forward and accelerating the 202030 agenda, that membership represents over 64% of the world population. So if we are looking at opportunities to really drive the agenda, then we do have the opportunities within all of our members to ensure that we work together to, to find every opportunity we can to ensure that the sustainable development goals are part of our discourse, are part of the way we are organising ourselves and a part of how we are setting up our educational systems. What is interesting about the Engineering Alliance is that it is based on collaboration. The only way anything operates within the Engineering Alliance is through that collaboration. We work together to develop strategies to support 
prospective members. We ensure the future focus and effectiveness of the GAPC uh, benchmark standards are done. And as I note, I hope you will have noted through the presentations that have already occurred, we do this through the idea of working with the profile and the needs and the aspirations of each of our members, enabling them to customise how they operate within the Engineering Alliance to suit their geopolitical needs and the needs of their community. We have developed and implemented strategies to support each other through challenges such as COVID, and I'll come to that in a little while. And the process we use is on the basis of peer review by three other members. So again, we harness each other's understandings to look to work together to improve quality insurance and to establish equivalence through opportunities that we have to learn from each other and to draw on each other's expertise to drive our own continuous development and improvement. So there is no sense uh, taking uh, Dr. Mandy's ideas that there is a shining light that we are moving towards. It is that we understand that this will be a continuous process of improvement, that there is no one right way, but there are many, many right ways that we need to access, we need to understand are available to us and to learn from each other regarding that. So that is an important lever that we can use, that access to each other's expertise and wisdom to ensure that what we are building to meet that 2030 agenda is going to be applicable across all of our specific issues and across our specific requirements internationally, rather than the idea that one fit size fits all, which tends to be the way engineers normally make assumptions about finding a solution rather than solutions. So again, that mindset change that we need to have is an important part of how we will meet the agenda moving forward. This is not to say that this is an easy way to do things. Within the engineering environment, it is often easier to just say, no, it's so much more efficient to do my way or that way, or to find one model of doing things. So the membership of the IEA requires continuous maintenance and nurturing and close interaction. We often find ourselves having to hold back and ensure that we're not slipping into actions derived from unintended subtle claims about our way superiority. To turn that around into ideas of how we can learn from each other and improve our ways of doing things. Of course, with 30 uh, countries, there is always misunderstandings across our language nuances. And what we have to continually do is pause in our haste to make things happen and think about what might be the unintended consequences of that haste to make things happen in terms of the impact that it might have on our future. So when we are deploying shortcut metrics, proformers, standards, and other tools, we need to recognize where they are assisting us and where they might be drawing us away from the uncertainty and energy of continuous relationship building and close interaction. That is really important because, again, and it's certainly something as an engineer I tend to always be looking for, is those performers and standards. But that capacity to stand and look and think about what its consequences are is a very important 
part of how we need to change our thinking and how we need to be more uh, emotionally intelligent in how we organize the way we do things. The benefit of this is this active engagement by all results in very, very rich outcomes that are very robust uh, when we do meet challenges. And the proof of that was very much during the COVID disruptor period and the way the IEA membership was able to respond to what was a very quick moving and enormously impactful uh, situation. Within weeks of the COVID or the magnitude of the COVID disruptor becoming evident, uh, the IEA had set up accreditation in a virtual world base camp site so that all the members could share their uh, frustrations, their difficulties, and their opportunities for asking for help. There was a Washington Accord workshop set up on the 13th of June by Singapore and Pakistan that gave comfort to a number of the other signatories that we did have ways in which we might be able to deal with this significant disruptor. So rather than feeling helpless for many, many months, it was very important for the members to find that they really did have a way they could start to work together and to find ways through that would enable them to support their students, in particular their students, and ensure that their lives were not totally destroyed for however long this disruptor was going to continue. It was significant in engineering education because we were very much an educational system based on the classroom. So to suddenly find that virtual education needed to become a very important part of the way we educated and to do that in the near future and to do that without compromising quality was a very big ask. So over the period of COVID, there was symposium, conferences, discussion groups, seminars, meetings and collaboration between the members that enabled the members to work together to create a shared and better future that in the future will see us able to handle things like the COVID, COVID disruptor in a far more robust manner. The second lever, and we have already heard much about this, but it is a foundational aspect of our capacity to shift discussion to meet the imperatives uh, that our global community believes are important, and that is our graduate attributes and professional competency standards. Uh, Professor Bullant was the chair of the two-year process of reviewing the, uh, the GAPC. And as you can see from the, the very small uh, extract I have taken from that document, it does look at the professional engineer, the engineering technologist and the technician, recognizing how each of those members of the engineering team will participate in their role within creating technologies that meet the needs of our community and that ensure that the, uh, the health, welfare and safety also of our natural world is included in our discussions. As Dr. Mandy has mentioned, all signatories members have agreed that by 2024, they will have a roadmap for implementation across their jurisdiction. And in line with our aspirations for our profession and the communities we serve, we are working together to develop firm deadlines that minimize the time to interrupt for implementation. 
So looking back at all of the forums that we used for COVID, we are now able to use many of those same strategies to assist us to support our members to work through how they might continue to uh, minimise the time to implementation. Having examples such as what IET is doing is imperative to support us in our work. The other aspect of the uh, graduate attributes that perhaps is less well known is the, uh, the added benefit that we now have that there are translations available to the GAPC. And this will support our members to be able to translate the GAPC into their own uh, scenarios noting that the official language will remain English, but these translations will assist the work of the IEA members, although they won't be the basis for IEA decisions. That said, being able to see the GAPC in the language of the, uh, of the um, member will be an important step forward for all of us. The lever three we have is accreditation of engineering education. And it was noted that one of the concerns that academics have is that they cannot move because of the requirements of uh, accreditation bodies. So to that end, what we are able to do within the International Engineering Alliance is to role model the opportunities to ask how can the concept and approach of sustainable development be implemented in engineering education accreditation and to find ways to do that. As has been noted earlier, the imperative for change is here now. The history of engineering activity is one that although it has given great benefits to some areas of the world, has left a great negativity in other parts of the world. And it is this thinking that needs to change. We can no longer as engineers just focus on the fact that once we've created a problem, then we are going to set ourselves up as the saviors of the world regarding that problem. We cannot, for example, just rely on the fact that we want to be seen as the saviors of the plastic revolution. We can no longer use up the resources of the world to control the ever emerging negatives that arise from our original actions. We will need in the future to look at the sustainable development goals and think about how they will all work together as we move forward. So when we ask questions like engineering has a large role to play, we need to be very careful that we are not looking and celebrating the emergence of new technologies such as quantum computing without considering upfront and before it is too embedded, what are all of the impacts on all of the sustainability development goal touch points that we were talking about earlier? And we need to have an education system that creates opportunities for the next generation of engineers to give equal weighting to rather than having those sustainable development goals as perhaps the add-on discussion uh, regarding how we move forward. As one example of this, I chair a concrete uh, research centre. And so one of the issues that we talk about in terms of trying to move towards uh, carbon neutral concrete is the fact that one of the unintended consequences of moving, say, to sustainable energy is the amount of concrete it will need, for example, for the bases of wind, wind uh, power. 
So as engineers, are we actually thinking about the holistic system within which our activities are occurring rather than just looking at uh, siloed activities and thinking we have done well because we have an answer to the silo without thinking about all of those other unintended consequences. So one of the questions for us to consider is in wind power going to actually increase the carbon footprint of concrete in Australia. Achieving the sustainable development goals then will require very different engineering capable capability to that which has underpinned the past. It will require a metamorphosis in our thinking, a transformed engineering practice, and innovative engineering educational models. The metamorphosis means shifts in our education discourse, and we have been hearing much about that. And I was very taken by Dr. Uh, Mandy's uh, presentation. Uh, I'm taking a different lens on that, but we are very aligned in the way we are thinking through these issues. That we, and for me, we need to really understand that when we talk about shifts in engineering education discourse, we are not just talking about the students. All of these shifts need to be occurring among the academic staff as well. Academic staff need to understand how we move from teaching to learning, from certainty to chaos, how to engage with contested truth, and how to understand moving from knowledge silos to interdisciplinarity. As an academic, it is a journey I was on for many years before, uh, before the end of my academic career, but it can be an exciting place to be as well as a terrifying place to be as an academic. The tool that the International Engineering Alliance is using at the moment is future-focused engineering education. And at this point in time, outcomes-based education provides the opportunity for a very uh, flexible framework for engineering education curriculum that allows the exploration of different ways of, of embedding all of those changes that we need in engineering education to be reflected in the classroom. The role of the faculty adapts to instructor, to trainer, facilitator, and or mentor based on outcomes targeted. And this enables a lot more opportunities for the sustainability discussions, for the living with different uh, answers, for being able to deal with chaos, to be brought in and work through with the academics and the students working together. It also, on the other hand, needs to be far more disciplined to assume that we are able to ensure that the students are in this more flexible model that doesn't just tick the box on certain knowledge being imparted requires a systems style thinking about engineering education. In Australia, we had the advantage of having uh, Dr. Lincoln Wood as the uh, registrar of our accreditation. And as a aeronautical engineer, he was able to bring his skills in that area to think about how we might conceptualize a systems model of engineering education where we could use the tools that we understand as engineers to support us to develop a robust curriculum model that will ensure that we can tick off all of the graduate attributes and ensure that we have followed and incorporated them all into our curriculum. 
this means that academics will probably need to move to working in teams themselves. So it won't just be academics learning to work in, or students working in teams, but also academics understanding the power that that can bring to their own experiences of pulling together a curriculum. And then from the International Engineering Alliance, we are having to work through as a community how we then take this more complex engineering curriculum and work through how we do quality assurance of the jurisdictional accreditation entities that are accrediting these complex curriculums. So it is almost a third order um, activity, but it is imperative if we are going to be able to shift our expectations of uh, meeting the 2030 agenda for sustainable development with different thinking, with different ways of working, and yet still maintain the integrity and our trust in the curriculums that uh, will generate the graduates who will look after the health, welfare, and safety of our communities. So a very complex space that requires all of our thinking to ensure that we maintain the balance between them all. And the fourth lever that we have in the Engineering Alliance is our relationships and our training courses that we develop together and with other organisations, our participation in the Wolfio Academy and many others that we have been able to uh, work together with. We are also working with uh, FIAP, we are working with NA, we are building relationships to ensure that we have a global response to the challenges that we face. So in conclusion, the International Engineering Alliance is establishing a global engineering education benchmark standard that drives sustainability. It's for facilitating engineering mobility, creating network, sharing ideas. It is building engineering capacity for sustainable development through leveraging those levers. But whether those levers can accelerate the 2020-30 agenda is really in the hands of all of us here. It only will make a difference if we all participate. Thank you. G.H., Josh Agricola University and Chair of the Board of the DMT, Leah Geont, Bordon, GmbH and Bohorn, Germany. Before the presentation, I would like to present briefly about Professor Jorgen Greshman, professional experience and career development of Professor Dr. Jorgen Greshman is President of the TH George Agricola University and Chairman of the Board of DMT Leager on Beton GmbH and Bohon Germany from 2006 to 2022. It is also member of the management board of Red Boton GmbH from 2001 to 2006. Various management and leadership position in Red Coal Mining Company and SN Germany from 1919 to 2001. University activity of Professor Dr. Jorgen Arm, adjunct professor at RWTH, Aachen University, Germany, Faculty of Mining, Metallurgy and Geoscience, 6 2005, from 1994 to 1999. Have a postdoctoral study at RWTH Ahan, Faculty of Mining, Metallurgy and Geoscience, Degree, Pre-Vitexing, 
equivalent to associate professor for the subject economic for engineer. From 1986 to 1989, dissertation at the George August University, Gottingen, at the share of cooperate management, Department of Economic Degree, Dr. Apo, equivalent to PhD. From 1918 to 1986, business and management study at the University and Ahan, Bohon, Dortmund, Dickery, Diploma, Cutman, equivalent to NBA. Other topics and membership of the Professor Dr. Jorgen are both member of the Chat Program Technique Licentiate for Final DVD. DVT is the governing body of more than 25 engineering associations in Germany, member of the Education and Engineering Committee, and the President's Advisory Board of the World Federation of Engineering Organization, WFEO, honorary members of the Engineering Association of Ukurai, Montreal Budio, Ukurai. Member of the International Advisory Board of the War Engineering Council 2022 in Prague, Czech Republic. Presidents of the Global Society of Mining Professor 2018-2019, Delft, Netherlands. First Distinguished Fellow of the War Federation of Engineering Organization, WFEO. Now, may I invite Professor Jochen Kreschmann to deliver your keynote presentation. Professor, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the kind um, introduction. I'm hoping that everybody can understand me well. Um, well, obviously I think that our event has been hacked by somebody from outside. Of course, I have absolutely zero tolerance for this, but uh, a few years ago, I went to London on a WFEO Congress and in the city of London, I bought a t-shirt that I like very much and it says, keep calm, I'm an engineer. So, well, engineers are used to deal with chaos. So, well, that's keep calm and solve the problem and have a good event. It's a great event and I'm happy that I can contribute to this event. So thank you very much for the organizers. Thank you very much for Myanmar. Engineering Council. Yeah, look here. So somebody is already trying to be an artist again and doing paintings, but it doesn't matter for me because I don't need the PowerPoints. I will distribute all the PowerPoint slides for all the participants and I will ask the organizers to distribute them after my presentation so everything will be fine and I can just talk and you can just listen and it's okay. So, well, my, the basis of my presentation are more than 15 years of teaching experiences in foreign countries, especially in Asia, and I've been to Myanmar many times, and I give lectures at YU, YTU, MTU, MUT, and others, and other um, universities. And so this model that I'm presenting is based on my personal experiences. So let's go back to the classroom the real classroom not the virtual classroom and um yeah and i would like love to share my experience there so we already have heard in the great presentations um in the morning that education is a key precondition for individual wealth and uh, economic prosperity and uh, the sustainable development goals and yeah basically we all agree that knowledge is the basis for a better world so but if you see the data we can find out that 90 percent 90 percent of all scientists who has who have ever lived 90 percent are living today living today so based on this fact the world must be in a very good condition but it is not in a very good condition unfortunately but this leads us to the well experience that quantity in science does not necessarily mean quality. It's a difference, and I, that's why it's very, very important. All the all the the presentations Elizabeth Taylor and and Mandy Liu and all the others mentioned. So we need to gain more quality in our uh, education, and we need to change. 
Um, yeah. And uh, well, the crucial question is how can we activate the potential of our students? So the our students will be the responsible persons for a better world in the future. So how can we activate their potential? How can we, the older generation, transfer our knowledge effectively that the younger, the next generation will do better, that they will reach more progress, that will reach the sustainable development goals, and so on and so on. What does that mean in, uh, in practice? So now there's another, um, just uh, another presentation shown there. That's not mine, but okay, it doesn't matter. It really, it doesn't matter so much. So, uh, Dear Professor, uh, Professor, yeah. please. Uh, yeah, Professor, can I, uh, may, can uh, I show may, my slides again? Is it possible? Uh, may I disrupt your presentation? Uh, may I request your disable? Uh, yeah, you, yeah, you, you can try to show it. You can try to show it. It's okay. Is it okay? Can yes. you show the slides? May I, and may, click, I and click may, may I try to request? Any, Yes. Yep. May I request? May I request you to make the disable, disable anonymation, anonymation. I cannot. Um, wait. Um, so, okay. So if if you can show the slides, maybe that works better. I've sent the slides to you. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, maybe, we can, maybe you we can, can show them and it's better and then we, we will not be disturbed by somebody else. So yes. maybe, maybe maybe we can try it that way. Yes, Professor, we can share you your presentation slide. Yeah, okay. Then 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 go to slide number six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we can comment your presentation, please. Oh, no, this is a different presentation. This is not mine. This is the um, Professor Ahrens who will give a lecture in the afternoon. Yeah, sorry. No problem. Uh, I can share you, Professor, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do it. Uh, this one, Professor. Yeah, yeah, this one. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I can so now and then I and go to slide number six. Slide number six. Okay. And then I will tell you when you have to uh, go okay. to the next slide. So this number six. Yeah. So so we start this. We start with this. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Is, yeah. Yeah. It's everything's fine. Keep calm. We are engineers. So fundamental assumption for. Uh, effective knowledge transfer. So what is the, the basis for the success of communication, the basis for teaching? The success depends on the receiver. So my success, if you understand me well, uh, depends on you, not on, next slide. N next slide, please. Somebody has to, yeah, okay. Uh, it's. The success does not depend on the sender, or as uh, Elizabeth Taylor said, it does not depend on the sage on the stage. I love this word. On the this is the sage on the stage, the professor. No, uh, so the students must understand the topics, not the professor. The professor already know the uh, his presentations. So let's go to the next slide. Yeah. As uh, especially uh, His Excellency Charlie Tan has mentioned that engineering disciplines are applied sciences, and Jose Fiera meant it too. So all engineering disciplines have an impact on the society and its members. Everything we are doing, and almost every day and all uh, every minute, if we talk about the internet, the artificial intelligence, uh, the smartphones development, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it everything has an impact. Uh, and what we are doing as engineers leads to results that can change parts of the world forever. And this is what we call progress, no? like the internet of things we are developing at the moment. So uh, the students and young researchers, 
staff members and others should be able to apply their knowledge in a responsible way to find the best solution. And it's impossible, the responsible way. We talked about soft skills before. It's very important. We talked about ethics of engineers. And therefore, the universities should empower them to create a better and more sustainable world. Yeah, Charlie Tan has highlighted this in the beginning. And I want to thank him very much for his comment. So next slide, please. Next, next, please. Yeah, what means empowerment teaching? And the main aim is to empower the learner, the learner to meet the challenges of the future. And basically, this is the same aim that Yashin mentioned, Elizabeth Taylor mentioned, Mandy Leo mentioned, Marlene Kanga mentioned, all the others mentioned. So this is the main topic in the future for everybody empower the learner to, so our education must be learner-centered, must be multi-sexual and interactive, and we have to teach the students teamwork. And uh, Marlene Kanga already mentioned the Hackathon, which is a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, measure to do. So we have to enable the learner to develop their own skills, their own knowledge and the attitude and the ethics to work as an engineer and apply the theory they learn in the practice and everything is based on part participatory training methods. We already heard that we are beginning of a new era of education, and I'm happy that I can contribute a little bit. Jose Vieira mentioned this. Um, okay, how can we realize empowerment teaching? And for this, and from my experiences, I have developed a seven phases model. Please the next, show the next slide. Yeah. So uh, I have developed this model, especially to raise the effectiveness of international knowledge transfer. It's not so easy if you come as a German to Myanmar for the first time to go to the classroom and to teach successfully Myanmar students. It's not easy, but if you gain experiences, you can develop a, a model. And now today for me, it's easy, but 15 years ago, it was not so easy. So this is the model, the 7S model with the startup phase, the warming up phase, the learning and experiencing phase, the practical phase, and the final phase is wellness phase, exam and final. So we go, please, I will just give a brief overview, overview of these phases and then we show the next slide, please. Next, next slide, please. Okay. So it's not easy if you do an international transfer, you come to Thailand or Myanmar for the first time, you know nobody and how, how should you start? How should you start successfully? So this is the startup phase. So give an introduction of yourself, who you are, then you memorize the names. Sometimes the names are not so easy to learn, especially in Thailand, they're very long names. And then you have to set the rules for everybody. So no phones, no internet in the classroom, etc. Uh, and uh, of course, you have to say, and I think Marlin mentioned it before, the classroom language is English. So people should not speak Thai in the classroom or or Myanmar, or wherever you are, or Spanish, or Portuguese, or German, whatever. Everybody speaks in the same language. This is uh, very important, especially in mixed classes where you have 20 students from 15 different countries. And of course, at the beginning, you can take a photo for the other class, so everybody's happy with this. Next, uh, next slide, please. So here in the startup phase in the classroom, it's important that the teacher leads the process, his main aim is to activate the potential of the students from the beginning. So the teacher is responsible to create a learning environment that the students are encouraged to do their best. That's, uh, yeah, and next slide, please. That's the first aim the teacher has to read. So how can he do it? He should ask the participants to introduce themselves, to share the experiences and expectations why is it important? Uh, the aim is here to overcome the learner's hesitancy to speak. Uh, no, no, 
not in every country people are used to speak in English. So, so they just, if you start, what's your name? Where do you come from? So they really, they got the first step to empowerment to make the learners talk. And of course, you, everybody gets to know each other. It's the first team building me measure, especially in international classes. And you create a friendly and cooperative uh, atmosphere. And this helps to overcome the cultural barriers from the beginning. Uh, the next phase is, next slide, please. The warm-up phase. Why is this important? You know, if a 50 or 60 year old German comes to Myanmar and talks with 20 years old Myanmar students, so of course, there's a big, huge distance and nobody knows uh, from each other. So the aim is here to break the ice between the lecturer and the students. So it's good if the classes are not too big to change the seating positions, maybe here in the like a round table seating. And you explain the vision and the big picture of the lecture. Why are you here? What's your aim? How are we working together? So you explain how students can contribute actively. It's important to start an emotional bond based on trust and sympathy. I will, I will explain it in the next slide why this is important. And uh, of course, here you have to assess the cultural barriers uh, that they have and yeah, try to overcome these barriers. So uh next slide so it's always always good in the, in the beginning you let the students talk it does not matter uh what exactly they say and how good they are in english but just let them talk about their motivation about their dreams about their future why they are here and so on uh talking is the most important thing uh even if the english is not so good like my english is not perfect <laughs> either so next next one please yeah, why is warming up important? Uh, warming up is important because communication has a social dimension. Uh, communication is a result of an interactive behavior between a lecturer and the learners. And it's based on, uh, on the different cultures they have, on the different um, motivation, the different experiences, and so on. And uh, this social dimension, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, is very important because we have two levels of teaching. The one level is the content of teaching. It's the, the information that you give from the professor or the lecturer or the teacher to the students. You talk about things, about objects, about projects, about and so on, appointments. But on the same way, the relationship is important. The way people speak to each other, it's important that uh, the sympathy is important, emotions, expectations, fears, and so on. And you have to address this. Of course, this isn't cannot be part of the curricula. No, no fear or so. It's not part of a curricula or a Sydney Accord or so. But it's very important that it's addressed here from the uh, that the professors know it and they address this. Yeah, the emotional feelings. So professors. So when I was a student, I had a professor I absolutely did not like. Absolutely. So it was very hard for me to learn his topic. Very hard. Much much harder than uh, from a professor I like very much. So he motivated me to learn. I was a good student um, with this professor and a bad student um, with the other professor. So, c'est la vie. Uh, so next slide, please. Yeah, what is the role as of the professor, the lecturer as a team leader in the class? So the main role is to secure that the students are able to learn effectively. I will show this later. Uh, the lecturer's uh, so emotional and social intelligence is crucial, and the lecturer should promote positive thinking and avoid negative comments. Negative. Sometimes in Germany we make too many negative comments. Uh, of course, in, in 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 Asia this creates the loose face problem on and other problems. So think positive. Think positive. Motivate the students. Listen to them. Be the best listener in the class, and. Uh, Thank the students for their contributions, even if they are small contributions, this will improve the relationship between the lecturer and the class. And yeah, make the students feel optimistic about their abilities to learn, make them feel optimistic that they can enhance their creativity and decision making skills. Uh, next, next slide, please. Yeah, now we come to the learning phase and now we come back to the curricular things. 
uh, of course, sometimes the students are unknown, uh, don't know the teaching methods that you that you use. So you have to explain them why you are using this kind of teaching, while you while you want that the students are more active. Look at this uh, photo. Maybe they they did not have learned this this methods before in the in school or in the early early parts of their study programs. So plan distributed learning in intervals, give enough time for discussions and repetitions, give students opportunities to make own experiences. We have already heard before that this is very, very interesting, that they be creative, they, they can guess, they can try, they can spe speculate, they can make mistakes because mix, mix, mistakes offer opportunities to increase competences, to do better. And of course, uh, always encourage the students to actively use English language. Next, next please. Yeah. So what is the basis of the educational approach? I will describe in the next slides. First, you have a lecturing part. I will show it as an, uh, with an example later. And then you allow the students to learn by their own experiences, the empowerment teaching, to activate the students. Um, Yashin mentioned the importance of this topic before. And of course, as a professor, you provide supervision if needed. In other words, next slides, please. Well, you tell the students how to swim. That's so here, this, in theory. And then you throw the students into the water and watch them swimming. Sure. And if they need help, provide supervision if needed. Uh, then you, of course, you help them. It's clear. Uh, uh, I will explain it in detail what it means later. So this is just, uh, yeah, just an introduction for this. Next, next way, please. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So the practical phase. Why is a practical phase in study programs so important? Because uh, psychologists found out that people remember about ten percent of what they read, twenty percent of what they hear, thirty percent of what they see. 50% of what they see and hear. So you, if I'm lucky, you understand 50% of what I'm talking to you, if I'm lucky. 80% of what they say are right, but 90%, 90% what they compile and execute themselves. So, and that's why your practical phases, especially in engineering are so important, you know, so important. How do we do the practical training? Next slide, please. Yeah, the practical training. The aim is the realization of self-effectiveness and competence to better. So here the lecturer has to be a motivator and a mentor to foster acting competence, acting competence of the students, the learners. So he should encourage teamwork in a diverse environment and learning with partners. Yeah. Uh, so learning with different partners, that's important. Professor Oskula has already mentioned before. And uh, let the students contribute, ask questions, share experiences, observations, and so on. Reflect, discuss with the students and discuss uh, with people in practice and let the students test themselves. Uh, yeah, and uh, that's... To sum up, this is what Malin Kanga called project-based learning. Yeah, and of course, a hackathon is a great option to do so. A great option to do so. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a professor in mining engineering. And uh, yeah, and so my, uh, my example is here planning from a seminar the, um, in, in mining. So just, just to show you how to do it. So uh, the preparatory courses, so the theoretical part uh, here, you can see on that side. So we teach them surface and underground mining equipment, surface mining design, underground mining design, mine planning, feasibility studies, in theory, mine ventilation and mineral deposits, mine modeling and, and uh, similar topics. So this is, this is the theoretical basis. Uh, of the um, empowerment teaching. Uh, and then how do we do the, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, how we, uh, so what, 
what do we do to activate the students? What is the throw them into the water and watch them swimming? Yeah, after the theoretical part, the students in the seminar they get some basic data, some mining mining uh, data like drilling data, topography of a of a of a mining region, surface infrastructure, what is available, and uh, if there's a train or cars or is there a sea or ocean or whatever. Uh, so they get some basic data, and based on that basic data, we build student tier teams of five students, and they have they, they have some weeks, they have eight weeks of self-organized work, swimming, self-organized work, and of course we are uh, providing them. The professor provides supervision, and what is the aim? The aim is, of course, it's a good way to implement creativity in the curriculum. That's what we talked about before. So creativity and critical thinking and um, of course uh, teamwork and because at the end the group must come up with result uh, outcome and this outcome is a feasibility study how to develop a new mind in place and this uh, based on that data so this is a complex topic and um, in the end uh, the students have to, of course, here they have they have to be nicely dressed and explain the results like a consultant in front of the other students. And there are many Q's and A's. And so the student learned the presentation techniques as well. Yeah. And when they did, when the students did this successfully, they might think of participating in a hackathon like um, Merlin Kanga explained. So this is basically uh, uh, how we do that empowerment teaching in the classroom. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, well, I talked about social uh, social bonding and the emotional part of the of uh, of uh, of teaching, and this is of course not part in of the curricula, but it's 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 very useful to plant distraction that uh, are helpful for the learning progress, especially if you go, go and do some excursions with the students like here, that excursion in Myanmar. So it really overcomes cultural barriers between foreign lecturers and students. So in, in Germany and other countries, students like to go to a football match, for instance, uh, and it's just to make friendship and to, to yeah, to uh, increase and improve the teamwork. And of course, if you have students from many different countries, you can uh, create an international students uh, network. Next, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the exam is clear. We have to let the students apply their knowledge, apply the show the feasibility study. Yeah, of course, no, not just the theoretical knowledge and and uh, let the students be successful, create a positive atmosphere. And um, in Germany, it's a must, and you should never forget that the students evaluate you. So we have a ranking, which professor is the best and which professor is not the best. So, and, and every, uh, every, um, every class is evaluated by the students. I think it's fair. If the students evaluate, uh, it judges the, the the students, the students can evaluate the professor too. That's a fair system. So next, uh, please. Next slide. Yeah, and of course, in the final phase at the end, everybody's doing it, encourages students to be proud of themselves and create an emotional bond and take photos and, and so on. Yeah, this is, this is, it's always fun. Next slide, please. So we come to the new roles of the professor. We have heard from uh, Dr. Mandy Leo and, and Elizabeth Taylor, faculty members must change. Yeah, that's true. They must change. It's a necessity. They have new and more roles in the future. And I explained their roles. They have to inspire the students or create first, let's begin with a vision. They have to tell the students a vision, why, why they... Why, uh, why it's necessary that they become good engineers? What are their role in the future? Why are they working for a better world? That's the vision to inspire the students to work hard because engineering is still not an easy study program. And they have to be a mentor and motivate the students and be a coach. If they, if they cannot swim, they have to help them. Uh, it's clear. Uh, the coach, and the, of course, there are still are teachers, especially in the theoretical part. You should never forget this. 
uh, and um, and of course he has to to inspire to 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 create a teamwork atmosphere and to lead by example. To lead by example, it's, it's clear that uh, that he he is behaving the same as the student. So he is working in the team. He's part of the team. He's listening and he's leading the team. Yeah, that's that are the the the, the new roles of the professor of the future um, that we we are yeah hope to realize in 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 our university in Bochum. But at, at the end of my presentation, I will I will I have developed a little a very easy formula for students. Please next slide. It's called my empowerment formula. My empowerment formula very easy. I'm not so good in mathematics, but okay. So uh, the empowerment formula means for the students meet. I, the first A is, I am a valuable person. I'm not a number. I'm a lovely, I'm nice, I'm competent. I'm an individual, I have strengths and weaknesses, that's clear, but I'm someone special, I'm a human. A uh, plus two H, it's, I have knowledge, I have aims, I have competencies. So they must know, that's that's the basis for the empowerment, the students uh, are confident. And I have friends, I have a team at the end of a team who will help me, who people who like me. So I'm not alone in the university. I have friends. And at, the result is equals I can apply my knowledge. I can take action. I can solve problems. I can meeting challenges. I can understand, undertake responsibility. And finally, at the end of the study program, I can create a better world. And that's what it's all about. That's what Jose Fiera said at the beginning. That's why we are doing this. So next slide, please. Uh, yeah, I would like to, to finish my presentation with the official slogan of COP27 in Egypt. So let's work together for implementation. Let's work together to realize the sustainable development goals, to realize a better future for the future generation. Uh, as uh, His Excellency Charlie Tan has already mentioned at the beginning. So last slide. And then the last slide, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Education changes the world for good. I'm totally convinced. Thank you for your interest. And uh, it was great to participate in this, in this conference. And yeah, uh, so once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Jürgen Kreschmann for your interesting and informative presentation. Now, we would like to move next agenda, rapid session. I would like to wrap up all the keynote presentation in this section. There are six keynote presentation in this section. Most of the keynote presenter, speaker present mainly focus on engineering education for sustainable development. In this section, the first keynote speaker is Dr. Malinkanga. First thing, Professor introduced uh, WFEO history, priority for engineering education in Informing of Engineering Education for Sustainable Development Group. Secondly, she explained the project based learning in engineering education core hackathon that is in line with the graduate attributes and professional competence in sustainable development. She also highlighted the challenge and path in judging criteria of hackathon project. She also point out the winners of War Engineering Day hackathon and their respective projects. The second keynote speaker is Professor Ari Bulin Ogular. In the presentation, he discussed about the role and purpose of GAPC. He also presented the principle and tools for adaptation. He discussed the UN Sustainable Development Goal and how they can be aligned with the engineering education, focusing on the goal that are more closely related to this field. His discussion mainly focused on the teaching of Gaston Project goals. The third keynote speaker is Dr. Mandy Liu. Firstly, Dr. Mandy Liu explained briefly about the Sydney Accord. And then she explained the sustainability curriculum and she shared the IET roadmap on the implementation of the new GABC. 
sustainability in particular way transform the mind of students and can give a deeper sense of real war and life. The fourth keynote speaker is Emeritus Professor Alice Bakhtila. She focused on what level the International Engineering Alliance has to assist us to celebrate accelerated their 2030 agenda. She focused more in the area of accreditation of engineering education. She also ex explained working process of IEA, International Engineering Alliance. The fifth keynote speaker is Professor Yashin Brich Mohan. He discussed about accreditation, pedagogical practice, ongoing work, and call for shame. He also highlighted reclassification of competency for the country need. The last keynote speaker of this section is Professor Jorgen Kretschmann. In his presentation, he discussed about seven feet model of empowerment teaching for successful international knowledge transfer in engineering. He also explained about new role of professor for future. Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, now we will continue the next agenda. The next agenda is question and answer section. We will start it and mediate by master of ceremony. I hand over flow to Dr. Tatawin. Dr. Tatawin, please. Thank you, Dr. Shrewin Mao'i and distinguished speakers for your keynote presentation. It's time for questions and answer. We have questions in the chat box. Uh, the first question is for Professor Elizabeth Taylor. Pro Professor Elizabeth Taylor, please. Are you online, Professor? Okay, uh, the questions will be sent directly to the professor via email. Thank you. And for uh, Professor Dr. Jagan Crashman, uh, we have a question for you. Okay. The, the, the question is During your talk, you have said, uh, don't forget the student to ev evaluate the teacher in exam phase. At our university, we currently call a student evaluation in the final class. We would appreciate it if you could share your approach to incorporating student feedback during the exam phase to evaluate the lectures effectively. Yeah, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. So we have a special form um of uh, how to, how to the how to evaluate uh, the course so we don't we don't we do not exactly evaluate the professor we evaluate the quality of the course no, that's clear so um it's not a personal evaluation but of course if you if a professor gives many different courses and uh, and uh, and every course gets an evaluation um grade one one is the best in germany then you can assume that it's a great professor but if he has an average of four four is um, not good in germany you can you, you need you so you can see that he has a he needs some personal development so and he has to talk to me and I, and, and I discuss with the professor how can he improve his teaching skills but so what i can do if i could um i could send uh, an evaluation form i don't know to to the organizers maybe maybe to you and then you can see if you can use it in myanmar or you can modify it or you can do whatever you want but it's it's in germany by law it's by law that in uh, every every uh, course has to be evaluated and every 
and, and we are doing this by evaluating 25% of the professors every semester. So uh, every two years, all the professors are evaluated. Thank you for Thank your you. informative answer, Professor. There is another question for you. The question is, in order to empower learners to meet the challenges of the future, you have presented a seven-phase model of empowerment teaching. However, we may encounter limitations in faculty staff, infrastructure facility, and other resources, which could result in larger class sizes, exceeding the standard limit, potentially exceeding 50 students. In such cases, would the face model you discuss still be applicable? If not, what alternative strategy should we adopt to implement empowerment teaching effectively? Uh, professor, uh, we cannot hear your voice. Okay, so yeah, that's that's a very very good question. It's clear because uh, if you want to do this uh, effectively in power teaching, you need resources. That's clear. So in our university, uh, in the, in the, in a seminar, we don't have more than twenty five students. So here, like in this mining class, then we can build five groups, five groups with five. Uh, uh, five uh, students per group. So maybe you can do it with 30 or 35 students too, or 40. But but if it's if you have really big classes, uh, it's not possible. So that's why we we have the, the strategy that we teach the theoretical part in uh, maybe in bigger groups, and then we split for the practical parts uh, the, these bigger groups into smaller groups. Otherwise, it would not be possible. But it's true, you need resources to do this. Thank you, Professor, for your insight. Thank you, Professor. Now the question is for Professor Elizabeth Taylor. Professor Elizabeth Taylor, the question is, it is not so much an issue for developed countries. To gradually accelerate the 2030 agenda or the sustainable development, but for developing countries, especially least developed countries, would face a gigantic tax to cash up. May I know whether IEA would think of NDC centric initiative to help them cash up faster with their first mover, brothers and sisters. Thank you very much. That is a very interesting question. It, uh, from the point of view of the way that the development has happened over many years, it has meant that the less developed countries or least developed countries have had little opportunity to have the resources to uh, to move things forward. But in my experience within the International Engineering Alliance, I have found that many of these least developed countries are far more progressive in their thinking about how to incorporate sustainability into their thinking than many developed countries are because the developed countries haven't had to think about it very much. And have tended to just not understand what the consequences are of, of the, uh, the issues. So perhaps it's not so much an issue of one being ahead of the other so much as these, uh, for example, I have been to Bangladesh a couple of times and I have learned so much about what is possible to do in engineering education around sustainability and thinking about how that might be incorporated into the curriculum that I have taken back to Australia. So if we have the conversations, we're more likely to find that there is much learning that we can get 
Uh, and of course, that learning should support the uh, the less developed countries in that sense, or least developed countries to have opportunities. I mean, I, I would absolutely support anything we can do in the Engineering Education Alliance to facilitate what they can bring to the table. Thank you, Professor, for your insightful answer. We have questions for Professor Yashin Brishmohan. Professor, please. Yes, the thank first, you. The first question is, what are the main differences and similarities between international and national accreditation in the context of engineering education? How do they impact educational standards and practice? Okay, so so I think firstly, um, uh, the the one practice is, uh, is to be a signatory of the International Engineering Alliance, and that's an international standard. However, I think what is important to note is that sometimes it's important to also note local context requirements, and when uh, when you develop your, your local standard, is yes, it's good to consider the international standards, which could be uh, one of them or the one that we aspire. Uh, would be the mobility uh, standards and the education standards of the IEA. But it is also possible that uh, even within a country, you may have different states. Uh, and to have mobility within your country, you have to consider local regulation and policy. And another important, a very, very important aspect is that even when you adopt international systems of education, um, it's not just about the tradition requirements, but but how and how to introduce pedagogical practices. And for that, it is more important for them to be a national consensus in terms of what pedagogical practices suits that nation and not just to adopt any international standard based on that. Um, I just thought I'd also just mention this point is that we also have a lot of research in this area and, and research has really grown in this area in the last 20 years, more specifically in the last five. And I think it's important to look at that and see sometimes the consequences of using international standards, um, because it can have unintended consequences if you just adopt them as this. Thank you. Uh, there is another question for you. How can engineering institutions and educators collaborate with accredited bodies to advocate for and implement the proposed changes? I, I, I think it is, it is firstly important, uh, there is a process that's outlined by the IEA in India, but, but in terms of any accreditation body, firstly, there has to be consensus within the different regulatory bodies within a country. And different countries are constituted differently. Uh, so some you have higher education systems that regulate, in some countries you have independent uh, um, engineering bodies that assist with regulation. I think the first part in this process is to is to agree in terms of what your standard would be, uh, what are you going to uh, going to align to, and how are the institutions going to work together to play the different roles of accreditation? And there must be independence in the system, uh, and that independence in the system uh, gives uh, an aspect of quality to that. And I, and 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 I think the bodies must come together and agree, partner with each other, and and agree on the way forward. Thank you, Professor Yash. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, our distinguished speakers, for your time and kind contribution to our conference. Plenary presentation session will be hosted by co MC Ms. Tazente. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Dr. Derwin. Now, we will continue the next agenda, keynote presentation by our distinguished speaker. The session will be hosted by Dr. Miniakai. Before I hand over to Dr. Miniakai, I would like to remind all the participants that if you have any questions, you can post the questions in the chat box. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Miniakai to hold the session. Dr. Miniakai, please. The floor is yours. 
thank you, Dr. Tais and Ted, for inviting me. Wishing, wishing all ladies and gentlemen to be have a good day. I will be as a host for the days of the International Conference on Engineering Education Accreditation, ICC, ICEEA 2023 in Myanmar. May I introduce myself? My name is Dr. Mimia Kai, Professor and Head of Departmental Chemical Engineering, West Yangkung Technological University, Myanmar. It's my pleasure to be as a host of this session. In accordance with the agenda, before I'm going to invite the engineer Tan San Chuan, Emeritus President of the Institutions of Engineers, Singapore, Managing Director of Tan Busu Asia Consulting Private Limited, I would like to read about the short profile of the engineer Tan. Engineer Tan San Chuan holds a Bachelor's of Engineering, specialized in civil engineering in 1983, and a Master of Science, specialized in building science in 1991, from the National University of Singapore. He is a professional engineer and children engineer, especially in environment and water register in Singapore. GHC accountability verifier, GRI certified sustainability professional and a senior practicing management consultant, sustainability certified by SPACC. His professional experience covers sustainability, environmental engineering, and program management in the sectors of sustainability, climate change, environmental water and wastewater, energies and power, built environments, chemical and petrochemical, wine and gas, and other infrastructure projects in Asia Pacific regions. Engineer tends holds a varied position in the early parts of his career and rose to a rank of the Assistant General Manager in General Engineering Limited. In 2010, he was appointed as a director of CH2M, who is responsible for the operations and development of the water and environmental services business in the Asia Pacific region. In 2015, he joined the Rambo and from Asia Pacific as a regional managing director, leading the development and implementations of the company strategies across track office in the Asia Pacific. Presently, he served as a managing director of Tambutsu Asia Consulting Private Limited, a leading sustainability consultancy company in Asia and Singapore Accreditation Council, satisfying validation and verification body focused on the developments and implementations of the United Nations, such as sustainability development goal. Engineer 10 is the Emeritus President of the institution of Engineers Singapore, where he served as a president from 2006 to 2008. He also served as a president of the Federation of Engineering Institutions of Asia and the Pacific from 2007 till 2011. He is the chairman of the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Engineering Accounting Committee and also a member of the International Engineering Alliance governing both from 2015 to 2019. Presently, he served as an executive vice president of World Federation of Engineering Organization and chairman of the Charter Engineering Board Singapore. This is a short profile of the Engineer 10. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our speaker, Engineer 10, to deliver the keynote presentation now. Engineer 10, please. All right, so uh, thanks for the long introductions. Um, I, I'm going to share a different uh, perspective uh, on the... Sir, uh, let me share your presentation slide instead of your because or technical error, please. Uh, okay, I can share that, no problem. Uh, yeah, we can share you, Professor. Please. Okay. Can you see?
Yes, you can see. Okay, so let me let me uh, uh, go through um, some of the uh, uh, driver for driving the engineering education for sustainable developments. So, um, looking at the global issue and the regional issue on climate change, I think this is something uh, you all are quite familiar with. Um, and this is the risk, uh, global risk reports uh, last year. Uh, we're looking at the short term. If you see one of the first uh, concern on the risk aspect is the cost of living crisis. Uh, if, if you can feel the last two years, uh, the cost of living uh, globally has been rising. And uh, the second concern in the near term is the natural disaster, extreme weather. It's just like the last month, uh, including this month, the heat wave is uh, is coming to uh, this region. Um, the third concern is a job economical confrontation. Um, you know, that is, that is between the... Uh, yeah. I think there are some background noise. Uh, yeah, if you if you can mute it, uh, appreciate that. Um, so the job job economical confrontations are failure to mitigate the climate change, right? And then the long term, if you look at the second uh, line, uh, ten years we are looking at the failure to mitigate the climate change, and this is where. Um, the number of company or number of country has declared two zero five zero being a zero uh, net zero, but uh, uh, due to their uh, own reason, uh, the climate actions has not been taken. So, so that that is the main concern, right? And and we keep emitting the CO two. Uh, failure on the climate change adaptations uh, when sea level rise. Um, there's no medication uh, adaptation measure, so this is also the, the concern. But you know, a lot of countries are due to uh, they don't have the fund uh, to take care of the climate change uh, adaptations, and then uh, natural disaster and extreme weather. So this is uh, where the higher risk uh, uh, based on the reports. Um, this one also give you a bit of uh, perspective in terms of the disasters risk. Uh, looking at the impact in 2022, uh, Philippines, uh, out of 100 points, they, they have about 46.2 on the disasters risk. And you look at Myanmar, it's 35.49, which is very high. Uh, and in Southeast Asia, besides Philippines, then we have Indonesia, right? Uh, so, but on the other hand, uh, looking at the health impact due to the climate change in Asia, uh, that is on the left diagram. Huh? And then you can see that according to the reports, 12,100 deaths per year. Uh, and that is due to the climate change. And then uh 8009 death per year due to ozone uh influenced by extreme events such as heat wave and then double amount of uh, temperature related to death uh since 1980 so you can see the climate change impact uh has caused a lot of disaster um so why why i started this because these are the demand in engineering educations. We don't have enough talents or expertise in handling the climate change issue. So I would I would urge you know the university will start to look into uh, the solutions, whether it's mitigations or whether it's adaptations. Uh, there must be an engineering solutions to mitigate. Otherwise. Uh, it will going to have a, a greater impact uh, in the future year. All right, so we're talking about the UN Agenda 2030. Uh, uh, just also give you a regional context on the impact. 
So Southeast Asia is a key contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. All right. So you can, you can see that we are the fourth largest energy consumer in the world. And that is, that is, uh, that is bad, right? And then you are looking at 80% of energy derived from fossil fuel. And this is what we have emitted. 70% contributed to global emissions from land use change and forestry. All right. So when you talk about land use change, last time is agriculture, but because of industrializations, all convert to industrial use. And industrial use will emit the amount of uh, carbon emissions. All right. So, but then there's a lot of room for us to uh, to accelerate on the en energy transitions. So you can see from here is for our 10 Southeast Asian country has sufficient renewable energy technical potential to meet the electricity demands. Okay, and then for our 10 Southeast Asia country, export of plan, export electricity generation from renewable source. Say for example, Singapore is having uh, uh, mainly using the LNG for power generations. But recently, we bought solar energy from Malaysia, from Indonesia. We got uh, hydro hydropower from Laos. So these are the examples that uh, for those countries who are able to develop renewable energy. And uh, it should develop that and then to share or sell it to the neighboring country. Um, of course, besides that, Singapore also generating hydrogen power. And now we have the second hydrogen plant uh, uh, in is under construction. All right. So if you see that the world of uh, forest land come from Southeast Asia, 15%. So that is that is a, a, a big opportunity that for us to improve using renewable energy. And give you the a bit of a, a perspective on the history, uh, where this climate change come about. And I will highlight a, a number of events uh, developed recently. Um, we started having the first climate conference uh, the Declarations of World Climate Conference in 1979. Then we have uh, establishments of IPCC uh, in 1998 and then UNFCC in 1992. Uh, we have Kyoto Protocol, which is uh, CDM. Uh, and then we have this uh, established the IPCC Bali Roadmap. Uh, and then we have a Copenhagen Accord, which at the Copenhagen, not many people realize that. But then the most important event is a Paris Agreement, which is in 2015, right? And then the uh, 2021, uh, we have uh, COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, that start to get people interested about the climate change and they can feel the impact uh, due to the climate change. And then in 2022, uh, COP27 uh, in Egypt last year. And this year, in a few months' time, in November, uh, this year, we're going to have COP28 in Dubai. So these are the, the main uh, major events in the world where we discuss about the climate issue, we discuss about the impact, and uh, of course, the impact is great to all countries. And this is where... Um, a uh, number of countries has committed, but I'm not too sure whether they were implemented. Uh, that's still uh, leave it to uh, the politicians to look at it. Um, so, and the 2030 uh, agenda by the United Nations, uh, since 2015, this is a 15 year plan for people on the SDG. Um, Adopted by 193 country, adopt. Okay, so uh, hopefully it can be implemented. And then there's 17 goals, 169 targets, uh, and 200 plus indicators. So these are the target setting uh, discussed 
uh, and some country has started implementation because this year is already 2023 and we only have seven years to go. All right. So since we established the SDG, it's already half a journey, but we're still talking about it and still many many countries has not been started. So uh, for those who participated in this uh, conference, uh, maybe you can also look into where we are talking about engineering education. How does the climate change uh, can build into the education itself, uh, into the syllables, and then uh, we can have train more people, be aware, be providing solutions to the climate change. All right. So, uh, uh, yeah, so simulate uh, actions and offer new entry point and opportunity to bridge the divide between human rights and developments, right? And serve as overall framework to guide global and national development actions. So, so this is uh, something in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, so we have all this COP, we have all this international initiative, in fact, ADB World Bank has already started implementing project uh, to look into the uh, SDG itself. So there's a lot of pressure globally and uh, to the individual countries when they start to, to, to roll out their projects. So what the nation, uh, uh, the nation can do. So the nations, uh, for example, in Singapore, we we have a carbon tax. So those who emit the carbon tax will have to pay high penalty. At the moment, uh, it's five zero, uh, five dollars Singapore dollar. Uh, next year will be 25. And in 2030, you go, to, go up to $80 per ton of CO2 equivalent. So these are some of the national policy can be implemented. Uh, that will reduce the carbon emissions by the industry. All right. So what the private sector can do, private sector is to make, make it happen and implement the initiative. Um, for example, like sustainability reporting, uh, will make it compulsory for private sector to disclose their financial Im impact due to climate change. And then we have also implemented compulsory reporting on TCFD, the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. So these are some of the new initiatives. But of course, we need the fundamental as the traditional engineering. But on the other hand, new wave of engineering is coming in. And then we have to train more uh, uh, practitioners uh, into this area to mitigate the climate change. All right, so when you talk about mitigation, adaptation, and this is our future, and we cannot ignore that um, uh, in, our, in our engineering education process. Um, just sharing uh, Singapore's green initiative. Uh, um, uh, in fact, uh, we started the journey uh, very early, 2008. Uh, we have the Inter-Ministerial Committee on Sustainable Development. And then we have a climate change action plan, uh, national climate change strategy, um, carbon pricing in 2018 and implemented in 2019. Uh, we do have a net zero uh, waste uh, roadmap. Uh, so, so the reason year uh, in 2021, we draw out Singapore Green Plan. That is the, the big plan for Singapore in driving to uh, 2030, as well as uh, last year, uh, we announced that uh, we're going to be a uh, net zero country by 2050, right? So we revised our NDC, uh, National Determined Contributions, uh, to, to achieve the net zero by 2050. All right, so I'm, I'm, 
I will be sharing some of the initiative we have in our green plan uh, and in our strategy as well. Uh, and from this uh, 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 strategy, you are able to see uh, what are the opportunity when students graduated from the university, they are able to adopt and adapt to by the industry. So if you look at, uh, we have a strategy on building. So, and it's quite determined by 2030, we want 80% of, of the new building are green buildings. And that that is, uh, uh, is work in progress at this moment. And then our our revisions to the green mark. Uh, green mark is some is equivalent to the lead. Uh, we put it as a super low energy program. So it's no more low energy. We are trying to say how can we take the challenge to decrease to to uh, reduce the increase the efficiency of the chiller program. and and uh, uh, we put it into the next challenge to say. Uh, how the technology are uh, able to re to increase the efficiency uh, of the of the uh, chiller plant, and then in terms of transportations, uh, uh, zero private uh, vehicle growth. So there's no more no more growth in the in the vehicle uh, emissions, and but the vehicle vehicle emissions in the sense that we are encouraging using electric vehicles, all right? And uh, um, having a challenge by, you know, nine in 10 peak period journey on walk, cycle and ride. So less car and clean vehicle by 2040. And for the industry, increase the energy efficiency uh, because a lot of buildings, a lot of, um, uh, at that time when, you build the energy efficiency is is uh, not so high, right? So there's a lot of opportunity looking at doing an energy audit. You're able to increase the efficient energy efficiency, and because of the technology, uh, uh, improve in technology. So we are able to uh, uh, improve the energy efficiency, and all these are engineering solution. So we need to train more people in that way, right? System uh, level solutions, low carbon technology. We are looking at carbon abatement, uh, carbon uh, utilizations. Uh, so those are the technology you are able to, to uh, develop by the engineers. Uh, waste and water, uh, circular economy approach, reduce waste, including recycling, uh, Increase energy efficiency, desaturation plant, and uh, use of water treatments. All right, and then for household mandatory energy labeling, uh, educates the household and how they what is the best practice they should uh, do uh, in their household. Right. So yeah, so these are some of the opportunity I can I can share that with you. Uh, adopt of advanced low carbon technology. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, initiative on that. Uh, so we can see how to uh, adopt a carbon capture and carbon storage and utilizations and low carbon hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen, I think is a future energy uh, we uh, should be adapting, all right? Because uh, there's, uh, uh, minimum uh, emissions on that. So, um, effective inter international cooperation, and this is where the conference for this, uh, like this, is is helpful because a there's a lot of things uh, need to be done, and uh, individual countries are not able to do it everything by themselves. So we need to collaborate and we need to share. Uh, knowledge and technology so that we are able to adopt, adapt to each other or, or uh, share with each other. And then uh, we are able to get the latest development in terms of uh, te technology and uh, uh, building capacity. 
Um, this is uh, also an uh, adaptation strategy for uh, Singapore. We, we do have uh, looking at the uh, sea level rise, uh, global warming, uh, we start to look at coastal protections. Um, the work already started uh, two years ago. Uh, so it's going to be a long term uh, development for coastal protection in Singapore. And for the region, the low lying area like Bangkok, uh, Jakarta, uh, all these are the low lying area. And I uh, believe, I think Jakarta has already started to look into that. Bangkok already looking into that a few years back. So these are some of the pre uh, uh, a plan uh, strategy is required. And then, yeah. So in terms of uh, adaptation, besides coastal protection, we are look, also looking at the biodiversity, how to make it green, you know, uh, building an infrastructure, uh, public health, food security network, uh, and uh, urban heat island effects. Okay, so gaps uh, and opportunity. So this is what I'm trying to uh, mention here. There is a lot more demand in the in 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 meeting uh, the the manpower requirement or the human capital requirement. So based on the ADB uh, uh, commitment, uh, seven point one billion to climate mitigation and adaptation. So we need a lot more people, right? Of course, we need traditional engineering people, but we need a lot more people in tackling the climate change. So I, I from the from a chart you can see here, uh, almost everything are related to engineering. You're looking at agriculture, energy, the 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 most uh, usage, uh, water, transport. All these are all related to engineering. All right. So even for traditional engineering, if you are in, in the, the power generation sector, you can look at it as how to convert that fossil fuel to renewable energy. And that is also another way of energy uh, generations. Huh? So uh, this is just only to show you um, the, the climate bond initiative in 2022, uh, the amount divided by the sector uh, the energy building transport is the main water, uh, waste, land, and all those, right? And uh, on the uh, uh, international renew renewable energy, uh, the, un the outlook, you're looking at the renewable energy will be increased trem uh, tremendously and uh, energy conservation, efficiency, uh, uh, hydrogen, so so all these are the renewable energy demand and we need more people into this area. All right, so um, just to share with you the employment and climate change resilient in Asia Pacific regions in 2021, and that is uh, under the ILO uh, projections. So, energy trans transmission and distribution, solar, smart city, climate, climate mitigation and adaptation. So these are the, the main area. But if I look at the regional uh, uh, university syllables, there are not many university conducting this. Or you don't have a sufficient expertise in conducting the, tra the, the courses, right? So, so I will encourage uh, the university can look into uh, the climate issue uh, so that you can train more students in this area. And I'm just sharing, you know, uh, uh, some of the Singapore experience on IoT data, on the using technology to grow vegetable. And, you know, Singapore don't have land. But we got to grow vegetable vertically instead of horizontally, right? So we use a lot more technology uh, in terms of how to grow agriculture and uh, hydroponic systems. You, you can see the strawberry here. So those are the, the technology where engineers can create and, and solving the problems. 
And of course, the flood resilience, we are building the coastal protections, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the work already started and there are some pilot projects already been done. Uh, so these are the, the engineering solutions to solve the climate issue. So future of engineering education, I would think that still surround with the SDG, all right? So, so if I pick up a few uh, engineering-centric SDG, uh, you can see from here, there's so much opportunity and where we need more expertise in that area. So achieving SDG required engineers can deal with you define interdiscipline and complex challenge for future. So recognizing and require competency, uh, normative thinking, all right, strategy thinking, system thinking, collaboration competency. We don't have inter, uh, what do you call uh, uh uh, between you know humans communications, I think engineers are lacking of the soft skill. Okay, that is a soft skills of engineering. But usually, uh, the engineers more focus on technical, but not focus on soft skill. So so those are the things that we do need because the the project getting more complex, and and uh, you need uh, a lot collaboration with other professional, other discipline, and that will come to a solution. Unlike 50 years ago, we are very single discipline focused. Now we are having a multi-discipline, interdiscipline focus in order to solve the problem. So critical thinking, competency, uh, self-awareness, integrated problem solving, continuous learning, uh, interdisciplinary work, interpersonal skill, and anticipatory competency. So these are the competency skill uh, where the future and future engineering should acquire. And of course, the, the IEA do have uh, the graduate uh, attribute and professional competency. Uh, so, so those are the, I think I... Uh, I believe uh, uh, in the recent uh, uh, meeting in IEA, we also discussed about uh, how to incorporate climate change into the competency for the uh, graduate attribute, right? And uh, Elizabeth is here, so Elizabeth can can uh, 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 explain that. Huh? But uh, of course, in, in WFEO, we do have a, WFEO Academy, and the chairman is from uh, Myanmar, all right? So we have to use this platform to see how we can uh, train more people. By the way, this platform is free, and you just need to register, uh, and then you, there are many courses are there. So you are able to learn uh, from WFEO platform uh, to to train your, your personal skill and your competency in, in terms of sustainable developments. All right, so, and this is just a case study that uh, collaborations uh, between the practitioners and the IHL, uh, continue education training because those engineers trained in the past may not have the skill set on uh, sustainability de development. So we need to have a continued education, especially by the professional body. And then the build a regional capacity to meet the challenge, uh, localize the knowledge and building capacity in the local level. So my conclusions, partnership for go. Uh, so the world is taking firm action to seek sustainable growth opportunity. Uh, Sherpa national organization at international level, government level of nations, business, professional, academia and individual has role to play to transform our world. All right, thank you very much.
thank you very much, Engineer Tan, for your fruitful presentation. We have learned a lot from your presentation. Let me to move the next presentation. Uh, before the presentation had been started, Please allow me to read about the brief biography of Professor Dr. Kirsten Aaron, professor at the University of Science, uh, Applied Science, Charlotte, Hosula in Olympic from 1975. Faculties of Civil Engineering, Geoinformation and Technical Health. He is Vice President of World Council of Civil Engineering from 2008 to 2013. He is also Vice President of European Council of Survey Engineering from 2002 to 2008. And also he as a representative of the Institutes of the German Engineer, Muschamp, and by this following members of the famous German accreditation agency, ASIIN. He served as initiator and coordinator of numerous national and international education, research and cooperation projects within the European program, Tempus, Socrates, Commerce, Templars, like a European civil engineering management, and later hearing technology and audiology A plus A. He worked as a guest lecturer at the numerous partner university and conferences in Europe, and worldwide. Moreover, he is a chairman of Solar Energy Groups or STG Energy of the World Federation of Engineering Organization and as the authors of study on solar energies or wave field. Today, he is going to present about the ethical behaviors and anti-corruption education in the construction of survey engineering. Now, may I invite Professor Dr. Kirsten to present about your keynote presentation. The floor is yours. Professor, please. Yes. Good, <clears throat> ah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Carsten Ahrens, and I was in, you are informed about my person, and I didn't realize exactly that it was me who was the lady talking about. But I'm very pleased to be with you and to give this keynote speech about the ethical behavior and anti-corruption education in construction or civil engineering. By this, I am rather far away from, my, from the former speaker who gave a more global vision of what is sustainability, of course, not everybody can talk about this in such a global way. I just pick out a specific topic of it. But this concerns also his uh, vision that many more engineers have to be educated because the need for engineers worldwide is very, very big. And this concerns all kinds of engineers. In my case, I will specify on construction or civil engineering, but the course itself could be used for any kind of engineering education. Yes, next second slide, please. I come up with two courses, which I gave and will give in this specific topic. Two examples in ethical behavior education. One has been done in the past, but is still very, uh, I would say uh, specific and up to date. It's a bottom up uh, program ethics in the built environment, IB. And the second one is a top down course, university anti corruption course from GIAC. The first one was held and can be held everywhere as an international summer course, but it can be done also during normal education times. This course showed the young students who are interested to work also internationally, uh, how to treat the values of ethical behavior. They may know the ethical values at home if they walk, work, abroad, walk and work abroad, then they have to get acquainted with the uh, specific demandments 
of what is ethical work and the culture is different, this language is different. So they have to come up with a common uh, idea, a common sense, what is uh, uh, ethics. So I lost the picture, would you please <laughs> uh, put in? Yes, otherwise I could use my own here. This uh, course, no, not too quick, back again, please. One back. Yes, thank you. There are examples of non-ethical behavior as examined at home. This was the work the students had to do because they come to our summer course locations. The overarching part of this uh, education program was at that time the code of conduct of the European Council of Civil Engineers. The second course is a very up-to-date course. It has been finished uh, this at the beginning of this year. It is from the Global Infrastructure Anti-Corruption Center situated in London. In this course, definitions are very important starting points. What is corruption? What is fraud? What is money washing, wrongdoing, and so on? Corruption and international laws, how to protect against corruptions, are treated. Examples and uh, theoretical ways are implemented to understand how corruption occurs in infrastructure projects. Selected international corruption cases of rather big dimensions are used as examples to make clear what costs are connected with corruption and how big is the impact on society. Of course, there are ways shown how to evade corruption, how to avoid punishment. And one of the basis of this corruption, anti-corruption cause is these ISO 37001 anti-bribery management system, which is an A standard and could be implemented in each, uh, uh, each uh, uh, building company and other companies, other uh, institutions like the ISO 9000 quality management system. This makes it rather easy, but it is difficult to really uh, make interested companies to do that. Very often companies, if they are connected with the wording corruption, they refuse to really get involved. But this of course is a big mistake. Next slide, please. The Ivan network in the year 2003, of course does not exist in this case. You see Oldenburg, the center of Europe, my home city. We had meetings in Prague, and in, uh, in Portugal, uh, in Porto. At that time, also students from Moscow participated in this program. Next slide. Just to give you an impression about the dimension of this course, you see many young people sitting together, learning together, enjoying the world together. And of course, understanding together what is meant by wording connected with ethics, with ethical behavior, with bribery, and so on. And you see Europe and a number, a number of these uh, uh, institutions. Next slide, please. An overview of this IBA module is given by this poster, which I used in former times. At that time, our university had a different sign, a different name. This is now actual here, and this is the former one. You can see the module, the objectives of the module in the middle, ethics in the built environment. This Socrates intensive project was founded by the European Union for three years with a big amount of money. 40 students from 13 universities participated each time in this two week summer course. The basis and the roots of IBE are described and the concept of the module. On the right side, you can see the IBE module 
which is made to be uh, done by 15 weeks of education to fulfill one semester. Next slide, we'll see it in more detail. Next slide, please. Yes, this Socrates intensive project is an English language module, of course, to be international, but to really implement it at the university at home, you also have to transfer it in the home language. And the objective was that it should become an obligatory part in the civil engineering education at the involved European universities. Length is one semester consisting of 15 lecturing weeks, as it is usual here in the European education system, two or four lecturing hours per week. And it should be valued with a European ECTS credit points, two or five, depending on the amount of hours per week. And of course, it has to be accredited by the respective accreditation agencies at home. This course, like the GIA course, is, can be done like, uh, with the, as a face-to-face -face on the campus education system or online. Both possibilities are rather equivalent, but nevertheless, for young people, it is very important to be closer together and to really see and touch each other and talk to each other than just do it online. Next slide, please. The overarching uh, topic for this course was at that time, the Code of Professional Conduct ECHE. An engineer concerning society as to pick up just one chapter of it, will act with integrity and have full regard to the public interest, will have due regard to health and safety, will endeavor to improve public knowledge, will express professional opinion only when he or she is really qualified, will reject bribery in all forms and will seek opportunities to be of constructive service in civic affairs. Yes, these are words very often for young people. These are just words and they have to be filled with life. And the question then is how to bring this demanding wording successfully in a teaching and learning structure for young people and then fill it with life. Next slide. The IVA program was trying to do that. At that time, I just used a, a number of values which are necessary in technical action. For example, when working on the building side, you have to look for safety, for functionality of the building and the building side itself, for health of the people. You want to have get money in a microeconomic way. The prosperity of the country has to be put in the right order. The environmental quality has to be, not to be touched too much. And so you have personality development and societal quality. There are a number of instrumental relationships which foster, for example, the societal quality. If you have safe working conditions on the building side, then it supports the societal quality. If the functionality of the buildings are good, then the personality development is given. If you look for health, then the economy is touched. But in this case, you can see common competitive relationships. If you put too much weight on health uh, and, uh, for the people, then you may lose some money building this. Uh, house this uh, construction site. If you put very much environmental quality on it, it may happen in the same way. But nevertheless, these are things which can be understood by students quite well. If they ask, what is ethics? You cannot really say, it is this, it is this, this. They have to find it really in their job, in their work, and 
Every young engineer knows what is safety on the building site, what is health when I'm working there, what is functionality if the bridge collapses, this is not functional, and then by this it is also not ethical. This connection, I think, is very important to bring it not only to the ear of the students and the eyes, but also into their heads. Next slide, please. Next, the students had to, when they came, had to prepare a, a special topic. And in this case, the Portuguese students are concerned with the environment and the way waste is yeah, treated or not treated, just put away. If you find innovative progresses, then you're looking for the welfare of the people. Normally, you always want more. If you look for new ways, you will modify the nature. This is a very bad modification. Nature has limits, so there are conflicts and the resources life cycles within the nature also have limits. So how can we construct with the same purpose, but in different ways? This was their question, and they wanted to find answers within the group. Next slide, please. Uh, the group co combining students from Oldenburg, Germany, and Swedish students looked for challenges now to create a system which is and by this, they put all the uh, wording of the technical values into adjectives or <laughs> substantives to make clear, to make uh, understandable how ethics is within the uh, building and their work of, uh, of engineers. Effectiveness, usefulness, simplicity, reliability, lifespan, and so on. Next slide, please. Without nearly no words, the Czech students put this together. There's always a, a, a lump sum of money and safety. The more money you want to earn, the less you will put into the safety conditions on the building side and vice versa. This is really telling quite a lot without saying too much by words. Next slide, please. To understand in an international way, it is of course very important to really know what is meant by the words. And in English, this is the normal language to make each other understood, of course. You know what's a building company, you know what's a client, but you did not know it always in your home language. So we also made up a self-made vocabulary for each of the partner institutions. In this case, it is Spanish, benefits, beneficios, client, cliente, very similar, but very important to give the students the same platform to understand exactly what is meant by the words of the others in their, uh, in their working groups. Next slide, please. The second course is that of GIAC. GIAC, as I said, stands for Global Infrastructure Anti-Corruption center and as my poor speaker said infrastructure needs more and more people and more and more has to be looked on and infrastructure really is that place where corruption exists and where corruption plays the most important role infrastructure is treated as the most corrupt uh, working topic GX stands, as I said, placed in London. You can inform yourself on this website. It's really a lexicon with a lot of possibilities, uh, all connected, of course, with anti-corruption. 
GIAC has a number of international affiliates. For example, we in Germany have also a GIAC community. It is very active in civil engineering associations worldwide, like in the World Council of Civil Engineers, and also within the World Federation of Engineering Organizations, VFEO. The newest outcome, the newest work of GIAC is the University Anti-Corruption Course. This course can be used in different teaching surroundings in, within universities, within engineering education as continuous uh, part of the continuous development or in lifelong learning institu institutions and so on. It can be used online and of course, can be also be implemented in the university education itself face to face. Next slide, please. There's eight sections as teaching parts. Of course, always there is an introduction to the course. It is described what is corruption. And in this case, I uh, renewed my PowerPoint a little bit. Now the pictures are not existing. What is corruption, which can be really uh, described by pictures itself, but I will give it later on to, the, to you and to the organizers. Their students have to learn how corruption could cause on infrastructures, projects, and why does it uh, occur? We tackle in this course the cost of corruption. We have to inform the students how to deal with corruption, whether it is outside or whether it is inside the project and the company. Their hypothetical case studies, for example, the Galaxy Highway, and their number of detailed case studies of real life corruption cases, which are taught to the students and which are discussed within these groups. Next slide, please. For example, a detailed content of the seminar too, which needs two weeks. What is corruption? What is meant by corruption? And how is corruption treated under the specific national law or international laws? Examples of corrupt acts as civil wrongs are discussed in detail. Corrupt acts as criminal offenses are described and treated as such. Prosecution of a corruption offense is not only discussed, a number of role plays can be uh, done within this uh, chapter 2.5, as we also did it in the IBEL uh, project. If you involve the students, Specifically, in a deeper way, you have to start role plays, which they have to uh, work in, in groups. And then, of course, they have to come up with the results, show and really involve the other students. Cases, corruption, offenses, common in the infrastructure, you have to be yeah, involved. What may happen and what should not happen. These are greeted and discussed in this chapter. Uh, this course is a top-down course, as I said. It is very uh, much detailed and it is very uh, strictly going from top to down, but nevertheless, it depends on the teacher where to cut it where to make it longer, where to put the heavy weight on it, and where to slim it a little bit. Next slide, please. The corruption offenses, point two, point six, common in the infrastructure sector. And you see a lot of specific examples. Bribery, for example, has 
will be discussed in a detailed, uh, a detailed uh, construction point two, corruption case Rolls Royce. Extortion is corruption case Panalpina. UN Chalk Cock Housing Development gives an example for fraud. Cartels are discussed in the European switch gear and lift cartels. Abuse of function, embezzlement are other topics in this case, and the relationship between these corruption offenses, which are uh, described here, are discussed and worked on in point two, six, seven. Next slide, please. How corruption occurs in infra projects. This is very important starting part for a number of, for, I would say for many of the young people and also for others who are not so much involved in ethical questions up to now. How does in the infrastructure project process work? How corruption occurs in each project phase? How corruption is concealed on infra projects and just one corruption case, detailed corruption case six, Les Soto Highland water project. You can see by these examples, these are collected from all over the world. There's no only one country <laughs> which gives all these uh, examples. Even in Germany, we had a very big project, Siemens corruption process, which is uh, under, not understandable in that time here in Germany, but it still happened. The motivation for corruption, yeah. There's one who wants to get money in a very light and direct and quick way. And on the other hand, the, you need someone who is offering it to get it back in another way. I wanted to have some, the two pictures, but <laughs> you didn't get it. Pictures which facilitate corruption are discussed in a very detailed way. Then as we had it before, the costs of corruption are discussed, dealing with corruption and case studies and real life corruption cases are worked on again. Next slide, please. This is the last one, as you can see it, I thank you very much for your attention. And I do hope this, that ethical behavior and anti-corruption education in construction and civil engineering in, could be used in more countries, in more engineering education associations and institutions, and should not be restricted only to civil or construction engineering. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Tata Kasten, for your valuable and fruitful presentation. We have learned a lot from your presentation. Please let me move to the next presentation. According to the agenda, before the presentations of the next speaker, Dr. Rodrigo Spirit Fernandez uh, had been started, let me introduce you about the Dr. Rodrigo. Currently, he is a professor in the Marine Engineering School of University Polite Polytechnic de Madrid. He is especially lecturing in gas and steam turbine, shield building history, as well as other subjects. He is a member of the Committees on Education and, en and Engineering of the World Federation of Engineering Organization Council and also a member of the Royal Institute of Naval Architects, Faculty Advisor and Student Session Advisors of the Society of Naval Architects and Marine Engineer at UPM and a president of Spanish Associations of Marine Engineer in Matrix. He has published several books and written more than 100 technical papers about the marine engineering. This is a brief biography of uh, Dr. Fernandez. Now, this is a time to deliver the keynote presentations of the Dr. Fernandez. The floor is yours. Doctor, please.
Uh, sorry, Professor, we cannot hear. No, we cannot hear. <laughs> can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay perfect. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. So thank you very much for your kind introduction. And it's a pleasure to participate in the International Conference on Engineering Education and Accreditation. Uh, my predecessors have introduced the topic I'm going to talk, the importance of the soft skills in engineering education. The aim of my conference is the implementation of soft skills in the higher studies of engineering to achieve the 2030 Agenda for the Sustainability Development. Probably all of you know that the European Higher Education Area initiated the development and subsequent implementation of new study plans, which established the inescapable requirement of the acquisition for future engineers of the so-called soft skills. These soft skills were considered to facilitate the free movement of university students and graduates in Europe, in Europe and access to an increasingly globalized labor market. Since the implementation of the European Higher Education Area in 2010, European engineering universities have addressed in one way or another the commitment to students to ensure their training and evaluation regarding the soft skills that each degree should contemplate. These soft skills are related with communication, problem solving, organization, leadership, teamwork, adaptability, ethics, uh, creativity, and interpersonal skills and emotional intelligence. And the way each university proceeds has been very diverse, resulting in models of greater or lesser scope of goals and more or less successful results. The aim of my conference is to promote the implementation of new skills or new soft skills to achieve the 2030 Agenda for the Sustainability Development, seeking to end poverty and hunger, realizing the human rights of all, achieving gender equality, and the empowerment of all women and girls, and ensuring the lasting protection of the planet and its natural resources. How we implement or how to implement these new soft skills and the need to do it are the backbone of a new way of teaching the new generation of engineers warranting their teaching and the assessment. Thank you very much. The UN 2030 Agenda, officially known as Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainability Development is a global action plan adopted by all United Nations members stated in September 2015. The agenda sets out a comprehensive an ambitious blueprint to address some of the most pressing global challenges and to achieve sustainability development by the year 2030. And it's called the UN 2030 Agenda encompass 17 sustainable development goals, which are a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, to ensure pros prosperity to all. These Sustainability development goals are integrated and indivisible, balancing the economic, social, and environmental dimensions of sustainable development. Each goal has a specific target, as you know, and the indicators to monitor progress. I'm not going to enter in special attention to any of them, but it's important that this United Nations 2030 Agenda is an aspirational and transport a transformative framework that seeks to leave no one behind and aims to promote prosperity. Would you please move to the previous one, please? To the slide number four. Yeah, please stay there. Yeah, thank you. So as I, I, I was mentioning, this framework seeks to leave no one behind and aims to promote prosperity, peace, 
and well-being for all while safeguarding the planet resources. Government, businesses, civil societies, and, individu and individuals all have a role to play in implementing the agenda and working towards a sustainable and equitable future. The achievements of these goals require collective efforts and global corporations, and professors, students are playing a key role on all of this. So in addition to technical knowledge and expertise, engineering professionals require a range of soft skills to excel in their roles and contribute effectively to projects and teams. Soft skills are essential for effective communication, collaboration, problem solving, and adaptability. Some of the most important engineering soft skills are the ones that I put in this, in this slide, like communication skills. Effective communication is crucial for engineers to convey technical concept to both technical and non-technical stakeholders. This includes written communication, verbal communication, the ability to present complex ideas in a clear and concise manner, teamwork and collaboration. The engineers often work in multidisciplinary teams, being able to collaborate, share ideas, and work well with others is essential for project success. Problem solving skills, engineers are problem solvers, so the ability to analyze complex issues, think critically, and propose innovative solutions is vital in engineering projects. Creativity and innovation, the engineering often requires creative thinking to come up with new approaches, and technologies to address challenges and improve existing systems. Adaptability and flexibility. Engineering projects can be dynamic and subject to change. Being adaptable and flexible allows engineers to adjust to evolving circumstances and requirements. Time management. Engineers must manage their time effectively to meet project deadlines and prioritize tasks efficiently. Leadership skills, while not all engineers may be formal leadership positions, having leadership skills is essential for leading any project, guiding teams, and taking initiatives. Ethic and integrity, my colleagues, my previous colleague has already explained, engineers are responsible for designing and creating solutions that impact society and the environment. Adhering to ethical principles and demonstrated integrity is critical in engineering practice. Cultural awareness and diversity in a globalized world, engineers often work with colleagues from diverse cultural backgrounds. Cultural awareness and sensitivity promote effective collaboration and communication. Customer focus, understanding and meeting the needs of customer of or end users is vital in engineering projects aimed at delivering value and satisfaction. Negotiation skills, engineers may need to negotiate with stakeholders, suppliers, or any other team member to achieve project objectives and resolve conflicts. Emotional intelligence uh, involves understanding and managing one's emotions and recognition or recognizing and emphasizing with the emotion of others, it contributes to positive working relationship and effective communication. Networking and relationship building, professional networks and relationships can lead to new opportunities, partnership, and access to valuable resources. Continuous learning, the engineering is a rapidly evolving field. Engineers must embrace a mindset of continuous learning to stay updated on new technologies and methodologies. And finally, the 15 one, the 15 soft skill that I analyze from a technical engineering perspective is the resilience, the ability to bounce back from setbacks and challenges is crucial in the engineering world where projects may face obstacles or unforeseen circumstances. So these soft skills complement technical expertise and enable engineers to thrive in diverse work environments, collaborate effectively, and contribute meaningfully to projects with real world impact. So if we can move please to the next slide. 
we can say that increasing the number of information and communication technologies, professionals in Europe, to 20 billion by 2030 is an ambitious goal that aims to address the growing demands for digital skills and expertise in Europe, for example. Achieving this objective requires concerted efforts from various stakeholders, including governments, educational institutions, industry, and obviously individuals as professors and students. Here are some key strategies that can contribute to reaching this target. The first one may be the investment in education and training, where governments and educational institutions, higher universities, should allocate resources to enhance education and training programs. This includes updating curricula to align with industry demands, promoting digital literacy from an early age, and offering specialized courses and certifications to add skills to existing workforce. Promote STEM education. You know that encourage more students to pursue science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields as these are fundamental for building a strong foundation related in related disciplines. Lifelong learning initiatives, implementing lifelong learning initiative, initiatives to support continuous professional development for individuals already in the workforce, encouraging upskilling and reskilling opportunities will help existing professionals adapt to technological advancement. Take measures to address gender imbalances and promote gender diversity. Encourage women to enter and stay in the industry can significantly contribute to reaching the target of 20 million uh, professionals. Foster collaboration between industry and academia to ensure that education and training programs are aligned with the skills demanded by the job market internship opportunities and industry partnership can help students gain practical experience. Ensure that Europe, for example, has the necessary digital infrastructure, such as high-speed internet connectivity, to support the growth of engineering-related businesses and services. Create an attractive environment for professionals to live and work in any part of the, of the globe, this can be achieved by offering competitive salaries, favorable working conditions, and a supportive work-life balance. Encourage ent entrepreneurship and innovation in the engineering sector. Supporting startups and technology-driven initiatives can create job opportunities and drive economic growth. Embrace the growing trends of remote work and digital nomadism, which allows engineering professionals to work from anywhere and attract talent from across the globe. Launch public awareness campaigns to showcase the opportunities and benefits of pursuing careers in engineering. Dispelling myths and stereotypes about the industry can attract more individuals to consider engineering-related professions. Align efforts with existing European Union initiatives focus on digital skills development, such as the Digital Skill and Job Coalition and the Digital Europe program. By adopting a multifaceted approach that encompass education, training, industry support, and policy initiatives, we can work towards achieving the goal of 20 million ICT professionals by 2030. This, in turn, will contribute to the world digital transformation, economical world growth, and competitive in the on the global stage. If you don't mind to move to the next slide, please. So developing soft skills require active and practical learning methodologies that go beyond traditional lectures and theoretical instruction. The following learning methodologies can be effective in fostering the development of soft skills or soft skills. Uh, the first one, the experimental learning. This approach involves learning through hands-on experiences and reflections, engaging in role-playing exercises, simulations, and real-world projects, allows learners to apply soft skills in practical scenarios and reflect on their experiencing. The second one, the team-based learning encourage learners to work in teams to solve problems, 
and complete projects. Collaborative activities promote communication, teamwork, and conflict resolution skills. The third one, the case studies. We can analyze in real life case studies allows the students to explore complex situations, make decisions, and consider the implication of their own choices. This enhances critical thinking, problem solving, and ethical decision making skills. Uh, storytelling and scenarios. Uh, presenting students with relatable stories and scenarios helps them to emph emphasize with different perspectives and understand the impact of their actions. It also improves communication and empathy skills. The role playing and debates, we can organize role playing exercises and debates to allow students to practice communication, negotiation, and persuasion skills in a safe and controlled environment. We have the feedback and self assessment. We can encourage the students to seek feedback from peers, from mentors, from professors to identify areas for improvements in their soft skills. Self assessment exercises can also help individuals recognize their strength and weakness. Mentorship and coaching with a pair uh, students, with mentors, with professors who can provide guidance, support, and personalized feedback to help them develop specific soft skills. The service learning and community engagement, which involves students in service learning projects that allow them to contribute to the community while developing empathy, cultural awareness, and social responsibility. Multimedia and technology, incorporating multimedia resources, interactive platforms and technology enabled tools to create engaged learning experiences to cater to different learning activities. Emotional intelligence training, integrate activities and workshops that focus on emotional intelligence, including self-awareness, self self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and social skills, cultural exchange and international programs, continuous practice and reinforcement, reflection and journaling, peer teaching and mentoring, and finally, the gamification, that is the use of gamified learning approaches to make the development of soft skills more engaging and enjoyable. Gamification can motivate the engineering students to participate active and track their progress. So by incorporating these learning methodologies into educational engineering programs, and, prof and professional development initiatives, students can enhance their soft skills, which are essential for personal growth, career advancement, and effective collaboration in a variety of settings. So if we move to the next one, I'm going to talk about the global higher uh, institutions place a vital role in facilitating the implementation of the sustainable development goals by contributing to research, education, and engagement with local and global communities. And some ways in which higher institutions can support these sustainable development goals can be that the higher institution can incorporate these goals into their academic programs across disciplines. This involves offering courses that address sustainable development issues, ethics, social responsibility, and solutions to global challenges. Uh, conducting research that align with these goals can generate valuable insights and solutions to address pressing global issues. Higher institutions can prioritize research in areas such as renewable energies, climate change mitigation, poverty alleviation, sustainable agriculture or healthcare. We can also encourage interdisciplinary collaboration among faculties and departments. Many of the goals require integrated approaches and higher institutions can foster teamwork to address complex challenges. We can also engage students and faculty in community service and service learning projects that directly contribute to local sustainable development efforts. This involvement allows higher institutions to have a positive impact on their surrounding communities. We can also forge partnership with governments 
businesses, non-governmental organizations, and international organizations to collectively work towards the goals. Collaborative efforts can amplify the impact and create meaningful change. Offer training programs, workshops, and capacity building initiatives for students and professionals to enhance their understanding and implementation of sustainable practices. We can also implement sustainable practices within the campus, the university, including energy efficiency, waste reduction, green buildings, and eco-friendly transportation options. We can also encourage and support students-led social inter interpreter ventures that address specific goals, providing resources and mentorship to help them uh, succeed. We can facilitate internal students and faculty exchanges, allowing for cross-cultural learning and collaboration on global issues. We can also have higher institutions that can use their platform to raise awareness about the sustainable development goals among students and the broader community. This can include or organizing conferences, seminars, and events focused on sustainable development. And finally, we can demonstrate institutional commitment to sustainability by appointing sustainability officers or task forces and incorporating sustainable practices into the institution's mission and vision. By taking an active role in promoting sustainable development, global higher institutions can contribute significantly to the achievements of the sustainability development goals and can create a more equitable, prosperous, uh, sustainable world. If we move to the next slide, please. So to implement these soft skills in the higher studies of engineering to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainability Development, we need to focus on fostering a holistic approach to education that goes beyond technical knowledge. Some steps to achieve, uh, in order to achieve this could be the curricular redesign, update the engineering curriculum to include courses or modules that address the sustainability development goals and focus on soft skill development. These courses can adopt topics like ethics, social responsibility, teamwork, and cultural awareness. The project-based learning emphasizes the project-based learning in the engineering curriculum. Interdisciplinary approach, promoting interdisciplinary collaboration among the students from different engineering dis disciplines and other fields like social science, economics, or even environmental studies. And this approach will help students understand the broader implication of their work and learn to work in diverse teams. The service learning and community engagement, encouraging students to engage in service learning activities in community projects. I'm not going to mention uh, more about this. I already mentioned at the beginning. Communication skill development, incorporating communication skills training in the curriculum, ethic and responsible, and responsible innovation, introducing courses that explore the ethical implications of engineering decisions and the importance of responsible innovation, encouraging discussions about the potential social and environmental impact of engineering projects, cultural awareness and global uh, or cultural competence, foster global awareness and cultural competence among engineering students. This school exposed to diverse cultures and perspectives will enable them to work in international settings and address global challenges effectively. Extracurricular activities, faculty developments, when we can provide professional development opportunities for faculty members to integrate soft skills into their teaching methods effectively. Uh, assessment and feedback, develop appropriate assessment tools to measure the acquisition of the soft skills and their application in real world scenarios. And uh, finally, the industry collaboration is very important, it's crucial collaborating with industry partners who are committed to sustainable development. Engaging with companies that value soft skills and sustainable practices can provide the students with valuable industry experience and inspire them to be socially responsible engineers. So by integrating all these soft skills into the higher studies of engineering, we can cultivate a new generation of engineers 
who are not only equipped, trained with technical expertise, but also possess the empath, the empath, the empathy, the communication abilities, the critical thinking required to address the complex challenges of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And finally, the last slide, I would like to, to mention that this is expected that in the future, the implementation of these new soft skills will advance further and allow greater things. Finally, I would like to transmit an optimistic vision of the future of our world and do not forget what is the most important, that is to motivate <coughs> our students, the future engineers, in one of the most extraordinary profession that I think that is the engineering. For this reason, I would like to bring into your attention a quote from Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Uh, it means that before to start to implement any new thing, like the soft skills, we need to share our vision and show the students, show the community what is the final goal to be delivered, that is to have a better world. So thank you very much. And, you know, I am here for answering any question if you may have one. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Fernandez, for your knowledgeable presentation. We have caught many information from your presentation. So I'd like to move to uh, next topics. Um, in accordance with the agenda, we are introduced about the brief history of Engineer Dr. Tan Yin Chen, who is a Secretary General of Federation of Engineering Organization. Dr. Tan obtained his Bachelor's of Engineering, uh, several, uh, specialized in civil engineering degree with the first class honors from the University Technology Malaysia, UTM, in uh, 1992. In 1994, he was awarded a Chin Fun King Prize and Master of Engineering, Geotechnical Engineering from the Asian Institutes of Technology, Bangkok. He later obtained his engineering doctorate from UTM in 2017. Dr. Ten is a professional engineer with a practicing certificate and accredited checker geotechnical register with the Book of Engineer Malaysia. He is a registered Asian charter professional engineer, as well as an APEX engineer and international professional engineer in Malaysia and Australia. He is also a registered foreign professional engineer in Myanmar and Cambodia. Dr. Ten holds the position of Secretary General from 2008 to 2023 of the Federation of Engineering Institutions of Asia and the Pacific, and also an international independent umbrella organization for the engineering institution in the Asia and the Pacific region. He was the president of the Institutions of Engineer Malaysia in year 2016 to 2018. He has also served 10 years as a board member of the Board of Engineer Malaysia, a government regulatory body registering and governing in all engineering personnel in Malaysia. Dr. Ten is an honorary follower of the ASEAN Federations of Engineering Organization and the Institutions of Engineer Malaysia. He is also a fellow of Institutions of Survey Engineer, ISUK, ASEAN Academies of Engineering and Technology, and Academies of Engineering and Technologies on Developing World. He is appointed as part members of the International Consultative Committee of the Chinese Societies of Engineering China in 2023 to 2026. He was appointed as a director of Barcelona Malaysia Bahad Prasanat 2020 to 2023, and as chair of both of the Sustainability, Health, Safety, and Environmental Committee from 2021 to 2023. He is a co-founder and senior director of GNP Professional Groups or multi discipline Engineering Consulting firm with more than 350 staff. He has led his team in the designs of mega projects such as electrifying double track railway projects, 
from the around the time pink to allied sector, Kalan build the MODs and garden line and petrol put Caroline. Dr. Chen has published more than 100 technical papers in local and overseas conferences and seminars. Now, may I invite Dr. Chen to deliver your topics. Dr. Chen, please. Okay, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Next time, I remember to cut it short so that I don't waste people's time reading my CV. I apologize okay. for the long CV. Uh, basically, I am sharing the registration and development of engineering personnel through uh, FIAP and Africa, Asia and the Pacific Accord. I believe this is a continuation of uh, what uh, this conference is about on engineering education. But we are always aware after engineering education, I think uh, previous speakers also highlight about the career in terms of ethics, anti-corruption and also development. So it's very important that uh, we know what is the, the career after uh, graduating. Okay, so I will move on to the next slide. Uh, is it my slide that I control? Uh, I control, right? Okay, let me no, no. see. Sorry, Professor, we can assist you, please. Uh, maybe I can, uh, let me share, it's easier because uh, is it okay I share? Uh, a technical error in sharing screen. We can okay, okay, okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, next, uh, intro these are the, top, the content that I will cover. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, you have to press <laughs> because my one has animation. Yes. Uh, basically, FIAP, I want to introduce to many of you who are, may not uh, have known FIAP. Uh, basically, FIA was uh, originally formed in 1978. It was called FISIA, the Federation of Engineering Institutions of Southeast Asia and the Pacific. And later in the year 2008, uh, we renamed it Federation of Engineering Institutions of Asia and the Pacific. So since then, uh, we have celebrated our 40th and, uh, birthday in Malaysia. Next. And uh, now we are in the year 2023. Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what, what? Okay. Basically, uh, in the 2021, uh, FIAP and FIO. FIO stands for Federation of Africa Engineering Organizations, uh, another big organization from uh, Africa continent. We signed the accord, which is called AAP Accord, which is Africa, Asia, and the Pacific Accord in the year 2021. Next. FIAP has a total of 23 members and uh, three associate members across not only Asia Pacific, but also include Africa and Central Asia. Uh, the reason is that we amended our constitution to allow organization that has a similar vision and objective to join us uh, to work towards an inclusive uh, engineering fraternity. Next. Uh, this is the current office barriers. The president is uh, Professor Dr. Huang Wei from Cast China, and the vice president and is your beloved uh, Dr. Charlie Tan and my old friend, who will be taking over the presidency of FIAP in the coming General Assembly in uh, September in uh, Nipidor. I hope many of you will come to see the inauguration where we have, have the FIAP General Assembly and also uh, Congress where Dr. Charlie Tan will be taking over. And the immediate past president is Dr. John Lee from CIE Chinese Taipei and myself, uh, Secretary General. Next. Uh, we have the EXCO member, Professor Douglas Hargreaves from Engineers Australia, uh, Dr. Kijapat from uh, Thailand, and, uh, and Dr. Heru from uh, Indonesia, Dr. Nasir from Pakistan, Engineer John Kalamanje from uh, Rwanda, and also Dr. Wow from uh, Iraq. These are our office bearers or EXCO. Next. And we have uh, mainly the function of FIAP, especially in all the works are done by the standing committee. And the chair of the standing committee on engineering education is, is the one that I think many of you know him, Professor Chua. And uh, standing committee on environment is engineer Chong Ki Seng. And IIT is uh, engineer C. Debana of uh, India. And the standing committee on natural disaster and preparedness is Mr. Yoon from Korea. 
And we have the, formed the new committee, which is called Standing Committee on Emerging Technologies and Professional Development. Professor Chua is a pro tem chairman helping out. So by the coming September, uh, CAS has uh, written in to, to chair the committee. And that will be good. That means the new technologies, 5G, 6G, uh, Internet of Things, uh, all the new emerging technologies and techniques uh, will be discussed in this committee. For the development of the youth, we have Youth Talent Development Group, chaired by engineer Yo Su Hong from IEM. This is to make sure that we keep in touch with the youth, which is the, we, we call it the next generation leaders that uh, FIAT view very important. Next. Basically, FIAT, we have all the objective. I'm not gonna go in detail because you can get it from the internet. Next page, please. Okay, the FIAT projects, we have many projects. Continue. Next page. Uh, the most uh, active now, we call Belt and Road Initiative that we take, we take along the Belt and Road Initiative uh, to do many projects, not only in Asia, the Pacific, but also towards uh, Africa and going towards the Middle East. So these are the projects that uh, we started since 2019, uh, where our President Huang Wei from China uh, take uh, leadership. So, and we continue from there. And currently we are still active uh, doing projects. Next one. So we will cover all this and uh, we are working with FIO. Next slide, please. So we have formed the NFTC, uh, which is called MPU FIAP Belt and Road Engineering Education Training Center. I believe many of you have attended the free for uh, program conducted, including seminars by Professor Chua, Engineer Chen, myself, and many other speakers talking about engineering education. So this was formed in the 2019 in Xi'an. And uh, because of the COVID-19, many of the program basically uh, since then are being carried out online. I believe online do help because there will be increased the participants and uh, reduce the cost of traveling. But uh, just to share with you, uh, in the coming December, uh, December uh, there will be a AAP second conference in Siamen. So I believe we will inform uh, Myanmar Engineering Council and also uh, Myanmar uh, Engineering Society to inform all of you. Please come to, to, to Siamen in China if you can for the conference. Next one. Basically, our main objective of NFTC is to train professors and deans of engineering department from universities, from FIAP member economies, that means all the members in the Asia and the Pacific who are our members. Also, the reps from the Belt and Road region, if they are keen to participate, and ASEAN members, and also FIO from the Africa. So with that, we also train on mentoring on FIAP engineering education guidelines. We have a FIAP engineering education guidelines, which is uh, outcome based, uh, similar to Washington Accord, that covers uh, engineering degree, engineering technologies degree, and also engineering technician diploma. So we in that, we all, we call all these engineering personnel, because when you want to repeat so many times, it's very, very lengthy. So I call all of them together as engineering personnel. So our objective is to train enough professors and engineers to help mentor and review processes for the accreditation system to be set up by each economy that need help. I believe uh, Myanmar graduated through FIA program and they are A plus student. I can say score with the highest mark. They achieve great things together with FIA and they have become a role model for many of the FIA members who, who are coming through to join the engineering education program. Next one. Uh, these are some of the, the activities pre-COVID-19 so that we carry out. And since then, many of them are online. Next one. So, okay, I just want to highlight that we have signed the Africa, Asia and the Pacific Accord that covers uh, uh, between FIAP and FIO, uh, that means uh, Asia Pacific and uh, Africa, that set up a unified and inclusive engineering education accord to promote substantial equivalence and also rationalize the standard for engineering graduates who seek 
cross economy employment because we understand that uh, the world is flat there are a lot of cross mobility and enable the mobility of engineering workforce in the africa continent asia and the pacific including belt and road region so the accord covers all this and to promote the understanding of the civilizations in the belt and road economies and the reason is that in engineering education or engineering uh, development we always forget that understanding of civilizations is the pathway for friendship in 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 malaysia we always say takenal tacinta in malay language that means if you don't know him you will not fall in love so by understanding and knowing each other's civilization basically will promote friendship and reduce friction if everyone can be friends engineering fraternity will be very strong because everybody is sharing and friend each other towards development of engineering program and for the development of the economy and also infrastructure so in the aap accord both uh, africa and asia pacific view strongly that understanding of civilization is also very important and should not be ignored other than all technical things that we always talk about next one so the formation of this the covers uh, was signed in the year 16 April 2021. I, I can tell you this is the accord that was signed within three to three months upon uh, agreeing between two parties. I think it's the fastest accord being signed. And while we are still locked down at home, it makes us expedite the work. You know why? Everybody ha can concentrate to do work and we, we sign within three months uh with this important accord and that cover uh as i say all the engineering personnel from engineering education to the development of the graduates after they graduating next one so the objective I, i'm not going to uh, repeat again this is the same as i highlighted so but important to note is the last one the aap accord or the fiat engineering register is intended for the mobility of engineering personnel at the graduate level that means after they come up from the university or technical college these are the group that we want to register them and the registration of fiat engineering personnel and also uh, aap engineering personnel do not cover professional level that has been extensively covered in the apec engineers and ipea and international engineers and their engineering uh, engineering technician and technologies so please remember that we are not duplicating thank you next slide please so the aap accord is similar to fiat approach uh, is step one we assist to set up the accreditation system in the economy applied to the AAP accord or applied to FIAP. So if you are FIAP members, you apply to FIAP. If you are FIO members, you apply to FIO. Then you can come to become the mentee member of this accord. Then with the guidance and uh, mentoring, then once you achieve the phase one, which is step two, which is called sufficient for nation building why we have that the reason is that each economy has the different stages of uh, development so you cannot say that uh, one step you must achieve international uh, equivalent that is not practical for many economies especially developing countries so we say that okay you we go step by step we hold your hand we guide you you reach your nation building in stage one then you become a provisional member after that, you can apply it to your universities, then you continue to develop your engineering education system towards the full compliance, which is step three. Step three is phase two of full compliance. That means this is equivalent to the international uh, acceptable substantial equivalent. So like it will be same as IEA, Washington Accord, Dublin Accord or, or Sydney Accord or Euro Ace. So once you achieve all this and being reviewed by the review, uh, what I call it, reviewer, then you can be applied to become full members. So this is in summary the 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 content of the AAP accord. Next one. Next slide. So uh, a lot of people ask us uh, what are the difference between the PR engineering education guidelines and Washington Accord. This is a summary page that I did. What basically say of them are outcome-based engineering education system. So same. 
So the only difference is that FIAP specifically mentioning mentoring and guidance program. That means to help the developing countries. So this is not specified in Washington Accord specifically. And in the FIAP on the left side, in the FIAP engineering education guidelines, as I highlighted earlier, we have a two-phase development. That means phase one is graduate capability for nation building. Then after that, you develop towards international uh, standard. However, for Washington Accord, the, you have to go straight away to full compliance, which is international standard. So there are difference. And in the FIAP, approval is based on majority. That means we once a majority of the mentor uh, review and after that presented to the FIAP General Assembly, if approved, then you become member. While the slightly different previously Washington Accord was unanimous. I think lately they have the last few years they have changed to approval based on two-third majority. I believe this was in the way influenced by fiat inclusiveness when they change it. All right. So in summary, full compliance of fiat guidelines entitle you to apply for APEC engineers later once you're a professional engineer. While uh, Washington Accord is APEC IPEA. Uh, so a, for fiat, we are IPEA professional member, but FIAP uh, has uh, guidelines will be acceptable as AAP Accord uh, Professional Engineer if, if there is one in the future, but now we only target graduate level. Next one. Okay, these are the signatory done. So during that time, uh, it was signed. Next one. Sorry, can you go down? Next page, please. Okay, next. Next page, please. Okay, so during that time, uh, uh, the event, the, the signing was done virtually. Uh, during uh, the Wufio President Gonke congratulated us. There are many other important people from UNESCO also come and congratulate us for the, the landmark that signing of the AAP Accord between the two continents, I believe, will consist of two-thirds of the population of the world. So it's a, it's a very important accord for developing countries for the better, betterment of the engineering fraternity. Next page. So basically, FIAP engineering personnel register is for the graduate of uh, graduate level. Is uh, as I say, for mutual recognition, for mobility, and build a community with a shared future for mankind. So this is our target. Next one. So coming soon, once AAP Accord, they have the engineering education being uh, complied to, then they will start also the AAP engineering personnel. Next one. So these are the program we carry out until 2030. Works are still ongoing. NFTC will continue to provide seminars and training. So please join them, especially when they are online and free, free of charge. Next one. So uh, I think this one I have highlighted. Next one. So, okay, now on the registration of graduate engineering personnel, I will touch on it now. Next one. Basically, we know that in engineering development, there are engineering education where we talk a lot on the guidelines and Washington Accord, Dublin Accord, all these things. Then you have a graduate level. That means the, the engineering personnel graduate from the University of Technical College when they started to work. So we want to create mobility for the middle level, which is a graduate level. Then with their experience and things like that, then only they will go for exam and become professional level. Then you have uh, APEC and IPEA for the international mobility. So these are the three main stages. Next one. But I want to highlight to all of you is that actually the graduate levels are the highest numbers of engineering personnel. And there is no international body that really take care of them in the way like uh, recognition or mobility or, 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 or registration. But especially they, they are only registered locally. That means for each economy do their registration. But for international, there is no one really take care of this uh, graduate level. So we want to create a registration for these graduate engineers and also training program for them. Next one. So we have covered it uh, in the engineering education, which is a uh, FIAP, next one. FIAP guidelines and AAP accord, next one. Okay, next. 
So now we are looking at this one next graduate level. We created FIAP Engineering Personnel Register. I, and I'm glad to tell you that IEM Institution of Engineers Malaysia is the first economy in FIAP, member economy in FIAP, that introduced this. And I believe uh, later Myanmar Engineering Council or Myanmar Engineering Society, for those university graduates who fulfill the international standard, that means uh, phase two of FIAP, can actually use the FIAP Engineering Personnel Registration also. That is good, will be good for the recognition and mobility. Next level. So later it will be in AAP. So basically it covers uh, FIAP graduate engineers, FIAP graduate engineering technologies, and FIAP graduate engineering technician, and they will have the title behind their name. Okay. So this is uh, started since uh, last year. Next one. So what it means is that if you, if your uh, own accreditation system has fulfilled the FIAP engineering education guideline, that means stage two full compliance, then the graduates that graduate from this program are entitled to be called FIAP graduate engineers. If they graduate as engineering technologies, then with FIAP graduate engineering technologies. If graduate with FIAP uh, technicians uh, diploma, then they are FIAP graduate technicians. And this will be registered by their own national um, institution. Huh? So in Myanmar, your 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 society, your engineering society will be will be registering them and the list is given to FIAP for record purposes. So it was approved in the year 2021 or two years plus already. <laughs> Next one. So same thing for uh, later in the AAP, that means Afri uh, Africa, Asia and Pacific. There will be a bigger recognition of cross-continent. Next one. So, and this was recorded in the AAP uh, record, as I mentioned. So you, you can download it from the FIAP website or the, uh, this record, the whole record. Next one. So the process for AAP record and FIAP Engineering uh, regist uh, personnel registration are the same. Next one. So I think I covered enough for today. Uh, I, I think I end my presentation here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ken, for your impressive presentation. We have learned a lot from your presentation. Uh, please let me move to the next topics. According to the agenda, before the next keynote presentation has been started, please let me to read about the biographies of engineer Tom Kitson. Uh, engineer Tom Kitson is the emeritus president of the institutions of engineering. Singapore. He is the chairperson of the FIAP Environmental Engineering Standing Committee. Engineer Chon is the Singapore Registered Professional Engineer and also an Olden Committee, including being a appointed Singapore. Mama. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry. Sorry, I will continue. The uh, engineer Chong is an executive director of the Engineer 9000 Private Limited, a server engineering consulting company in Tambur, Sur Asia Consulting that focuses on infrastructure projects and sustainability solutions. He has more than 30 years experience as a practicing engineer working on various large scale infrastructure projects. Now, I am proudly invited uh, engineer Chon to deliver your topics. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our keynote speaker, Engineer Chon. Engineer Chon, please. Good day to all of you. I'm Engineer Chon Kisen from the Institution of Engineers, Singapore. Thank you for inviting me to speak 
at this international conference. And my paper today is Engineering Education and Impetus to Meet Sustainable Development Goals. Let's start to look at the objectives of Sustainable Development Goals. Essentially, it is to eradicate poverty and provide access to clean water and sanitation to all, reduce inequalities, and provide affordable and clean energy. It also aims to conserve our limited natural resources to support health and well-being of the people for now and for the future. But to drive these sustainable development goals, we need to have a whole of a nation movement. Engineers do play a critical role to develop sustainability solutions. Engineering education therefore holds the key to success on the implementation of sustainable development goals. In Singapore, we have five ministries that spearhead and advance Singapore's national agenda on sustainable developments. The three ministries that focuses on innovation and sustainability solutions are the Ministry of National Development, which will look for solutions for sustainable buildings and infrastructure, as for the Ministry of Sustainability and Environment, it focuses on clean environment and quality living for all. Ministry of Transport that involve the roads and train transportation system as well as the air hub and sea hub consume significant amount of energy and requires solution for energy reduction and renewable energy solutions. In all agenda, in order to be sustainable, it requires a business perspective so that there is impetus for companies to come together to support the SDGs. And the Ministry of Trade and Industry, therefore, enhance economic growth. It tries to create new business and job opportunities for businesses as well as for the individual. Education ministries is significantly important because we need the young to think and embrace sustainability so that they could bring the journey or continue the journey on sustainability into the future. So the issue is why sustainability is important to students. Basically, nearly all industry sectors would require green skills. So students has to be trained to have such skills early so that when they are out 
into the industries, they are able to seize emerging opportunities like the green economy, having the first mover advantage over the others. So in this case, how would institutes of higher learning or IHL, for example, the universities and the polytechnics, should prepare their students in this green and sustainability economy? The university could create new modules that involve sustainability more uh, subjects and could also probably curate second majors relating to environmental sustainability. Students, faculty staff and industry can work together to develop new products and services to tackle sustainability challenge. This would again bring the student closer to the understanding of sustainability at an early age. We could also curate student projects and involve them on carbon emission reduction and support green transformation in the industry. Other possibility is to partner industry by creating sustainability experience center within the campus which could be used as a living laboratory to support research again this would bring the student closer to sustainability challenges and solutions Student and industry engagement to allow students to bridge the gap between theoretical knowledge and practical industry experience. Basically bringing the industry and the student together so that the theoretical knowledge acquired in the university could be put into practical industry use earlier. The university could also inculcate students with environmentally conscious habit to curriculum integration and enhance the campus infrastructure with green feature. Next, I would like to share some examples of projects in Singapore that requires engineering input. Take, for example, this uh, first ASEAN Reserve Heritage Park and stopover that, that provides stopover for migratory birds. The park you know, consists of uh, forest ponds, trekking, and coastal trails. This is called the Sungai Buru Wetland Reserve. So if you visit Singapore in the future, you come by and take a look. And to develop such park involve significantly engineering. It, require, uh, it requires us to look at the biological diversity and the fauna survey and including wildlife management as part of environmental impact assessment. We need to also understand the noise, the ambient air quality, ground vibration, as well as water quality within the park. Of course, you also require CNS and MA engineers to design and build 
the infrastructure as well as the M&E systems. Another example would be uh, Singapore effort in trying to harness as much as possible for solar energy. So take, take an example like the Tenga uh, floating solar farm. The panels are placed over the water within the reservoir. So other than uh, harnessing solar energy, it also provides a cover over the water surface, which reduces evaporation and loss of water within the reservoir. So we also tried to develop floating solar farm in the sea and the environment would be slightly different. It is in the seawater environment. There will be water current, tidal condition, waves, where engineers would have to be involved to ensure that the project is safe. One other project is the Cross Nexus. It basically integrates a water reclamation plant with a waste management facility. This is a circular approach using latest engineering technologies and it is expected to reduce carbon by more than 200,000 ton per year, which would mean taking 42,500 cars off the road. With this integration, it will also result in land saving of up to 2.6 hectare, which is the size of about four football fields. It is significantly important for Singapore as we do not have much land. The recently completed Nestle Oil Renewable Diesel and Sustainable Aviation Fuel Plant starts operation this year, 2023. It uses used oil to be refined or processed to renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel. So this new plant produces 2.6 million renewable fuel per year, of which 1 million ton can be produ production of sustainable aviation fuel. Singapore is one of the major uh, global petrochemical hub. The petrochemical hub is situated or located on Jurong Island. As we know, refineries, petrochemical facilities are one of the greatest emission of carbon dioxide. So we are looking at exploring carbon capture and utilization technology so that we could reduce our carbon footprint from such chemical processing facility. Engineers would also would then be required to come up 
with innovation, innovative solutions to see how best we can adopt technology in carbon capture and utilization. Looking at other type of projects, for example, we have the uh, a residential development which uses centralized cooling system instead of the conventional uh, cooling system where each of us have our own air con Denser or aircon condensers within our unit. This use a shared centralized cooling system. We would require engineers to optimize the algorithm in the design of the strict cooling so that we can optimize the utilization of cooling and lower our foot, our carbon footprint compared to other conventional housing estates. Their project is the Congo Digital District, which is equipped with a smart energy grid to lower the energy usage and distribute green energy such as solar power. So in, within the facility, there are living laboratories for innovation in the area of smart living, digital solutions, as well as cyber security. The design and the construction would have sustainability in mind. For example, you will maximize daylight, the building orientation will try to optimize the wind movement so that we have more areas that is naturally ventilated instead of air conditioning. So smart grid system Autonomous buses will be deployed, waste recycling and rainwater harvesting will be used in this particular development. And I think significantly engineers will have to develop engineering solutions for all this sustainable development. Another area that Singapore is looking at is piloting what we call the Proda project on Pulau Tekong. So what Proda does is it essentially a dike wall that creates land where the land that it creates do not require significant amount of infilling of sand. So the use of natural resources like sand to reclaim it up to the level is not necessary. And for the land that is created are significantly lower than the sea level outside. So the dike itself will keep seawater out of the so-called newly created land. However, when there is a rainstorm, you will then need to pump the rainwater from within the land and into the sea. All this innovation would also require the input of engineers and engineering solution to solve. Another example would be the underground cavern, which will be used for flood control. Such underground caverns are about 
50 meters into the ground, basically digging quite deep into where we have a granite to form in a way caverns or cave where excess rain water could be channeled into these caverns during significant rainstorm to mitigate flooding and the falling water into the cavern can actually drive turbine to generate electricity such flood mitigation measures or projects would require the work or the contribution of the engineers Singapore need to be food resilient. So we aim to have 30% of our food, uh, or rather to produce 30% of the food by the year 2030. So we require high-tech vegetable farming and not only high tech, but it could likely be high rise. And also smart floating fish farms to achieve the objectives. And engineers will also therefore require us to leverage on life sciences and artificial intelligence and engineering to make sure that either the vegetable or the fish are fast growing and are resist resistant to disease and have high nutrition value. So in closing, or concluding remarks. Engineering is essential in achieving sustainable development goals. And whoever embraces sustainability mindset must start at an early age. Students have to be exposed to sustainable innovation early so that they could take advantage of their capability and knowledge and be ready when they are out in the industries finally my final words is that like the circular economy we require our engineers to be circular engineer. What I mean by that is that we need to develop deep engineering skills or competency to drive innovations and implementation. But at the same time, we need to develop business skill and has a business sense to organize resources for economic production of goods and services that could create good jobs. Finally, to embrace humanity as an important human value, to care for the interests and well-being of others. So in doing all this, we can then call ourselves a circular engineer. With that, I thank you and I hope that you would have a fruitful conference ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Engineer John, for your impressive presentation. Accord in accordance with the agenda, may I introduce about our last speaker for today, Professor Tu Shen Tong. Professor Tu is a member of the Chinese Academy of Engineering and served as a chair professor at the East China University of Science and Technology. 
In addition, he holds multiple prestigious positions, such as the Chairman of Asian Oceanic Regional Committees of International Council for Pressure Vessel Technology and Executive Committee members of Global Powers M. Proportion Society and a member of reliability, reliability committees of the International Federations for the Promotions of Mechanism and Machine Science. He is also an honorary professor at the Universities of Nottingham, UK, among others. Professor Tru is an associate editor or editorial, editorial box member of several reputable academic journals. His research focuses on high temperature, structural integrity, and engineering, including areas like the creek, fatigue, factual, and structural integrity monitoring and designs of high temperature equipment. He has a strong commitment to safety in, in the process and energy industry. Professor Tu has received numerous distinguished awards for his work including the China National Science and Technology Progress Award, National Technology Invention Award, China Youth Science and Technology Award, and ASME Best Paper Award, among others. His contribution through the field has been invaluable, and he continues to lead and inspire others in the academic community. Professor Tu is a well-known engineering educator in China. He actively advocates the concept of the total engineering education and engineering added education, including the implementation of, of, of the engineering graduation. Professor Tu's dedication to teaching excellence has been recognized with a national award for teaching achievement. He has also mentored over 50 daughter students, a man who uh, whom have come on the, to become outstanding talents in the university and enterprise. Now, I would like to invite Professor Tu to deliver your presentation. The floor is yours. Professor Tu, please. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. Chairman. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have to apologize. I, uh, did not quite go through all these uh, uh, presentations as uh, this afternoon. I walked in a train from Fujian to Shanghai and then in the tunnel, the signal is sometimes on, sometimes off. <laughs> so I cannot quite get that you are uh, very uh, good uh, uh, lectures previously. And they, uh, I, my name is Sandung Tu and I and a member of the Chinese Academy of Engineering, and also a supervisory uh, member of uh, China Association of Science and Technology, CDAA, uh, and a professor uh, from East China University of Science and Technology in Shanghai. Uh, I don't know quite necessary to speak on behalf of these organizations, but anyhow, I would very much like to share uh, some of uh, my ideas about the implementation of SDGs and the DAPC 2021. Any uh, my uh, uh, my lecture, uh, just wait a moment. I I think a little, uh, a little bit time to to <laughs> have a reaction. Uh, mm -hmm. I just kind of go back. Um, it's okay. Uh, my uh, lecture was basically uh, divided into uh, four parts. Firstly, I want to uh, let you know a little bit of my understanding of the grand challenges in the, this area. And then I want to uh, talk a little bit about our effort in China to implementing the SDGs and the GAPC uh, 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 2021 and some uh, uh, effect in this regard, such as the courses and the curriculum changes uh, in some of our universities. And then I will also discuss a little bit to the future plan uh, in China. Uh, talking about the future challenges, 
I think many of you have a, a, a quite an extensive discussion about this. Uh, we love engineering uh, because engineering makes our world a greater place for human, human being to live. In a long history of our human civilization, you can see a lot of uh, very grand, great engineering projects uh, that contributed to the uh, 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 betterment of our world. Uh, but they, for a long run, uh, people are living in a very poor uh, statue. And it, not until the uh, Sorry, the, the, the screen just cannot move smoothly. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, it does not work. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, now you can see it. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, sorry. We, we, we enjoyed anyhow we enjoyed greatly the uh the social uh, welfare due to the engineering revolution but at the same time we are meeting a lot of new challenges for instance um, the carbon uh uh emission uh, uh accumulated in the atmosphere it have been increased dramatically which is very much comparable to the gdp per person uh, increase. I mean, the GDP per person increasement is very great. It is the contribution of engineering. But at the same time, you see, the we have this uh, 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 warm house uh, 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 problem, the greenhouse gas emission problems. So um, they have a new cause. They have been, uh, uh, you can see here, the accumulation of uh, carbon dioxide in our global, uh, from the industry, uh, from the, 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 the industry revolution, you can see uh, American contributed to something like 23% of the uh, carbon dioxide emission, and China 13%, and European countries 20%. I'm sorry, I just have, I really have problems to move on the, the screen. Uh, I don't know, oh, yeah, <laughs> come back again. Uh, then we have uh, this uh, uh, protocol that, uh, I mean, the, of course, a common understanding that we have to limit the temperature increase not more than 1.5 degrees C. I think we need just to wait for a while to allow the reaction of my my screen. Uh, sorry, Professor. Uh, can we comment me? Uh, there is a little technical error in screen sharing. You can assist. Okay, you will be will be very good. You can uh, do that yeah. for me. Uh, can you comment <laughs> me, please. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's very kind of you. Mm. Otherwise, it's a really uh, uh, not smooth. <laughs> Should I uh, ending? I think, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, probably you can go back to uh, the, the the previous slide, the previous one. This one, Professor. Oh yeah, this, this is so we can start it from here anyhow. <laughs> so you can see uh, we have this target uh, for limiting the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees C. This is uh, a very important indicator uh, for the sustainable development. Next slide, please. Mm. 
next. Okay, for this, they have been a general new code uh, for sustainable development. Uh, you have seen that United Nations in 2015, I go back to the previous one. Can you go back to previous one? Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, the United Nations to sign the 15 uh, uh, adopted this so-called the, so -called the, uh, the, 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 the SDGs. Uh, there are seven, uh, 17 indicators. Uh, I think you had to go, go down. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, Yeah, and also European Commission proposed the European Green Deal in 2019. And next slide, and you can, next slide. You can see that Chinese government is also adopted green development as a national development, stra development strategy. And in particular, 2021, uh, China, Chinese government promised to achieve the carbon peak in 2013 and in 2016, uh, the carbon neutrality. And the, the UNESCO in 2021 have also uh, published this engineering for sustainable development. Engineering, uh, in one hand, uh, contributed significantly to the betterment of our life, but it had, on the hand, they have pollutions, and they, uh, I, on a, I said the uh, carbon dioxide problems also, but uh, uh, at the same time, we had to rely on our engineering for the sustainable development also. Next slide, please. Any, uh, all of you uh, uh, are quite familiar about this. In 2021, the International Engineer Alliance published its graduate attributes and the professional competencies, which is supported by the World Federation of Engineering Organization and also UNESCO. This is uh, a new call uh, for our engineering education to support the sustainable development and also to face the few, few uh, challenges. Can you uh, move to the next slide? And then I want to uh, show you a little bit how Ch in China we're implementing the GAPC for cultivation of engineering uh, talents. Next. Uh, we believe our engineering education should anyhow strengthen our knowledge and ability about the sustainable development. And secondly, is to strengthen the knowledge and ability in digital technology. And third, so enhancing the cooperative capability across the decentralized industry sectors and the international boards. And the fourth, enhance the ethical and integrity understanding in science and engineering. Next. Uh, first of all, we have to bridge our engineering education and engineering uh, professional competencies. We have to promote the industry part participation in the talent development process to allow our uh, undergraduate students to learn on campus and then to follow the practice uh, as a trainer, engineer, and then to work independently and uh, into the intro dependently as a uh, 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 
a professional engineer, like any, uh, we uh, try to promote a talented cultivation system of an industry education integration. Uh, we uh, co-develop the Titan talent cultivation system in accordance with the certification standards and implement the collaboratively uh, in the training process, uh, education quality evaluation, and establish a collaborative mechanism for engineering talent development. Next. And we also to, uh, help to explore the integration of engineer education and the humanities uh, by facilitating the interconnection and the coordinated development of fundamental decentralized and applied engineering decentralized and implement the new requirement of the GAPC 2021 concerning flexibility, creativity, inclusivity, and a sustainable development goals. Next. Um, we have been translating the concepts, theories, and ideas into real teaching standards and the behaviors by various trainings. Uh, just go to lecture, please. It's unfortunately rather slow. Um, I, I'm afraid I cannot <laughs> quite finish this lecture by such a remote uh, presentation. And in China, we also organized uh, Kuaishan International Seminars on SDGs and uh, GAPC 2021. I think many of you have joined some of our activities for this uh, discussion. Uh, next, please. Uh, we uh, have been publicizing and promoting the GAPC 2021 on our official website to help uh, a, a high education institution to prepare in advance and implement gradually the GAPC 2021. Next. Any move? Yeah. And recently, we have issued uh, the engineering education accreditation criterion. And the, in this uh, criterion, uh, we have emphasized the ability uh, to solve the complex engineering problems and the impact of the environmental and the social sustainability, as well as the development of a long technical competencies such as the social responsibilities. Next. Uh, yeah, based on those uh, uh, guidelines uh, and the effort made by our uh, 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 China Association of Science and Technology and our uh, Greek a board of uh, accreditation, and uh, they have been some changes in our curriculum and the courses. I think this is definitely uh, the effect of uh, effectiveness of our effort also. Yeah, next please.
can you can you move it to the next slide? I think it, uh, in the uh, last uh, conference, I have mentioned it to you some of a curriculum uh, uh, have made significant changes based on SDGs. Can you move to the next? Okay, move to the next. Okay, yeah, just to keep this one. Yeah, uh, we have trying to implement the green engineering education and question uh, uh, programs. Uh, the con oh, go back, please. Uh, anyhow, I can just skip and go in uh, at the uh, we are also we have this SDGs and at the same time to implement the green engineering uh, education. Uh, we need to have some principles. Anyhow, uh, we have to emphasize the goals uh, about knowledge, ability, and the competency, and our value uh, to implementing those uh, principles. Next, please. Yeah, uh, this is the, uh, the 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 twelve principles of green engineering. I, I I think many of you may be familiar with it, but they are very some very closely related to our SDGs. So we use these twelve principles to construct the matrix uh, 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 of our classes, and uh, for the program of chemical engineering in the East China University of Science and Technology. They they have uh, many uh, courses, and in every uh, in every course, we we hope it will implement at least one or two the principles of green engineering into uh, these professional courses. Next, the praise. Uh, the drawback is the slow reaction of the internet. Anyhow, yeah, we try to finish it based on the technology available to for us. And there are quite some other uh, universities like uh, 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 Southern University of Science and Technology in Shenzhen. This is a brand new university that they have been uh, doing very well concerning uh, the, uh, the implementing the SDGs in the, the in, 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 in the programs, they have this so-called project guided learning uh, in the, the, the so-called summer course uh, on new engineering education. So-called finding authors, the future cities. Uh, through this uncontrained thinking, students can control and envision ways to create a better future lifestyle for people. And this to allow the student to understand what the sustainable development in a city will be like. Next, please. And I myself also uh, practice those uh, principles in my own courses. Um, I'm teaching uh, for the first man, the, uh, the the, the so-called the uh, engineering introduction. I basically divided my courses into this uh, uh, six phases. We had to know how the engineering is organized, how the engineering affects society, and how the engineering research basis should be like, and how we develop our engineering product in an innovative way. And the, uh, we also teach students economic, the engineering economics and also management. 
we had to understand engineering risks and ethics. And the, uh, then finally, we have so-called freshman innovation seminar. Go to next, please. But what more important is not to you and actually, what more important is how you check the outcome of students, how they learn well. So we assigned the three tasks to students. The task one is conceptualizing an organization which is oriented towards SDGs. And this is a very interesting task. Uh, many students like it, like it, I think, yeah. Uh, the, this task, uh, we, we ask students to conceptualize and design organization oriented towards to SDGs. That leads engineering, scientific research, or technology development. Uh, or this uh, organization, or organization that is capable of funding uh, such endeavors. Uh, that means R and D endeavors. This organization can be uh, high tech enterprises in the area such as renewable power, which may include the wind, solar, hydrogen, uh, tidal power, any low carbon, low carbon manufacturing technology, low emission vehicles, and the technology for the poor also. Uh, we have to invite the students to think about uh, how to help the minority people. Uh, poor people. So they may ha have this open minded to develop various kind of technology, not only uh, for this renewable, uh, for renewable power, a sustainable future, but also consider the technology from the ethical point to help the people, uh, different kind of people. And with this uh, organization can also be a non-governmental organization. For instance, I have this example like a Gates Foundation. If you are capable enough, you may found a town center foundation. Of course, you can have your own name as a foundation. And they, uh, and it also some academic societies such as a mechanical engineer society, civil engineering society, and so on. Uh, the basic requirement is uh, you have, you, you should describe a, a, a brief introduction to the business that the organization was devoted to and the technological directions of this organization. And what most important, you have to write down the visions, values, and the missions of your organization, maybe a company, maybe a, a society or so. Any, I ask my students to, uh, to, to at least to check the five uh, web pages, uh, I mean, five websites of uh, 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 some companies, uh, preferably the top 500 uh, companies. And this, uh, but the conceptualized uh, new organization uh, should be one uh, uh, that is being ahead of uh, existing organizations. That means the face to the future. Next, please. And the, the task two uh, is related to the task, uh, it's related to task one. Uh, so normally I want to give it this three tasks at the same time so that to allow the student to have this organic linkings of the task. The task two is to identify the R and the D uh, priority earliest and the problems. Uh, you have to determine the research and development earliest and topics. I don't, I don't need you to write many words, just one sound word, that is, that, that is enough. But you have to read, you have to, uh, you have to cite, you have to read and uh, probably more Aside at the list of five relevant scientific research papers or patents and documents to, uh, that is relevant to support you uh, future business. Uh, this uh, 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 and then you 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 
uh, from these two priority areas, uh, you, well, you also have to write down, you have to identify two challenger problems. Uh, next slide, please. Any, uh, you know, the freshmen, they are, of course, will not be, will not be able uh, the, uh, to solve all these problems. But what we can ask them, uh, you can uh, write a by the proposal and organize a team of people and to do that. So they know the engineering project that needed knowledge from different people. And then finally, we have this so-called freshman innovation seminar. Uh, and it, then the students will have a chance to show themselves, to present their ideas. And they have been very, uh, quite a lot of good ideas from uh, this uh, 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 seminar. Uh, go to the next slide, please. I think I had to go very quickly to uh, finish uh, my talk. And uh, 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 the, the further improvement plan for the uh, GAPC 2021 uh, we, we do have a question of this. I use the time, I can just read the title here. Please go to the next slide. Okay, please go to the next slide. Uh, we are now conducting a large scale surveil. Uh, which is supported by the uh, Chinese Academy of Engineering and the, also uh, the uh, Ministry of Education. And the, uh, we are making a lot of uh, 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 questionnaire uh, concerning engineering faculty development and evaluation. Uh, next slide, please. Can I move to the next slide? Um, yeah, we have uh, some basic, uh, some, from, uh, some results now from the, uh, the, 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 the uh, survey. And the, uh, I don't think I need to, uh, to, to read all of this to you, but I think next time we will have a conference in China Probably we will give you more details about our outcome of the smell. Next please. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, we have uh, how uh quite a thing, uh, university enterprise work uh, enterprises workshops. And the, we found that uh, uh, we really had to enhance the uh, the the participation uh, from the industry. Next slide, please. Okay, move to next slide. We also make uh, more than 10 interviews with the key stakeholders to identify the problems that we are facing. Next slide, please. Uh, we are using also the AI technology to analyze the students' uh, uh, outcome. 
And the, uh, the Lexus Lab will also uh, will incorporate the GAPC 2021 in the revision of uh, engineering education accreditation criterion. Next slide, please. Next is next. Next. Okay, I think I uh, I finished uh, most of them, uh, but I also wanted to welcome you to join the 2023 International Engineering Education Forum, which is supposed to be held in Ningbo and uh, during the 16 to 17 November. This is a good place, a good city. I hope that I can meet you all uh, in this is for Rome. Uh, thank you very much. That is all my uh, presentation. Uh, due to this uh, this uh, distance transmission, I'm sorry I take much more time than expected. But anyhow, I I, I hope I convey the main message to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Chu, for your valuable presentation. We have got many valuable information from your presentation. Okay, let me uh, conclude this session for today. Finally, we have already finished all the keynote presentation in these sessions. I would like to tell thank you very much again to all the keynote speakers in this session for your impressive, fruitful, and valuable presentations. Let me continue to wrap up sessions. Now I'm going to like to wrap up all the topics for today's afternoon session. The first speaker, Engineer Tan San Chuan, discussed about the engineering education for the sustainable developments. He is pointed about the global risk ranks by the severity, regional context for the climate actions, global and regional climate action, UN. 2030 agenda and the climate mitigation, mitigation and adaptation for the securing a sustainable future. And also he mentioned as a case study that Singapore has been demonstrating its commitment to support international climate action and a low carbon features. Singapore commitment on that issue adopts um, adoptions of the advanced low carbon technology, affected international collaborations and opportunity across the multiple sector for that issue, as well as the employment and climate change resilient in the Asia Pacific region 2021 are also discussed. And that's the second speaker, Professor Dr. Kirsten Aaron discussed about the ethical behavior and anti-corruption education and the construction of civil engineering. Professor discussed about the ethic and anti-corruption education by combining two parts. For the ethic, ethical behavior, education described to assemble with the ethic in the bid environment and teaching and learning from the university and the college courses. The first is my explain that it contained ethics in the big environment and its next core 2003 activity. So create industrial program at this in the built environment, module poster overview and target safety for the work infrastructure, teaching and learning at education for the engineer. And then he, uh, in, the, in his uh, second example, he consists of the place of the stand for the GIHCC website and actions of the Survey Engineering Association website. Finally, he presented by using the, with eight sections or teachings of the anti correction code structure in different teaching surrounding for the US outcomes or GIACC University. Then the third speaker, Dr. Rodrigo Perez Fernandez, presented about the implementations of soft skills in the higher studies of engineering to achieve the 2030 agenda for the sustainable development. 
In his presentation, he pointed out how to implement all the soft skill in the higher studies of engineering to achieve their 2030 agenda for the sustainable developments. He explained about what and how to develop the most important engineering soft skill. This includes we start from the full further communication skill, teamwork, collaboration, leadership, at this and integrity, negotiation, etc. For learning methodology to develop the soft skill, three levels are he mentioned three levels are needed. The first level he start from the civil learnings and community engagement to cultural exchange and international program. Then in the second level, continuous practice and reinforcement of the time gamification. The third level starts from the experiential learning to mentorship and coaching. Finally, he highlighted about how to implement the soft skill in the engineering education, including in university and industry sector. In university sector, the curriculum were needed to redesign to make up some subjects and projects to enhance soft skill and also in collaboration with the industry sector. From his keynote speech, we have learned a lot about the implementation of soft skill in a higher study for engineering education. Then our first speaker, engineer Dr. Tan Yin Chen, explained about the registrations and developments of engineering personnel via FIAP uh, and Africa, Assured and Asia Pacific Accord, AAP. Accord. In his presentation, he, he mentioned and uh, discussed about the how to register and develop the engineering personnel via FIF and Africa Usher the Pacific Accord in Tito. He explained this with the four parts. In the first part, he introduced a field including current status and office barrier. Then he explained about the FIF proposal. In this part, he mentioned about the FIA projects where cover the economic region in the Badam Road Initiative and to work with the <clears throat> FAEO in the Africa continents. He continued to discuss about the NFTC functions and program, its activities, and as a project one and project two, he also explained about the Africa assured Pacific Accord in the detail. He discovered the FIP in engineering personal registration in Project 3. He also highlighted these projects are uh, for the uh, AAP Accord to implement and promote the AAP Accord for all members of FIF and FAEO for the upcoming based education training to provide a um, training section to improve the engineering education quality in relevant region and facilitate the setup of assessment system for engineering personal and professional development training to promote the registrations and development of engineering personnel for free mobility in region concern. He also explained about the registrations of graduate engineering personnel and development and graduates for professional competency profile. Then the fifth speaker, engineer Chang Kitsan, explained about the engineering education and emphasis to meet the sustainable development. He mentioned about the institutes of higher learning and plays an important role in the grooming student to embrace sustainability early in their lives. This will prepare them to seek the emerging opportunity in the green economy when they are out in a working world. He also explained about the engineering education and and compress sustainability in the curriculum what needs a student to be environmental stable for the future. Engineers would have to play a critical role to develop the sustainable solution for infrastructure, building, and system. In conclusion, he summarized the IHL could collaborate with the industry so that students cooperate their gap between the theoretical knowledge and practical industry implementation. His presentation gave a valuable knowledge of Singapore experience on how IHL could create compass environments and could create a sustainability, sustainability culture. From his presentations, many impressive processes of students were explained where engineering drive sustainable development objects. Uh, the last speaker, uh, Professor Tu, mentioned about them. 
mentioned about them, uh, implementations of the SDG and GABC 2021 in China and Asia. He discussed about the present uh, a very systematic practice of the China in carrying out the functions for the sustainable development goal and graduate attributes and for professional competency for engineer. He emphasized on new challenges and new core as well as the industry and education integration activity to tackle this issue, such as the training, seminar, and full curriculum. He explained about new challenges that mainly focus on carbon dioxide emission. For solving this kind of problem, he introduced about the rules of engineering education placed in their green developments. Moreover, international seminars related to SDGs and GABC 2021 were also held. And also, China shared the information of the concerning the process of the SDGs and GABC to their publics using the internal website. Future implementation plans for SDGs and GABC are also described by Professor Tu. Okay, I would like to say again to all the keynote speakers in this session, this is time for the question as a session. So I'm going to hand over the master of green morning, Dr. Dwe Win, to continue question and answer session. So I would like to invite Dr. Dwe Win. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Minya Kai and distinguished <sighs> speakers for your plenary presentation. We have questions for Dr. Rodrigo Pires. And Professor Carsten and Professor Duchando. Tata Rodrigo, uh, the first question for you is Tata Rodrigo, uh, are you Ola? Okay. Uh, Okay, I will ask to Professor Tushento. Yes, yes, I know very well. <laughs> what a question I can answer you. Yes, sir. How has China's engineering education system adapted to meet the demands of emerging technologies and industry? And what measures have been implemented to ensure inclusivity, diversity, and gender balance within engineering disciplines to achieve the SDG more effectively. Uh, 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 I can you uh, just repeat a little bit uh, the 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 the, uh, the 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 questions. Uh, I think I quite a lot to uh, get to your question. <laughs> okay, but uh, I I will reply. Uh, I will say it again. Okay. Mm, mm. How has China's engineering education system adapted mm. adapted to meet the demands of emerging technologies and industry? Emerging technology? technologies and industry. Industry. Uh, I don't. I, I still quite a lot to uh, uh, understand the the questions. Uh, but anyhow, uh, uh, yeah, uh, China do attach a lot of importance, as I mentioned to you, concerning the uh, the, the the sustainable <sighs> development goals uh, 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 in your your engineering life. education. Uh, yeah, more and more. the uh, there we we uh, have this so-called green uh, engineering education implemented in some universities, as I mentioned to you uh, in uh, our chemical engineering program, uh, which is uh, believed to be uh, the the chemical the pollutions are most so often caused by chemi chemicals, uh, chemistry industry, chemical industries, but at the same time. We also hope to 
develop, I mean, to have this more green uh, chemical engineering. So we have embedded uh, those, uh, the green engineering principles into our courses. But we need to, to I mean, this is a, a joint effort of many uh, faculty members. We need a, a meetings from time to time to see if those criteria have been well implemented into the courses. And also we needed to assess them uh, to, 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 to have the assessment uh, of the outcomes if the students really understand uh, what the concepts have been emphasized. And uh, I don't know if I got a partly of your, <laughs> your, your, your question. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you for sharing, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> thank you. Professor Gaustad, uh, are you online? Okay, uh, the question is uh, where we ask to the professor directly via email. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, now the UN program of the International Conference of Engineering Education Accreditation, ICEEA 2023 is successfully concluded. Today, 13 speakers are presenting insightful knowledge and we have learned a lot from our distinguished speakers. Thank you, Professor, for your invaluable input. The P2 program will be started at 12 p.m. Myanmar standard time tomorrow. I'd like to invite all distinguished guests and participants to join the two program of our conference. Thank you very much for joining with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoy the dinner. <laughs> Thank you. Buenos días, colegas. Goodbye, goodbye, everyone. <laughs>